Good morning, James. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you. This is a courtesy announcement that this meeting is now being broadcast live on YouTube and our web portal. Good morning, Megan. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting. We are hopefully about three minutes out from getting going. Uh, President Wasserman is stuck in standstill traffic on Highway 17. So let's keep an eye, uh, Rhonda and Jess, for a quorum and we'll get started hopefully right at 9.30. Thank you so much. And as you guessed it, Jess is going to be your clerk today. And good morning, Supervisor Chavez. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning, Sylvia. Good morning, and thank you for the mic check. My pleasure, have a great meeting. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, you are in luck. Good morning, President Wasserman. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Woohoo. Happy to have you here. We heard about your traffic woes. Yeah, I Larkin Highway 9 is all red on Google Maps and got through it and I didn't see an accident or emergency vehicles. I have no idea what happened. And you are here with 90 seconds to spare. You rock. Very good. Very impressive. <laughs> Glad to see you, President. Thank you. Ele 11 years and running. I got 18 more months to keep the streak alive. Recording right. in progress. Good. Good morning, everybody. What do we got? 929 and we still have, we are still waiting for supervisors to meet in. Um, as I mentioned to Vice President Ellenberg, Jess Jamison will be your clerk today. Yes, great. Thank you. And thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for being ready, willing, and able. Anytime. Thank you.
Good afternoon or good morning, Supervisor Submitian. Good we morning. Go. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Jess, if you'll kick us off, and then Supervisor Allenberg will do the Pledge of Allegiance. Supervisor Lee. <clears throat> Present. Good morning. Supervisor Travis. Here. Supervisor Submitian. Supervisor I. Committee in here. The Thank meeting you. is always around. <clears throat> uh, Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here too. Thank you very much. And Vice President Ellenberg, if you'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance for all those who are able to stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation sure. under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. My list there. All right, and now also via Supervisor Ellenberg, we have today's invocation. And for anyone wishing to speak under public comment, um, a few items from now, please register electronically. Vice President. Supervisor Washington, oh, excuse, excuse the interruption. Excuse me, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I apologize. I appear to be having technical difficulty. Let me just ask if uh, you and uh, my colleagues and the public can hear me. Uh, yeah. You all are frozen on my screen, even though I have uh, uh, taken the video down to attempt to make this work. We'll see. Thank you. We can hear you fine, and I can see when your hand is raised. Thank you, sir. You got it. Vice President. Today is World Rainforest Day. And while we may not always keep close track of environmental holidays, it is always good to take a moment to remember and remind ourselves that there is so much to be done to preserve our planet. As residents of this beautiful planet, we're often reminded of the actions we should be taking to preserve our natural resources. Our youth remind us every day that we must be doing more and they are leading the way to a healthier environment for all of us. What we as adults may tend to forget is that our youth are doing the work now, today, and have been doing so for quite some time to preserve our planet at local, national, and global levels. Today's invocation comes from a youth climate activist who is doing just that. She and the Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action are working hard to preserve our planet for those who are on our earth today and for future generations. Perry Plattenberg is a junior at Homestead High School and a co-lead of the Transit Advocacy Team. She's also a student leader at Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. In 2020, she coordinated SVYCA's Climate Speaker Series and Climate Leadership Workshops. Perry co-founded the Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley Youth Climate Strikes and interned at Green Ninja, now serving as a member of Green Ninja's Youth Advisory Board. Thank you, Perry, for joining us today. Good morning. And, hi there, go right ahead. Thank you for having me today, Supervisor Wasserman, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Lee, Supervisor Smidian, and of course, a special thank you to Supervisor Ellenberg and her staff for inviting me here today. My name is Perry Plantenberg and I'm a local climate activist and student leader in Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action, SVYCA. Before I begin, I would like to thank all of you for holding Lehigh Cement Plant, the top polluter in the county, accountable. This is an issue SVYCA and many climate groups have avidly worked on in the past. Growing consensus among environmental experts indicates that 2030 represents a climate deadline, a critical point of no return that produces catastrophic failures in every aspect of our Earth's functions. I was sitting on a couch in my family's living room when I read about this deadline in the UN's IPCC report. My only thought recurring over and over was, I'm just a kid, I can't do anything, but the world isn't doing anything either. I felt hopeless and scared. I lay down on the couch and started crying. Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action, SVYCA, is a youth-led organization 
that empowers teens and young adults to combat climate change through impactful education and strategic policy advocacy. We collaborate with elected officials to push for climate smart laws in cities across Santa Clara County and in California as a whole. In 2019, our team was honored by a commendation from the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors for organizing a climate strike attended by several thousand people. Subsequently, the board declared a climate emergency and recognized the need for county action to combat our climate crisis. I'd like to briefly explore two things I've learned from joining SVYCA. First, there is power in the youth voice. By engaging in the political process, this organization has successfully influenced elected officials to enact laws that mitigate climate change. Over the last two years, more than 100 youth involved with SVYCA helped advocate for and pass climate policies, such as all electric reach codes in cities in Santa Clara County, and at the state level, AB 841, which directs up to 800 million state funds from the California Energy Commission to establish electric vehicle charging infrastructures and fund clean energy infrastructure at schools in California. The second thing I've learned is that policy change at every governmental level matters. For instance, if one city bans natural gas or declares a climate emergency or mandates electric infrastructure in new buildings, other cities will follow suit. And it's not only cities that influence each other. If enough cities agree to something, the county or state government often follows their lead. And that is how we make change. Whenever I lose hope, or feel drained from juggling school and climate advocacy work, I have to remind myself that preventing the worst effects of climate change is in our control and our actions do make a difference. I believe that in this fight against climate change, by collaborating with climate groups, working with elected officials and empowering others to use their voice, we have a good shot at safeguarding our planet. Tackling climate change will not be easy, but SVYCA has proven that our generation can effectuate wide scale change. SVYCA recently established a team to work with the Board of Supervisors to tackle climate change. I'm looking forward to our collaboration toward clean air, sufficient water for Californians, and a safe green future for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Perry. And I, I hope the, the intent of an invocation is to inspire all of us. And I, and I certainly feel that you achieved that today in reminding us why we're doing our work and for whom we're doing it. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us this morning. Thank you, Perry. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but as your host, I do have two George Montezes in the room. I need the second one to please identify themselves so I can change their name or I need to boot them. Uh, yes, this is George Montes uh, participating. All right, there's a second person in here under your name. Um, do we know it, who that is? Yes, that is my cell number. I have both my computer and my cell number just because uh, I, I have technology challenges here at home. No problems. Thank you so much. I just try to avoid a Zoom bomber. We're good to go and sorry for the interruption. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. No problem. <clears throat> now we're going to item number four, which is announcements and adjournments in memoriam. Uh, I'm going to kick off first, and then Supervisor Chavez uh, with a couple, and then uh, Supervisor Simidian will also be doing one today. I want to adjourn today's meeting in memory of Daniel Risto, age 24, who died on June 14th in a tragic base jumping accident in La Moya Canyon. As a wingsuit base jumper and skydiver, Daniel completed over 600 base jumps and skydives. 
Base jumping involves parachuting off any type of fixed structure. Daniel always wore a wingsuit, which allowed him to fly closer to terrain. Before a flight, Daniel would spend hours studying treacherous terrain, trekking up mountains without any trails for guidance, and analyzing the dynamics of his past jumps. Whether it was becoming the best base jumper or conquering his fears, Daniel pushed it to the limit and always strived to take things to the next level. Daniel was Los Gatos Council member Marie Risto's son, Maria Risto, and our neighbor for a decade. Daniel is survived by his mother, Maria, his father, Warren, and Daniel's sister, Julia. On behalf of the County of Santa Clara, I extend to Daniel's I extend to Daniel's family and friends our sincere condolences. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman, and I am very sorry for your loss as well. Thank you. Today, we also adjourn in memory of Terry Carter. I wanted to welcome her family, specifically her mother, Mrs. Uh, Ellen Carter Rollins, and many of you know her as an advocate um, in our community. Terry was born in Washington, D.C. on February 21st, 1965, to Miss Ellen Carter Rollins and the late Mr. Charles McKinley Carter. Terry began her relationship with Christ at a very young age. Throughout her life's journey, Terry's light shined through her strength, ambition, compassion, and by advocating not only for herself, but always, always, always for others. In 1979, as a teenager, Terry moved to San Jose, California with her family. She attended Andrew Hill High School and San Jose Job Corps, where she obtained her GED and primary nurse care certificate. She attended San Jose City College and studied computer-aided drafting and design work on a degree in graphic design. In 1989, while traveling home from work, Terry was hit by a drunk driver and became a quad paralysis individual and became confined to a wheelchair. Terry did not allow her paralysis to dampen her spirit for helping others. In 1990, Terry acquired her own apartment and began living independently. She lived there until her sunset in 2021. In 1997, Terry joined the Bay Area Church of God and Christ. Her mentors were Queen Anne Cannon, Colleen Hudgens, Grandma Bertha Starks, and Vera Y. Terry loved the writings of Maya Angelou and Audre Lorde. Terry enjoyed watching the Golden State Warriors, Oakland Raiders, and her big team, the Washington Redskins. Terry was involved in various organizations such as the African American Community Services Agency, the Santa Clara County Independent Living Center, Working Partnerships, SEIU Local 715, 521, and SEIU Local 2015. Terry worked closely with Santa Clara County and San Jose elected officials, including Mike Honda, Jim Bell, and Ken Yeager on campaigns for independent living and the Homeless Coalition. From 1997 to 2001, Terry was loved and appreciated as an art teacher for the after school program and summer camp at the African American Community Services Agency. Terry took children swimming and on field trips. Those events were highly enjoyed by all young, these youngsters who are now adults. At San Jose City College within the disabled student body, Terry co-developed the Exceptional Pupils Club and, and instructed the members about having a voice and advocating for themselves. She leaves behind loving, loving memories of her mother, with her mother, Miss Ellen Carter Rollins, her older brother, Charles McKinley Carter, and her loving goddaughter, Jasmine Foots, aunts and uncles and cousins, as well as to hosts of niece, nephews, relatives, and friends. You will be missed, Terry. And I especially wanted to say, we're so sorry for your loss to her mother, um, who we all know so well. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. And I'm gonna turn things over to Vice President Ellenberg there's a few more comments about Terry. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Chavez, for recognizing uh, Terry. I want to add my condolences to her family and especially to her mother and caregiver, Ellen Rollins. Terry's fight for her health was marked by her strength, courage, and living 
every day as fully as possible as she coped with very serious injuries and resulting disabilities. She was constantly and tenaciously supported by her mother, Ellen Rollins. If ever there was an unstoppable advocate, Ellen provided the model for others to follow. Ellen, I know that your heart is broken. Mothers are not supposed to bury their children, but your dedicated courage to do the best for your daughter throughout these struggles cannot go unnoticed. We share your grief and we thank you for all that you did to make Terry's life more comfortable. May her memory be a blessing for all of us. Thank you, Supervisor. And before we turn uh, back to Supervisor Chavez, I just wanted to mention, I left out in my memorial that each of my children uh, babysat Daniel. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, and Supervisor Ellenberg, um, thank you for um, really wrapping your arms around uh, Ellen today. Thank you. Um, today, we also adjourn in the memory of Colleen Hudgen, who passed away peacefully on Saturday, May 29th, 2001. I want to acknowledge and welcome Colleen's family, specifically um, her sister, Dale Cofield, who is joining us from Florida. And I also wanted to acknowledge Colleen's colleagues, Ann Peterson, Antonia, and Susan, and Sue's not, I'm sorry, Tony. And we're join, uh, joining us from the Live Oak Adult Day Services Office. Um, I also wanted to um, just acknowledge other family members that are present, her daughters, Deirdre Hannon and Dolores Perry, granddaughter, Siona Allen, great-granddaughter, Aubrey Powell, um, brothers and their wives, Michael and Sabine Spencer, John and Diane Spencer, uh, sisters, Dale, and thank you, Dale, for coordinating this, and Leslie Herring, niece and goddaughter, Olivia Spencer, and lifelong friend, Gwen Jerker. Throughout her life, Colleen was a tireless leader and advocate for seniors and people with disabilities. In 1980, Colleen's life of service began by helping persons with mental and physical disabilities as a director of Florida's first mandated community transition program in Gadsden County. Colleen specifically designed, developed, and administered one of the first 24-hour care facilities in Florida for patients who'd been institutionalized all of their lives. The 24-hour facility for the disabled dependent adults thus came into existence and still exists today. Upon moving to California, Colleen worked for 14 years as a senior program manager with Outreach. At Outreach, Colleen applied for and received a three-year grant for the social, from the Social Security Administration. And through this grant, Colleen developed a pilot program that targeted a unique at-risk population that was duly diagnosed homeless, helping those, uh, these vulnerable individuals to receive the needed benefits they deserved. The project was such a great success that Colleen was invited to present before the US Congress regarding the protocol she developed. The legacy representative payee program still continues today. In 2000, Colleen joined Live Oak Adult Day Services. As the executive director, Colleen was featured on Channel 7's ABC Profiles and Excellence as a social prophet and an outstanding professional in Silicon Valley because of her passion for service to her community. Colleen was also a member of the Cupertino Rotary, Santa Clara County Senior Care Commission, National Association of Juneteenth Lineage of California, California Healthcare Reform, and the Association for Fundraising Professionals. Colleen had exceptional qualities in giving and caring for others. This was well known about her. Her dedication to this community will forever be remembered. And just to her family, I, I wanted to share that you know, once you met Colleen, you knew her and loved her forever. She was um, a force and truly an inspiration for servant leadership. And I wanted to share our condolences on behalf of the Board of Supervisors to the family of Colleen Hutchins. She Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and again, forgive me for uh, any technical challenges. One of the one of the opportunities we have as board members is to meet or simply become aware of the work of um, literally thousands and thousands of people doing good work in the community. I I never had 
the opportunity to meet Hiri Shepazer. But Hiri Shepazer um, is someone I learned about after his recent passing because here in the North County community, particularly uh, with folks who worked in the mental health world, who worked in the uh, world of uh, helping the homeless, uh, Hiri was um, a name that it appears everyone knew. Um, he spent more than three decades at uh, Momentum. <clears throat> he provided stability and a friendly face and uh, hope, frankly, to a great many folks uh, who are often overlooked and underserved. He took the view that it was uh, his job uh, to meet uh, folks who were without housing where they were, both uh, physically where they were, but also in terms of their own uh, mental health. He referred to uh, people we might think of as his clients, as his partners, and uh, shared his personal cell phone to make sure everybody knew that he was just a phone call away. He visited the encampments frequently. Uh, he was out in the streets in the wee hours of the morning, two, three, four o'clock in the morning, uh, because for him, this was not simply a job. It was uh, his calling and a, a way of life. He had the further talent uh, to develop uh, meaningful relationships with folks in local government and with law enforcement and our court system. Uh, so if somebody needed a P.O. box uh, to make their life work or a driver's license or uh, help processing a parking ticket, uh, Hiri uh, Shabazer was there for them. And uh, it is clear from talking with folks at Momentum that he was a person who was kind and humble, um, authentic, genuine human being who is uh, missed already and will be missed for a very, very long time indeed. So thank you for allowing uh, me to add uh, to the list of condolences today, uh, adjournment in memory of Hiri Shepazer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Chavez, Vice President Allenberg. Amazing people we learn about. We now move on to item number five, accommodations and proclamations. And uh, this will be Supervisor Ellenberg presenting the proclamation for this month. And again, anyone wishing to speak under public comment about anything not on today's agenda, please register electronically at this time. Vice President. Thank you so much. And thank you to Supervisor Lee for your, your partnership and to all of my colleagues for joining me with, um, in this proclamation that June 2021 is to be LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Pride represents courage, strength, openness, unconditional love, resilience, kindness, and compassion. The LGBTQ community celebrates this month with, rem with remembrance for the generations of those who have been killed, injured, discriminated against, shunned, and closeted. The community also notes that some progress has been made with acceptance, marriage, and diversity. But as we all understand, there is so much more that needs to be done with the federal path passage of ENDA bringing full equality closer to a reality. We look forward to a day when transgender and non-binary women are not killed or threatened. I am so proud that here in Santa Clara County, we have so many organizations working to support individuals on their journeys. From the first in the nation, our own Office of LGBTQ Affairs, along with Billy DeFrank Center, Project Moore, Bill Wilson Center, Avenidas, Youth Space, Queer Space, the Transgender Health Clinic, Proud Parents, PFLAG, and so many others, far too numerous to mention. This week on Friday, our former colleague, Supervisor Ken Yeager, and his organization, the Baymac Foundation, will be opening the Queer Silicon Valley exhibit at History Park to mark the struggles and honor all who did so much right here. I look forward to being there and to seeing it and to all of you an, an invitation as well. And next week on June 30th, the, count, the county will honor the LGBTQ plus diversity by raising a brand new flag called the Progress Pride flag that will show that out of many, there is hope for a better future and Santa Clara County leads the way. Thank you very much, Professor Ellenberg. Very, very well said. 
Thank you. I think comments, may I? Please, and then I think we have someone um, accepting the proclamation. Yep, I'm calling on Supervisor Lee right now. Thank you, President Wasserman and Supervisor uh, Ellenberg. Uh, I have a few brief remarks as well. Uh, this year, as the progress pride flag and many other pride flags are waving across America's municipalities and communities, we see change arriving across the entire county and America. We have made great strides toward equality, but there's more work, much more work to be done. During this month of pride, we must celebrate the victories and the hard work of individuals whose perseverance and sacrifices made this progress possible. But we also remember those we have lost along the way. To borrow the words of President Biden, this month, we recognize the resilience and determination of the many individuals who are fighting to live freely and authentically. In doing so, they are opening hearts and minds and laying the foundation for a more just and equitable America. Those whose memory we carry with us as we strive to make this a more just and equitable world for all. And that's why this proclamation is so important to remind all that there's no room for hatred and really only love in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you. And Vice President Ellenberg, are you referring to Adrian? I am indeed. Thank you. You are. Wonderful. Adrian, thank you for joining us. Did you wish to share a few words? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to Supervisor Ellenberg and, and Supervisor Lee for your words. Um, I, my name is Adrienne Keel. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I serve as our um, director of the LGBTQ youth space and LGBTQ wellness programs um, here in Santa Clara County. And um, I want to thank you, extend a huge thank you on behalf of our youth, on behalf of our participants and our staff for this proclamation. Um, and, I, and I also want to extend a thanks for the years of continued support from our board. Um, I want to point out that having the support of local government is, um, is sometimes the exception and not the rule. So I, I thank you so much for your visible support of our community. Um, and I just, I want to acknowledge that this year has required so much resilience and patience from our young people. And I'm glad that we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, but this proclamation is really for them. Um, thank you for being patient with us while we've had to pivot and create online programming. Um, our staff have done a phenomenal job of making this transition into how do we, how do we maintain meaningful connection and engagement with our participants when we can't share space with them in person. Um, and so I'm really excited. Um, this morning I got an email that Silicon Valley Pride is on full force. So I'm really excited um, that we'll be able to, to gather and build community in person. And I look forward to seeing some of you there. Um, and thank you again for this recognition. Um, we're very, very appreciative. Happy Pride, y'all. Thank you very much, Adrian. Well spoken. I want to give a shout out to uh, Ken Yeager as far as opening hearts and minds. Uh, when I first had the privilege of serving with him about 11 years ago, and Adrian, all the board members that I've served with in the past and all those that I'm serving with now definitely support all that's going on. And uh, we thank you for your leadership. Thank you very much. That's item number five. We now move on to public comment, which is the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on today's agenda. And Jess, I'm seeing about 15 right now, 14, 15 right now. So let's go to one minute in each. No problem. And again, reminder to everyone, this is the opportunity to speak on something not on today's agenda. And we really stick to that. Thank you. We will put up a one minute timer. Our first speaker will be Viani E. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I see that your microphone is on. Sorry. Go ahead and begin. There you go. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good morning. Um, I'm Vianney Evora, Evora, working at O'Connor Hospital for 16 years. I'm a registered nurse for more than 30 years in multiple areas of expertise. The intensive care unit, the emergency department, the post kidney transplant unit, and the new rapid response team at O'Connor. I have distinguished myself with the accomplishments as a critical care nurse. I'm a nurse leader, charge nurse, open heart nurse, mentor, and preceptor of the newly hired and new graduate nurses. I train and oriented charge, charge and future heart nurses. I am also an advocate supervisor for the ICU. As a rapid response nurse, I do rounding in the hospital. 
I respond to the R articles, code blue code, stroke alert, code AMI, and code sepsis. Um, I have taken more responsibility which should be underpinned through a fair salary. In light of my accomplishment and skills, this should be one of the determinants of the offer made. I believe my level of clinical three step six should have been evaluated as clinical three step seven C. Thank you for taking the time and considering my plea for salary readjustment. Our next speaker is Heather Gibson. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I would just submit that under the Ralph Brown Act, given that there are only 15 speakers, one minute seems to be an unreasonably short allocation of time for those who wish to speak. And you can hear people, the last speaker, me, rushing through what they're trying to say breathlessly. And it doesn't seem like giving everyone two to three minutes would really create any sort of difficulty for the board um, other than maybe having to extend the meeting out another half hour or so. Um, I would just suggest that in the future, you provide people with sufficient time to speak and um, hopefully we don't need to bring any sort of an action under the Ralph Brown Act in order to enforce that. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may just address Heather's comments just a moment ago, as it says in our agenda, when we have 15 or more minutes um, to speak that we do one minute and we've now had two and we've got 16 more. So we have 18 speakers. And so we're doing exactly what, what it says in the agenda. Go right ahead. Our next speaker is Trang to RN. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Chang. I've been a nurse for 16 years with four years in a nursing home and the last 12 years in acute care hospital. I've been working in medical surgical unit, intensive care unit and women's service department. I have a master degree in science and leadership. I also certify as critical care nurse and certify in electronic fetal medicine. I've been working at O'Connor for six months now. Um, I'm bilingual. I fluent in English and Vietnamese, which is very important for the large number of Vietnamese patients who don't speak English. I feel like it's unfair for me to get paid lower than nurses who work, who have less than three years of experience in acute care setting. So please uh, reevaluate my salary and adjustment. Thank you very much for everybody to listening to me and have a good day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lauren Mendoza. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Lauren Mendoza. I'm currently a nurse with a master's degree working in the ICU at St. Louis. I've been a nurse for about 14 years. And when the county buyout of the hospital occurred, I was appalled to find that my salary was based only on the scheduled number of hours I work per week. On my application, I included the additional one to two days a week I, I work on another unit, the additional hours I pick up to fill in gaps in staffing, the role I take on as charge, and the different projects I'm working on for the hospital. None of this was considered because I was not placed into the same category as my coworkers with the same number of years of experience. Instead, I was placed into a pay category with a newer nurse to the ICU who has five years less experience working the same number of hours per week as me. This was insulting after showing how experienced I am, dedicated to the hospital and community. I hope that the county will reconsider their hiring practices so that their nurses can be paid fairly and compensated. Thank you. Lauren. Next speaker is Carol Galley. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Carol Galley, you'll have to accept the unmute and then you'll have one minute to speak. My name is Carol Galley. I have been a very dedicated and hardworking nurse for 39 years. It has been very disheartening that I was placed in a lower step class, thus pay rate at the time of my hiring when O'Connor Hospital was purchased by Santa Clara County. Shortly after the initial application process, I realized the mistake that had been made. I attempted to correct the problem at that time had been and have been continually trying to correct it for the last two plus years. I've made numerous phone calls and have sent at least 10 emails and have had no correction, satisfaction or resolution to date. 
Many of my emails were never even responded to. I feel very disrespected, devalued, and dishonored. There has been a great injustice done by the County of Santa Clara in their hiring process. The application was very flawed, not capturing my true work experience. Please make the corrections and honor your nurses for the hard work that they continue to do. We are not asking for anything more than what we deserve. Thank you. Our next speaker is Francisco Cruz. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Francisco Cruz. I'm a rapid response nurse at O'Connor Hospital. I'm a registered nurse for 28 years. Uh, during the hiring in 2019, I have a total of 21 plus years of acute experience. Back in March 18, 2019, I emailed Human Resources to look into my application again because I believe there's a discrepancy in the provisional rate that was offered to me back then. HR replied that for pay issues or questions, I should contact my manager, which I did the next day. Now, two years have passed and still none of my questions were answered. The provisional conditional offer salary was based <clears throat> on the clinical nurse three job code S75 step six, which is $78.26. I believe I should be getting at least $82.17 or $84.22. I thank you for looking into this and hoping I will get answers this time and have a great day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gloria Esther Carmona. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Gloria Esther Carmona. I'm working in O'Connor Hospital for about 17 years as an ICU nurse. I'm a dedicated and loyal nurse at OCH. I'm taking care of COVID patients without hazard pay charge, nurse resource, rapid response team substitute, receptor new nurses, and etc. Otherwise, I'm active in our unit as one of the leaders. I was hard point nine as full time under Daughters of Charity, but been working over my coded hours. I'm currently full time at the uh, OCH under Santa Clara County. I'm essential in our unit because I'm an experienced ICU charge nurse, a lot of skills, and I feel my hiring was unfair because under uh, when I was uh, I was one of the nurses that the HR or county of representative instructed to write only OCH experience and. What I do, I didn't write my entire resume and other hospital experience. I was offered clinical three uh, S75, and I feel like I belong to clinical nurse three step seven with more than 25 years of experience as a registered nurse. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I'm unmuting you. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I would like to uh, confine my comments to this report that's gonna be coming out in June and what it may imply with, uh, with respect to the lead levels inside the blood is that as a, as, a, as a collective, as a county, we really need to start talking about the DDT pesticides that were loaded onto planes at Hillview Airport and sprayed all over my ancestors in this, in this city. And, and then profited from that system. And the reason why is because when we're looking at homelessness, when we're looking at poverty, when we're looking at all these issues, it stems from that dehumanization. And people in this county are not sensitized to that. And that is on you. And so I bring it to you as a descendant, as a fifth generation Sajonero that has 15 ancestors buried in Oak Hill Cemetery. I am asking you to sensitize the public to the tragedies that have happened to my our next speaker is Gabriel Sanchez. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Gabriel Sanchez. I have worked as a cook within the diet. Oh, apologies, Gabriel. That was a misclick on my end. Please you, start again. <clears throat> my name is Gabriel Sanchez. I have worked as a cook within the dietary department of St. Louis Regional Hospital for the last two years. There are many challenges my department faces, the most acute of which is low staffing. Census numbers have been consistently higher since joining the county, while staffing has been reduced. The lack of food service workers results in patient meal delivery being delayed, often by more than 30 minutes after trades are completed. Most of the cooks have been overworked to the point of injury, making the situation so desperate that my manager is working three shifts a week this whole month. We need additional coded positions within the dietary department at St. Louis. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jody Kay. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. 
Hi, my name is Jody. I'm in uh, District 18. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to agree with Heather Gibson, or excuse me, with Heather, that there's just not enough time. Um, one minute is just not enough time. Um, I would like to talk about how uh, the divisiveness in my town is affecting me regarding vaccinated people and unvaccinated people. Um, from my church to my job to my gym, I feel like I'm, I'm being bullied and shamed if I don't tell somebody that I've been vaccinated or if I refuse to answer, which most of the time I refuse to answer. I would also like to bring to your attention that small businesses are being are being put in uh, between a rock and a hard place because you know they're being forced to comply with the OSHA rules, which they are. And in turn, they're, they're creating a, a very divisive work environment for people. I mean, the big topic is, have you been vaccinated or have you not been? And then here comes the shame and the bullying. I would like for it to stop. Thank you. Our next speaker is Audrey Cordova. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, good morning. I'm Audrey Cordova, a psychiatric social worker at Kidscope Clinic under Behavioral Health Services Department. We need help. Kids and their family aren't getting the care they need from us and they have to wait. They complain about their care or worse, fall through the cracks like the toddler's family who's homeless and dropped out of treatment because they were tired of dealing with the confusing web they've to navigate to get meaningful help. There's no way a team of five providers can handle all the assessment, case management, treatment needs for our county's kids. To make matters worse, the few of us left are mistreated, blamed for systemic shortfalls, and worked until our health deteriorates. Yesterday, two of us had come back from long medical leaves, and there's others that sometimes want to quit on the spot. It's difficult. That's why I'm here asking for help. Please use American Rescue Plan money to hire more frontline direct service staff. We need more providers to address our community's behavioral health needs. Thank you. Have a good day. Our next speaker is Shasta Erickson. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm a primary care provider here in Santa Clara County for 28 years. And in the uh, freedom of speech, I, I want to, to beg you to, to take a look at what we're doing to our children and our community with these vaccines that only had eight weeks of safety trial. I do not want this county and you to have on our hands that we did not protect our children from something that may be causing a spike protein and possibly could create blood clots and long-term infertility. I implore you to please stop the pressure and the coercion, especially on our youth. I've always believed in California. I've been in Northern California my whole life and I believe in America. I implore you to look again at what we're doing in this area and please keep everything equal. Our next speaker is Blair B. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman here. To follow up on my uh, public comment from yesterday, a uh, uh, thank you that uh, for everyone working on the eviction moratorium things, that's owners, tenants, and city government. Um, I, you know, I, what I tried to say, I didn't say yesterday, uh, you know, I, I very much of a thank you, you're working on this. I hope that uh, the subsidy ideas from the state and federal level for the eviction moratorium, what we're developing, it's, it's great. I hope we can learn to use that uh, in other parts of our lives and other parts of city government and uh, local government practices. Thank you. 25 seconds, uh, I understand the, uh, the VTA issues of a bus bridge from Tasman to First Street can be really difficult to navigate and work towards at this time. Good luck to what can be open uh, government practices to get there and just uh, heartfelt transit operations. Um, there's a lot involved. Uh, let's be open hearted and good minded at this time. Thank you. Next speaker is Abe Hughes. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Abe, I see your microphone's on. Go ahead and begin. And we will come back to Abe. Our next speaker is Rosalind Lane. Rosalind, I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Rosalind, you'll have to accept the unmute. And we will come back to Rosalind. Our next speaker is Sam Asarius. You have permission to speak. 
Please go ahead, you'll have one minute. Hello, uh, my name is Samuel Osarias, currently on ICU RN at uh, St. Louis Regional Hospital. I have been a registered nurse for 23 years now and have worked at uh, SLRH for 19 years prior to uh, Santa Clara County's acquisition of the hospital. I have worked in three different units of the hospital's charge nurse since the year 2000 when I was first hired. Currently, uh, I'm a valuable uh, leader in ICU as a charge nurse and a uh, certified trainer for our current computer program, which is the Epic Health Stream. I have mentored um, many nurses transition from our old computer system to our current one, as well as trained uh, newly hired nurses, especially travelers and per diems. Uh, I believe with my extensive experience at uh, St. Louis Hospital, um, I deserve a, um, uh, a higher step, a higher level where I currently I am. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Our next speaker is Benny Arana O'Hara. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Benjamin Arana O'Hara. I'm a social worker and a member of the trans community, and I'm speaking from my experience working in mental health and also on behalf of the organizers of Trans Voices for Social Justice. I'm speaking to you today in the hopes that you consider supporting an LGBTQ mental health specialty clinic in Santa Clara County with a specific focus on providing gender affirming care to trans community members. Currently, the Gender Health Center does not have the capacity to meet the needs of the community and those being referred to CBOs are really left up to chance of whether or not they will receive a competent service provider who can meet their needs. Some of these CBO mental health providers will take advantage of training opportunities, but many don't. There are currently no treatment services specifically for LGBTQ adults in Santa Clara County. The trans community has specific needs which are not being met. Not only does the trans community face a higher rate of mental health disparities, but also relies on letters for mental health providers to receive certain types of medical treatment due to medical gatekeeping. For this Pride Month, I would love to see us proactively committed to you. Our next speaker is Karen LCSW. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Karen, and I'm a psychiatric social worker at Downtown Mental Health Clinic. We need help. Our clients and their families aren't getting the care they need from us in a timely manner due to insufficient frontline staffing. We need to clear up our schedule to handle the same day ac access to our clients. There is no way a team of only five staff can handle all their appointments, case management, and therapy treatment for our clients. It is difficult that it it is difficult. That is why I'm here asking for help. Sadly, recently a client died of suicide. Please use American Rescue Plan fund funding to hire more frontline staff and to service the community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Scott Largent. Good morning. I, I hope you're noticing that uh, the amount of staff from behavioral health and our mental health programs are getting on to public comment and they're begging for help and i and i really don't blame them right now uh that other gal that got on there said there was only five people basically on the front line right now um you know i know we're bringing people back after the pandemic right now um this is an absolute mess yeah, i i would recommend maybe coordinating with the different activists you know people that are retired social workers retired county workers you know, I get the fact that there's no money, but you have a lot of people out there right now that are fighting for these people that are dying on our streets and, and the response is not there. You don't have anybody to respond. And I'll tell you something, law enforcement would be on here right now if there wasn't uh, things in their union contract to prevent them from speaking up. They are feeling the same way as the behavioral health staff, same with the public. You guys need to start doing something and doing it now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Edwards. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is uh, Robert Edwards, and I am a, a resident of uh, District 4, Santa Clara, and I am a small business owner. I'm here to today to 
uh, voiced uh, my strong uh, 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 concern as a small business owner uh, uh, being asked uh, by the recent uh, aggressive mandate uh, to bear the unconstitutional burden of collecting personal health information from private citizens who just happen to be under my employ. It is dangerously slippery to go on this slope and it smells of totalitarianism, quite frankly, purely and simply. I, we, we cannot stand for this. And for all the reasons above uh, uh, that, I have, uh, that I have mentioned, it is a direct violation of CalGINA, uh, which, is, which was legislated uh, in order to protect private citizens from out of control government. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Blanco. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Maria, you'll have to turn your microphone on. And we'll come back to Maria. Our next speaker is Chona Alforque. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. My name is Chona Alforque. I've been a nurse for 21 years. I've been employed at the St. Louis Regional Hospital for 19 years now in ICU. Um, I was hired a clinical nurse three. My starting salary was much less than my counterparts, and I believe this is unfair. I was recently promoted as assistant nurse manager in the ICU step down unit since March of 2021. Um, I was also cross trained as a nurse, uh, nursing house supervisor and fill in as necessary, which I was not compensated for that role. I hold a specialty certification of critical care nurse, progressive care nurse, and cardiac medication certifications. And I recently completed my master's of science in nursing and um, currently working on obtaining my, obtaining my clinical nurse certifications. So within my leadership role as a charge nurse or assistant nurse manager responsibilities include responding to housewife rapid response teams, um, cold blue st stroke alerts and other responsibility include management. Our next speaker is Tammy Matsumoto. I have unmuted you, please go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I have worked at O'Connor Hospital as a labor and delivery nurse for 23 years. Um, at the time of purchase, I was a clean ladder nurse four with over 20 years experience earning over $92 an hour. As a new hire at Valley Medical Center, I was offered an RN3 position with a salary less than $14 of what I was previously earning. Currently, I'm a member of the Wellness Committee, the Perinatal Bereavement Committee. I am an RNC. I have fundraised and delivered over 724 gift bags to encourage staff through the pandemic. I still serve as a charge nurse and as a mentor. And in May, I was awarded my second Nurse Excellence Award for Compassionate Care. I have had to obtain a loan to cover my boys' tuition, and I have coworkers that are earning more than I have with less experience. I would like to ask the county to please recalculate my care fairly. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Zora, pardon me. Zora, I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Zora, you'll have to click once to turn on your microphone. Okay, here we go. There we go. Okay, I'm in Zora, I'm in zone four. And I just wanted to say that employers and business owners should not be obligated to collect employees' private health information and record it or face criminal and civil liability. Any mandate to track and record employee vaccination status is un constitutional. Please reference the CalGINA. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Saldana. I'm unmuting you. Please go ahead. Maria Saldana, you'll have to click once to turn your microphone on. There you go. Maria, I see your microphone is on. You can begin speaking. Rosario, if you're on, could you give public comment instructions in Spanish? I think we might have a couple people that are unsure. Thank you, Jess. Sure. Thank sí. you. A las personas que necesitan hablar en español, por favor, si pueden prender su micrófono. So Maria Saldana, go ahead and turn your es microphone on. 
María Saldaña, por favor, si puede prender su micrófono. And Rosario and Jess, we need to have translation too. So if it's all in Spanish, the, it should be two minutes. Rosario will have that. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back to Maria Saldana. Let's try Maria Blanco. Maria Blanco, si por favor puede prender su micrófono. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, my name is Maria Blanco, presently working at St. Louis Regional Hospital, intensive care unit, full-time status, requesting for salary evaluation. Uh, that time during the acquisition of the, you know, of the county, I already informed HR that my salary is uh, comparable with my experience over 30 years. And I've been in ICU nurse working in specialty unit. And uh, they said that's, that's what it is. So I just ignored it. And since now my salary has been adjusted, my boss, my, uh, Gloria already informed the HR and never done anything for that. I've been in a bedside nurse working as a charge resource preceptor and a member of the Donor Rest Network. We've been working hard during the COVID-19 without uh, complaints for that. If you please, uh, could you adjust my salary for what we've been working for over 30 years? Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosalind Lane. Looks like your microphone is on. Go ahead, Rosalind, whenever you're ready. Good morning. My name is Rosalind Lane. I was hired as a nurse at St. Louis Regional Hospital. I'm asking for a revaluation regarding my, my salary. I have worked 26 plus years as an emergency nurse and now a labor and delivery nurse. This calculates to approximately a total of 41,500 hours. Since 2016, I have been the nurse champion at my department for the reduction of cesarean sections, which has placed our hospital on the California on roll system for the lower C section rates in the county and also placed our hospital with the lowest um, rates uh, regarding Valley and O'Connor. Um, I am also a speaker, a chart nurse, and a mentor. Please consider my step be changed to um, to where I deserve to be placed, and my Thank hours God. worked. In and we'll try Maria Saldana one more time. Maria Great. Saldana, you have permission Hello? to speak. Yeah, there Hello. we go. Oh, thank you. So sorry. Okay, I am uh, Maria Saldana, District Three. And, and Maria, Maria, if is, you can just speak up a little louder. My concerns is about this mandate for employers to ask employees. As an employee, I feel very uncomfortable to disclose anything regarding my health as between me and my doctor. And I also have some religious beliefs that convict me to not to participate in this experimental RNA candidate vaccine. It's a sin and I do not want to feel uh, harassed or, or uh, pressured or coerced or um, experience any type of nonverbal and verbal pressure from my uh, coworkers and my employer. I feel really bad for my employer because they're being in a position where if they don't comply, they will get fined. And it's really none of their business. Um, and I feel bad for them. It's going to bankrupt them. And we need, um, you know, I believe in the American dream and I believe in small business uh, owners to follow their American dreams. And I don't believe this is right. And I feel that my, my voice needs to be heard. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you, Jess. We had almost 25 people speak today. And of course the county is following the state rules. Uh, we now move on to item number seven where we have a number of items put on consent and a number of items taken off consent. Jess, will you please read what we have before us at this time? I will. There is a correction to item numbers 5A and item 141A to reflect Supervisor Lee as a co-sponsor. Item number 5A is the presentation and item number 141A is the adoption of a proclamation declaring the month of June as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in Santa Clara County. We have a request from administration to continue item number 11 to August 17, 2021. Item number 11 is a public hearing to consider the purchase of real property located at 2318 
Bluebell Avenue, San Jose for a public purpose. We have a request from Supervisor Lee to add item numbers 16, 17, and 18 to the consent calendar. Item number 16 is to approve referral to administration and county council to report to the board in August 2021 with options for consideration relating to allocating $115,000 to support the establishment of a health equity agenda that will determine key health equity metrics and address local health disparities. Item number 17 is to approve referral to administration to report to the board on August 17, 2021 with options for consideration relating to a partnership with San Jose State University and potentially other academic institutions to provide professional and expert assistance to the hate crimes task force. Item number 18 is to approve referral to administration to report to the board with options for consideration relating to providing a one-time sponsorship to the Commission on the Status of Women with $5,000 to support Women's Equality Day event, Celebration of Women Honoring Community Heroes in August, 2021. There were requests from Supervisor Chavez to add item number 20 to the consent calendar. Item number 20 is to approve referral to administration to report to the board on August 17, 2021 with options for consideration relating to obtaining certification by Welcoming America. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item numbers 24, 25, 26, and 27 to the consent calendar. Item number 24 is to approve county donation to the Community Emergency Response Team in the amount of $5,000 from the Supervisorial District for fiscal year 2020-2021 budget to support the development of CERT Volunteer Emergency Response Training. Item number 25 is to approve county donation to Wilson High School in the amount of $5,000 from the Supervisorial District for fiscal year 2020-2021 budget to support the student nutrition program. Item number 26 is to approve county donation to Cabrillo Middle School in the amount of $4,500 from the Supervisorial District for fiscal year 2020-2021 budget to support the student nutrition program. Item number 27 is to consider recommendations relating to sponsorship of the Rose, White, and Blue Parade and Festival. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to add item number 34 to the consent calendar. Item number 34 is to receive report relating to options for pre preserving the stories of Asian American activists in Santa Clara County. We have a request from administration to delete item number 37. Item number 37 is approve agreement with education training and research to provide audits of Santa Clara County educational institutions compliance with state and federal laws relating to sex and gender based harassment and violence and community engagement to ensure that stakeholders, survivors of sex and gender based violence and K through 12 and post secondary institutions inform the analysis and results of the audits in an amount not to exceed one million five $177,719 for period July 1, 2021 through July 30, 2023. We have a request from administration to hold item number 40 to date uncertain. Item number 40 is to receive report relating to options to provide coordinated responses to challenges confronting waterways in Santa Clara County. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 49 from the consent calendar. Item number 49 is to consider recommendations relating to commercial sexual exploitation and prevention and services program agreement. Yes, we're losing your voice. Apologies. There you go. There's a correction to item number 51. The item should read as follows. Item number 51 is to approve amendment two agreements with 15 agencies relating to providing immigrant outreach and legal representation services and unmet civil legal needs in an amount not to exceed $4,401,799 for period July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2022 that have been reviewed and approved by County Council as to form and legality. We have a request from Supervisor Lee to remove item numbers 68, 88, 100, 118, and 120 from the consent calendar. Item number 68 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 184, $450,000 increasing revenue and expenditures in the Behavioral Health Services Department budget and increasing transfers out from the criminal justice system-wide cost budget relating to one-time Assembly Bill 109 funds to support faith-based resource center services. Item number 88 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 180, $100,342,245 
transferring funds from special programs and reserves and the controller treasurer department budgets to the COVID-19 fund relating to COVID-19 expenses. Item number 100 is to consider recommendations relating to the safe parking program for unhoused vehicle dwellers. Item number 118 is adopt urgency ordinance number NS-9.300, establishing a temporary moratorium on residential evictions between July 1, 2021 through and including September 30, 2021 within the unincorporated area of Santa Clara County resulting from the impacts of the novel coronavirus COVID-19 emergency within Santa Clara County and declaring urgency thereof to take effect immediately. Item number 120 is to adopt resolution recommending additional law enforcement training policies and outreach, community outreach on hate crimes. We have a request from Supervisor Chavez to remove item number 163 from the consent calendar. Item number 163, consider recommendations relating to the Parkmore demolition and redevelopment project. We have a request from administration to delete item number 184, which was not preliminarily adopted on June 17, 2021. Item number 184 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.21.106 an ordinance amending Santa Clara County Salary Ordinance Number NS-5.21 relating to compensation of employees, implementing actions taken by the Board of Supervisors regarding the reorganization of positions within the Office of the Sheriff, Department of Correction, and Employee Services Agency. Nancy will now read an oral summary of changes to compensation or benefits for certain local, ag local agency executives. NS Dash 20.21 was approved on first reading on June 8th, 2021, but will not be fully approved until it is approved for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting. NS-20.21 provides a 3% general wage increase, effective July 12th, 2021, to the salary ranges for the executive leadership group, excluding elected officials and board appointees. Per Government Code Section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the positions for which the proposed salary adjustments are required to be disclosed. Director, Consumer and Environmental Protection. Director, Environmental Health Department. Chief Operating Officer. Director, Santa Clara Valley Health and Hospital System. Deputy County Executive. Director, Risk Management. Equal Opportunity Director, County Librarian, Director of Parks and Recreation, Director, Department of Planning and Development, Director of the Crime Laboratory, Director, Employee Services Agency, Director, Facilities and Fleet, Director, Finance Agency, Chief Medical Examiner Coroner, Director of Pretrial Services, Chief Probation Officer, Director of Procurement, Director, Roads and Airports Department, Registrar of Orders, Santa Clara Valley Medical Center Chief Executive Officer, Public Health Officer, Director, Ambulatory and Community Health Services, Valley Health Plan Chief Executive Officer, Director, Behavioral Health Services, Director, Custody Health and Custody Behavioral Health Services, Director, Emergency Medical Services, Director, Social Services Agency. Director, Adult and Aging Services. Director, Family and Children's Services. Director of Employment and Benefit Services. Chief Information Officer. The following positions had a combined 3% general range increase and range realignment for a total salary range adjustment as follows. 4% for Controller Treasurer. 8% for County Clerk Recorder, 5% for Director, Department of Tax and Collections, 12.5% for Employee Benefits Director, 12.5% for Human Resources Director, 12.5% for Labor Relations Director. Is that, that concludes our monologues. Yes. Thank you, Jess, and thank you for that monologue. Jess, I see we have half a dozen people in the queue, was that for public comment or is that on consent? I believe that's on consent. Okay, great. Would you please uh, have those people each speak for a minute each? No and then problem. Supervisor Lee, when those speakers are done, I'm gonna come to you regarding the five you removed. 
perhaps deal with those all together and quickly. And then Supervisor Chavez, I'm gonna to come to you for your two. I've got you at four, number 49 and 163. Supervisor. Yeah, I, 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 I think um, I, I'm not understanding the process exactly today. Sure. Wasserman. Okay, let's hear from the speakers we have first regarding the consent items. Okay, we'll put up a one minute timer. Our first speaker will be Perla Flores. I've unmuted you, you'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good morning, everybody. Perla Flores with Community Solutions. Commercially sexually exploited children are survivors of sexual assault and have the right to a confidential advocate. When Santa Clara County extended specialized services to commercially sexually exploited children and youth at risk for commercial sexual exploitation, we took the position as a community that commercially sexually exploited children are sexual assault survivors and that because the majority of children, youth and TAE at risk for commercial sexual exploitation have experienced sexual assault, ensuring prompt access to confidential sexual assault advocates has, was the best way to provide a trauma-informed response. We are alarmed and disconcerted by the departure from this practice and particularly by the Department of Family and Children's Services recommendation to create two classes of survivors, those that disclose and those that do not. By removing this requirement, we're essentially putting survivors in a position where they have, they have to disclose their sexual exploitation in order to receive confidential services. We urge the county to take a policy and a firm stance that commercially sexually exploited children are survivors of sexual assault and that they should be afforded all of the services in their Our next speaker is Savannah Hartman. I'm unmuting you. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Savannah Hartman. I'm a CSEC advocate and I'm speaking on item 49. Commercially sexually exploited children are survivors of sexual assault and have the right to a confidential advocate. Since 2005, the point agency system ensures that no youth or young adults fall through the cracks and has provided a trauma-informed, culturally responsive, and survivor-centered approach. The service providers have been at the forefront of developing systems to streamline access to confidential service to survivors of all forms of trafficking. Our county has always provided its prided itself in being um, what state, state mandates and has established promising approaches and best practices for serving survivors, including the point agency system, which is a national best practice recognized by the Office of Victim of Crime, as well as national organizations, including Polaris, and is included in trainings for um, futures without violence. The continued support of a confidential advocate is so important for consistency and stability of a survivor. Confidential CSEC advocates are the only type of continued support available to CSEC after they turn 18, meaning this relationship continues while others may not continue. For example, DFCS social work. Our next speaker is Genevieve Logs Logsdon. You have permission to speak. Please begin. Hello, I'm Genevieve Logsdon. I'm speaking on item number 49. I'm a prevention case manager and I facilitate uh, teen programs in Gilroy Unified School District. I'm passionate about the health and well being of the youth in our community and I'm adamantly advocating for their rights. Um, commercially sexually exploited children are survivors of sexual assault and have the right to confidential advocates. Our county has always prided itself on going beyond state mandates and doing what is best for the survivors in our community. I now request that we as a county continue to recognize that connecting CSEC survivors to sexual assault advocates immediately ensures their right to the highest level of confidentiality. I also ask to require utilization of the point agency system as it is trauma informed and been used nationally since 2005 as best practice and ensures no survivor falls through the cracks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Camille Balaloy. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Camille Balaloy, a transitional age youth advocate from the YWC speaking about item 49. Confidentiality is crucial for safety planning. It creates a space where clients can talk to you more frankly about their thoughts that, that they may have about AWOLing, harmful or high-risk behavior, even suicide ideation without thinking that the advocate will quote unquote snitch on them. Confidentiality provides space to safety plan and identify steps for harmful reduction. For example, when a youth runs away, often the confidential advocate is the one person they will reach out to for basic needs like food or advice without the fear that they will be quote unquote snitched on. The advocate often can do a three-way call with the probation officer or the social worker to alleviate any concerns that the survivor may have. For example, being arrested. In essence, a confidential advocate is the last tie at that point for the person or a survivor. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kimberly Gutierrez. Please go ahead. 
Good morning. My name is Kim Gutierrez and I'm the Human Trafficking Services Program Manager at Community Solutions. I'm speaking in regards to item 49. As a county, we are at the forefront of instituting promising, approaching, promising approaches for working with CSEC that center around the truth that youth that are at risk or experience commercial sexual exploitation are sexual assault survivors and have the right to a confidential advocate. The first version of the Santa Clara County CSEC law enforcement protocol uh, reflected this truth. In 2020, another multidisciplinary group headed by the DA's office worked to update the human trafficking protocol for law enforcement, which included the CSEC protocol. At that time, it was again included that for minor and adult survivors of human trafficking, including CSEC, a confidential advocate should be contacted through the point agency system and connected to the survivor. Ensuring connection of CSEC to sexual assault advocates and utilizing the point agency system ensures no survivor falls through the cracks. Apologies, I was muted. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I wanted to uh, thank uh, Supervisor Chavez and Lee for the collaboration with San Jose State University with respect to the hate crimes. We have to get to a point where we begin to talk about what happened to, there was five Chinatowns here in the city of San Jose. Two of them were on First Street, Second Street, and then another one was in the horseshoe. It was right there on Vine Street. And they were all burned down, terrorized, raised. And the one that uh, fomented that was Leland Stanford because he profited from that. You see, and when we don't make those links and those connections, we, we, we swim around with these facts, but it creates this cognitive dissonance and we don't connect the dots. And when we don't connect the dots, we deny our own humanity because we can't even sensitize ourselves to the humanity that was offended in another. Thank you. Our next speaker is Blair B. Please go ahead. All right, Blair Beekman here. I wanted to speak on items uh, 38 and 24. 38 is about a uh, 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 broadband report to yourselves uh, to, to further digital divide ideas. I hope you can always consider uh, open public policies with the future of digital divide issues. Uh, I think uh, it can be an important component to your report and how to consider our practices for, for our future bridging the digital divide. Um, with 29 seconds, uh, you, I wanted to thank you for, uh, for offering a, a bit of a donation for CERT funding. I'm trying to learn to practice, uh, you know, that we're, we're preparing uh, for the next few years and decade, you know, wildfire, sea level rise, climate change, and a possible large earthquake. And uh, so the CERT training is very good. Open public policies can really help our practices and, and get us through difficult times. I hope we can remember that. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. Please go ahead. Thank you, Scott Largent. Uh, we have a lot of uh, items on the behavioral health um, on the agenda today on the consent calendar. I, I think this is a little too late right now. I think it's like putting out a forest fire with a squirt gun. Uh, I, I would just keep asking, you have a lot of people that are in retirement, a lot of business owners that also basically retired that are out there in the streets right now, and they're really fighting for these people. And they should work with the system, not against the system. And that's what's happening right now. You have hundreds of good people out there literally pulling people out of the trenches. And they continue to call numbers through our county that have no response, no services. There's just really nothing. So the community is trying to figure out options right now and bypass the county. And that just seems so sad right now. We have a humanitarian disaster that grows every single day down the street and is literally out of control. A uh, Vietnam War vet ran into a, a homeless man having a mental health crisis on Coleman. It was the saddest thing I've ever seen. And this poor man um, was a combat war veteran. He shouldn't have to go through that. And then Our next speaker is Jorge Perez. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Jorge Perez. I am a hospital stationary engineer. I work at uh, VMC. I'm here. Uh, to speak on behalf of the VMC Hospital Stationary Engineers. 
we are currently in the process of a classification respec. The county has had issues with hiring hospital stationary engineers at BMC over the last 20 years. We, with the acquisition of O'Connor and St. Louis Hospital, this problem has been compounded twofold. Those two sites have been operating with contractors for more than a year and a half. We are working diligently with management to get this issue resolved, but we need your help in moving this process along. This is for item number 60. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Julie Valdez Moreno. Please go ahead. Julie, you'll have to go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Julie Valdez Moreno. I'm a CSEC advocate for Community Solutions. I'm speaking to item number 49. Commercially sexually exploited children are survivors of sexual assault and have the right to a confidential advocate. Sexual assault certified advocates have the highest level of confidentiality for advocacy services and can assert privilege if subpoenaed. Confidentiality is important for a number of reasons, including it is of utmost importance to survivors. We've heard this from the survivor adversary council members and from current and past clients. It is important to criminal justice cases we don't want advocates vulnerable being called to the stand to testify to any disclosures made by a survivor. Not being able to assert confidentiality, confidentiality damaging to the trust the survivor has placed in the advocate and can also be damaging to the advocate. Clients have said if there wasn't a confidential relationship, they wouldn't have engaged. Our next speaker is Peter Crane. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Um, my name is Kailani. I'm speaking on item 49, and um, I am a survivor of sexual exploitation. I'm a client of um, Community Solutions, and um, I think that confidential support is incredibly important because I've had a lot of people who have tried to support me, a lot of different therapists, and the only person or uh, who has truly been able to support me and that I felt comfortable with was my CSEC advocate because I knew that everything was confidential and that um and that I could trust her with everything and um so I think that confidentiality is very important because it's the it's the only way that I was able to open up thank you our next speaker is Carly Wiley I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, members of the board and community members. My name is Carly Wiley, and I am the regional administrator for Starlight Community Services, speaking to item number 49. I am in support of this proposal. I applaud Santa Clara County Social Services Agency for their decision to divide this program between Community Solutions and Starlight, two well-established and respected community-based organizations within Santa Clara County both with the wealth of experience working with youth who are survivors of or at risk of sexual commercial sexual exploitation. Starlight developed a dedicated CSEC team within our wraparound program five years ago in 2016. Through this work, Starlight developed a strong partnership with the transformation team, which will continue to be strengthened throughout this program. In addition to Starlight's dedicated team, Star's Behavioral Health Group, Starlight's parent company, has dedicated teams working with CSEC youth in Sacramento and Los Angeles County. And we have ex significant experience and expertise, including trainers of CSEC specific trainings and counseling practices. We're very much aware of the needs for confidentiality. In fact, we worked in Sacramento County. Our next speaker is Karen Schultz. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Good morning, my name is Karen Schultz. I'm the executive director of Set Forward Foundation. I'm speaking about item number 49. Uh, I'm also I'm also a practicing immigration attorney working with survivors for the last 10 years, including sexual assault survivors and CSEC survivors. Sections 1035 through 1036.2 of the California Evidence Code outline the sexual assault counselor victim privilege. This law has significant training requirements for the advocate to ensure that any advice is based on solid education, which includes units in law, medicine, and crisis intervention. But most importantly, this law provides the advocate with privilege of confidentiality that others have spoken about. Without it, a criminal defense attorney representing the abuser can call the advocate to testify about anything the survivor told them 
because without the privilege protection, under the law, the survivor's conversation would have the same amount of legal protection as a conversation with their best friend, no matter how well-informed or how well-intentioned the advice may be. As you've already heard, this can have... Thank you, Karen. Our next speaker is Alessandra Marquez. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Alessandra and I'm a CSEC advocate for Community Solutions. I am speaking on item number 49. Commercially sexually exploited children are survivors of sexual assault and have the right to a confidential advocate. LGBTQ plus black, indigenous and people of color make up much of the CSEC population and are at a higher risk for exploitation. One of my clients who identifies as black and transgender turned to survival sex just so a John would buy them a hamburger at McDonald's because they had been abused and neglected by their designated caregivers. And inside their family's big house on top of a beautiful mountain, they let my client sleep on an old dog bed. When I met them, we went grocery shopping and they picked out dried fruits, oatmeal, and canned soup. They said they wouldn't normally eat more than one small meal a day. And I shared housing resources with this client and they now reside peacefully and can focus on their academic goals. CSEC are always limited in resources and always afraid of losing something. My client told me that when people go unheard and, and unloved, they go insane. Please let us continue supporting these marginalized communities. Our next speaker is Sharon Danoa. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm Sharon Deneau with the South Bay Coalition and Human Trafficking, and the coalition has always strived to follow and pursue best practices in all aspects of combating trafficking. Since 2005, our service providers have been at the forefront of developing systems to streamline access to confidential services to survivors of all forms of trafficking. And the point agency system is part of that. It simplifies our response, which makes sure no survivors fall between the cracks. We don't want an agency having to call multiple agencies to see who can provide services. We want a warm handoff. We want simplified systems. This is something other counties strive for and we're dismissing it without any evidence or discussion about it. We also see when counties have the resource, they too send out sexual assault advocates. Alameda, San Mateo, Monterey. DFCS has said that unless a minor's confirmed CSEC, they will not be connected immediately to a sexual assault advocate. We don't do this for any other form of gender-based violence. Please take a firm position that all CSEC at risk or confirmed are provided the highest level of confidential trauma informed Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Um, good morning, my name is Catherine Hedges. I'm not speaking on behalf of an organization, but I agree with what all the advocates are saying about item 49. Um, I hope I haven't missed my chance to speak on item 22. I think it's important that the quarry not be allowed to damage our landscape. That's, you know, if they're causing landslides and parts of the mountain fall down, obviously that isn't something that's just going to grow back. Um, and I will uh, wait for the other items that are to be done at time certain. Um, the Office of Disability Affairs is very, very important, and I am a disabled person, and um, I will wait to speak on that at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monica Alvirde. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute. Please go ahead. Hello. My name is Monica. I'm speaking on item 49. I'm a CSEC advocate with Community Solutions, and I'm also a survivor of sexual assault. I would like to briefly share a little bit of my story and why I strongly believe it's important to have confidential advocates. When I first walked to Community Solutions, I was very afraid, not only for myself or my family, but because I felt like nobody was going to believe me. I wasn't sure if I wanted to tell the police about my story, but my advocate explained that they would be right there throughout the entire process and everything would be kept confidential. She continued to encourage me to file a report but what stuck to me was she said, this is your story to tell, and when you're ready, we will be here. It finally felt like I had control over my own voice. I continue to work with law enforcement and my advocate. I'm very close to my family and friends, and I love them very much, but there's a lot of details in my story I don't think I could ever share with them, ever. And ensuring that c are connected to sexual assault advocates ensures they have the opportunity to feel that they are not alone and have someone confidential to talk to. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rohin Ghosh. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, uh, I just had a quick question that I hope could be answered. I'm uh, intending to speak on item 118, the eviction moratorium. And uh, would that 
include speaking on that be in order right now, or will it come up as its own agenda item, seeing as it was pulled from consent? 118 will, will be spoken about by Supervisor Lee in just a few minutes. You're welcome to speak about it right now. Okay. Uh, Nancy, could we restart the time? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Hi, my name is Rohan. I am a, I'm a resident of Supervisor Sumidian's district, and I'm speaking today on behalf of South Bay Yimby. I am, in, we are in strong support of extending the eviction moratorium in all jurisdictions under the county, not just in unincorporated. Uh, we believe the county's board of supervisors must do as much as possible to uh, protect residents from eviction. Uh, we've been, you know, a lot of number of organizations that have been working directly with at-risk tenants uh, to get them their rent relief money have observed that the money is just not coming in fast enough. People have applied months ago and are not receiving money yet and leaving those people vulnerable to homelessness, it's thousands of people, is an extreme hazard that we should not take. We should protect. Our next speaker is Carol Ruth. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. My name is Carol Ruth, and I'm a 20 plus year homeowner on Stamford campus. And I'm uh, speaking today regarding item number 39. And I'd like to uh, urge the board to um, adopt the option of using the Stanford community stakeholder or the Stanford community plan update. Uh, to um, address the uh, upcoming infill development in our neighborhoods. We'd like to see the board use the um, community plan as a way to preserve the character of our neighborhoods going forward and uh, allow the um, uh, proposals for increased uh, density uh, to be uh, examined where up, up uh, up density could be done and down density could be maintained in the uh, historical areas. Carol, thank, thank you, you for speaking. You were speaking on item 39, so you won't be able to speak when it does come up. If anybody else wishes to speak on 39, that will be heard in numerical order and is not to be heard at this time. Thank you, Jess. Our next speaker is Salim Demerji. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi. My name is Salim. Uh, I'm a renter also with Mountain View EMB. Um, I'd like to ask the, the county to extend the eviction moratorium. We are so close to the end of the finish line um, and getting money out to renters so they can deal with the uh, rent burden that they've accumulated. Um, I really hope we extend this moratorium that way people don't get evicted just because the, the state was slow to disperse money. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angie. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Angie Evans. Um, I am a steering committee member for the Palo Alto Renters Association and the executive director of Palo Alto Forward. Um, I am speaking today, though, as a renter in Palo Alto. Um, I really want to urge the Board of Supervisors to pass an urgent to pass the urgency ordinance, but also to expand it to cover all of the jurisdictions in the county. Um, cobbling together renter protections really isn't ideal for renters or landlords, and you have an opportunity to lead here. Um, only two, as you know, 2% of relief has gone out and we need more time. Last night, myself and another steering committee member spoke to yet another person who lost their job in the pandemic, who's expecting to be evicted on the first. We know that you can do something to change that, and I really hope you will expand this to cover all of the cities so that you ease the burden on all of these renters, but also ease the burden on all of our cities. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Ma. Please go ahead. Morning, board. My name is Kevin Ma, and as a member of Sacred Heart Housing Action Committee, I'm in strong support of the eviction moratorium, but would like to see it to be extended to the entire county. As was mentioned previously, rent relief distribution under Catholic Charities has been unable to get that much money from the state, if at all any. And as such, we do need more time throughout the entire county to be able to have the time to 
provide people with the ability to get that aid, especially given that outreach to certain parts of the county has been a bit lacking due to general lack of groundwork there. And the Law Foundation has submitted a letter that said that you do have the power to do so. And it is important given that there's a lot of cities in the county that aren't really picking this up as of this moment. And we are under a time crunch of another nine or so days, despite the state giving indications, but no definite word about what the eviction return looks like. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sochil. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Sochi. I work at the YWCA. I am speaking on item number 49. I have been working with CSEC Youth for almost four years. In that time, I've heard endless times how grateful they are to be able to have a confidential advocate. Not only do they feel safe to openly talk about their depression and trauma, but also know that they will be heard and supported in their path to healing. They are appreciative that a confidential advocate is able to stand by their side throughout the entire legal process, as well as in their continued healing. Clients have said that there, if there wasn't a confidential relationship, they would have, wouldn't have engaged in services at all. Having a confidential advocate is crucial for commercially sexually exploited children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Ann Ram Ramos. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Hello, my name is Emily Ann Ramos. I am with Silicon Valley at Home, and um, I'm speaking on item 118, which was pulled from the consent calendar uh, by Supervisor Lee. Um, we welcome this opportunity to extend the eviction moratorium in the county. We ask that you expand on it to cover the local jurisdictions because it to have a patchwork of all these tenant protections um, throughout the county is a little bit uh, cumbersome and, and difficult to do. So we really ask that the county take leadership and, and expand it to cover the entire county, including the, um, the, the, the cities. Um, we are so close to, to dealing with the end of this pandemic. We hope that you um, continue this path of extending these eviction moratorium protections. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Trujillo. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Good morning, my name is Michael Trujillo and I'm a staff attorney at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. I'm speaking today on item number 118. I appreciate the um, county's interest in extending the eviction moratorium, which is critically necessary at this time as delays in state and local rental assistance programs have um, left tenants with still thousands of dollars in unpaid back rent. Um, although the staff report suggests that cities could pass their own moratoriums, this really has not been the normal course of action throughout the pandemic, and many cities will not have time to extend or reenact their moratoriums before July 1st, which means that some tenants in our county will simply be left out of these protections. Um, you know, the, the county has the power to do this under the Emergency Services Act, Section, government code section 8630. And the purposes of that act is really to avoid um, inconsistent regulations throughout the county. So um, as long as this emergency declaration continues, it's really critical that the eviction moratorium apply countywide. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ingrid Granados. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Ingrid Granados. I'm speaking on behalf of Destination Home. I'm speaking on item 118. I'd like to thank the county for your continued efforts to protect vulnerable tenants during this pandemic. The County of Santa Clara has been an incredible partner over the past year and your efforts have helped our lowest income residents remain stably housed. Unfortunately, the state's failure to extend the statewide eviction protections past the June 30th expiration date pose a real risk of an eviction cliff. While talks continue, state inaction to, a, to date necessitates an urgent local action. We applaud your swift response on bringing forward this urgency ordinance to establish a temporary moratorium on evictions. We recommend the following important modifications to the ordinance. First, have the moratorium apply to the entire county as opposed to only unincorporated areas. And secondly, to allow tenants to recover and receive assistance. Extend the moratorium to December 31st. Thank you again for your important work on this matter and for your consideration to these recommendations. Our next speaker is Scutra. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Thank you, my name is Steve Coutre. I'm a faculty member at, uh, on the uh, Stanford uh, faculty and I live in the uh, San Juan Residential District. I'd like to thank the supervisors for 
uh, supporting a, a study of our neighborhood and the planning department for their uh, professionalism during the process. Um, as you know, there are three options for you to choose from, uh, recommendations from the Planning Commission. Uh, I strongly support that you choose the option to move this forward in the um, community plan uh, with Stanford University uh, in order to um, allow for uh, change in the development standards for the residential campus. At present, the university can uh, develop uh, the current lots with up to eight units of housing, which would be really inappropriate for the, uh, uh, the current neighborhood. Uh, we suggest uh, uh, the recommendation from the Planning Commission. And again, that item will be heard in the regular agenda and it's not under consent. Our next speaker is Estefania. I've unmuted you, you'll have one minute. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Estefania. I'm a member of the Sacred Heart Housing Action Committee. I'm here to urge the board to do whatever they can to make an extension of eviction protections happen. Last year from March 19th to December 31st, Santa Clara County was one of the counties with, with one of the highest numbers of evictions in the Bay Area. We don't need to be number one again. I urge the board not to put at risk the safety and health of our families and communities endangered by the traumatic threat of lockouts and evictions. Even as more people become vaccinated and more Californians go back to work, many still depend on the eviction moratorium to stay housed. I urge you to continue to protect renters and their families by extending eviction protections to more cities in the county. Thank you. Our next speaker is Huascar Castro. I've unmuted you, you'll have one minute. Please go ahead. Hello, President Wasserman, uh, Vice President Ellenberg, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Huascar Castro, Associate Director of Housing and Transportation Policy at Working Partnerships USA. Alongside our coalition partners, we urge the board to extend the eviction moratorium, uh, and most importantly, to apply this moratorium countywide. Uh, the county has the authority to take this action ensuring that renters throughout the county are afforded these crucial protections is of utmost importance. Uh, in addition, we would recommend that these protections be extended to December 31st uh, to fully allow rent relief efforts to move forward and ensure that tenants are able to access necessary forms of rental assistance. Uh, without these crucial uh, protections, uh, with the vast majority of dollars from the state assistance program yet to be dispersed, renters will be in an increasingly vulnerable position. And what we all fear is a looming tidal wave of evictions if we do not have necessary protections in place. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment. Our next speaker is Pact Catherine. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'm speaking on item 118. Um, I agree with the previous speakers that it's very important to extend the eviction moratorium, preferably through the end of 2021, and to make sure that it includes the cities as well as the unincorporated areas. Um, it looks like not all the cities are going to have their own extensions in place. And um, we have already heard about the crisis in homelessness and if landlords are allowed to evict tenants who have not had an opportunity to get their rent relief yet, um, that's just a drop in the bucket. It's going to be an, an even worse disaster um, by probably an order of magnitude of 10. We'll have 10 times as many unhoused people so please extend the eviction moratorium to the end of the year. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you, Jess. I'm gonna to turn to our County Council, James, uh, to explain why the recommended moratorium is unincorporated only. And then board members, we're gonna attack this consent item and the items that have been pulled in a slightly different way than we have in the past. James, are you available? Yes. Item 118 is a new eviction moratorium for residential that applies to unincorporated areas through September 30th. A couple of points uh, that I would make. First, um, the good news is it appears that the state is likely to take up this issue 
the current state moratorium ends June 30th and uh, based on the public reporting, it appears that the state is uh, strongly considering acting uh, through September 30th, uh, details still to come. Uh, second, with respect to, to comments uh, regarding the scope of the moratorium, we're at a point in the pandemic uh, where the factual findings that were necessary for the county to exercise authority inside uh, the city's jurisdictions uh, cannot be made at this time. And that's why the proposal before the board is for unincorporated areas only in order to help facilitate uh, cities exercising their own um, power within their jurisdictions. We have reached out affirmatively to all of the city attorneys in the county, provided them with the materials, offered to provide any assistance, including, for example, word version uh, of the ordinance. And it's our understanding that at least some jurisdictions, including San Jose, are considering uh, enacting their own similar or identical uh, uh, moratoriums. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, I appreciate that. So board members, a little unusual today, we have more items pulled, but before we take a motion on the items not pulled, I'm gonna start with Supervisor Lee. Um, Supervisor, you pulled items 68, 88, 100, 118, and 120. Are there any comments that you wanna make on any of those and put back on consent? Do you wanna to speak to them in, in some manner um, and deal with them now? Yes, thank you. Um, on the item of 118, um, I, I would like to actually speak on it a little bit later uh, as uh, mentioned, uh, because I think it certainly re requires a little more discussion. Uh, regarding item 120, I actually would go ahead and like to uh, put it back onto consent all right. Uh, and I do have some uh, speaking points to uh, to make on that. Um, and that, that would uh, alleviate some of the uh, um, issues we have. Uh, one item I do want to uh, mention, uh, you, you wouldn't like me to say this, but I would like to pull off consent action on item number 34. I think uh, uh, Supervisor Chavez is pulling it off, but I do have some comments I would like to make uh, at a normally uh, uh, setting. So I would like to not talk about during consent. So we we'll put pool 34 uh, back off uh, consent, please. Okay, so you wanna pull 34 off of consent. Mm -hmm. So we'll add that to the list. And item 118, after you heard from James, you still wish to discuss that further. Correct. Okay, and what about items 68, 88, 100, and 120? Right, uh, of those, uh, those I would like to hear during the normal uh, course, except 120, which I will ask to have that being put back to consent. I will make a comment uh, when appropriate at this time. Okay, so board members, you heard when Jess read everything, what was on consent, what was off consent, and now Supervisor Otto, uh, Lee has added number 34 to that list as well. All right, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I'd like to add item 163 back on consent. And this is the Parkmore demolition. Thank you. I'd like to add, um, I, I have comments on a number of consent items, but what, I, what I'd like to do, if it's all right with you, Supervisor, is start with that, which I'd like to put on consent. All right, yes, please go right ahead. Thank you. Item 15 is a referral that I have asking our staff to look at the folks that we have doing the door-to-door -door canvassing now to determine whether or not there are other activities like diabetes education, CalFresh signups um, that, that um, we could have them work on as their work changes. I'd like to just have them meet with um, SSA, CHP and the providers um, to determine any kind of strategies they'd like to bring back to the board at, on, at the August 31st meeting. So Supervisor, with that direction, you're okay putting 15 on consent? Yes. Thank you. What else? Then item 35, this is a, um, a delegation of authority to the Santa Clara County Office of Education for absenteeism. I'd like to recommend that we put that on consent with the delegation of authority to the County Office of Education, but with direction to have it come back to the Children's Family Seniors Committee um, as soon as possible. 
for a verbal report um, so that by the August 17th meeting, the staff has a plan. And in addition to that, I would appreciate if the staff reached out to um, each of the board offices to get any kind of uh, intelligence they can, both on partner agencies that could support, that could help with absenteeism or to better understand any concerns each supervisor has. And with that, that could go on consent. Thank you. Any more? And just to clarify on yeah. that item 35, that's a, it's a delegation of authority to the county executive, not to the office of ed. It's for an agreement with the office of ed. Just Thank you. I appreciate that, that correction. Um, item 36. This is a report back from a request that I made uh, regarding San Jose State students and homelessness. What I'd like to do is put that back on, on consent, thank um, San Jose State and our partners like Bill Wilson Center, and ask our staff for an off-agenda report that details the number of students requesting housing, the number of students who've actually been referred to housing, and any drawdowns of state and or federal resources over the last 18 months um, to come back to the board no later than the first meeting in August, August 17th. So it's an off agenda report due by August 17th. Understood, thank you. Next. Item 38. Um, this was a referral that I brought forward re um, relative to broadband and um, uh, what I'd like to ask is for this item for option for um, action A to uh, re refer to staff to form the consortium required by the Public Utilities Commission as quickly as possible. This way that we'll be able to take advantage of the $2 billion in funding from the California Advanced Services Fund, specifically to fund last mile facilities to underserved locations, as well as the 500 million to create loans and loss reserve for that program to advance the credit of local governments seeking private financing for broadband. And then uh, for action B, the county funded connectivity and access study is fabulous. I'm so glad they're doing it, but I'd like that to be on a parallel track with the development of the consortium. And for item C, to have the staff come back with a robust once policy that can be shared with our local partners so that we can have them adopt similar policies as well. I also wanted to say on that, a very special thank you to Supervisor Allenberg for her leadership on uh, CSAC and getting this to be a priority. If you did once, it'd be great. So Supervisor Chavez, was that then with, with those additions, your recommendation on 38 goes on consent? That's correct. Thank you. Jessica, Item, go ahead. Thank you. Item uh, 49. This is the um, issue that a number of people uh, came to speak on relative to our CSAC contracts. I'd like to move action A, which is the contract with um, Community Solutions and defer action B to, C to the Children's Family Seniors Committee to assess the consistency with the current service model of that contract, specifically the use of um, confidentiality, uh, confidential advocates, the cross training of advocates, and also even some of the operations concern me. It's very inconsistent with our current plan. So I'd like that to be discussed in detail at our next, uh, at the next available Children's Family Seniors Committee. Agree on that. All right, so 49 that you were pulling off consent is now handled under consent. Correct. Thank item, you. Item 60, this is um, uh, item 60, I apologize, colleagues. I, I know like you, I have a lot of notes in front of me. Yes, 60 was on consent and no one had pulled it yet. I do, oh, I just wanted to um, say how much I appreciate the staff and the uh, union working together to resolve that. So thank you for that. Item 78. This is the um, search for a chief financial officer. I'd like to recommend um, that that be an open and, open and competitive process and want to ask the staff to come back with the referral from Supervisor Ellenberg and I at the August 19th uh, FGOC meeting so that we can look at that, get the answers to that referral, which would include a, a strategy for open competitive uh, processes for executive management 
and uh, that hasn't yet come back to us. All right, thank you. Item 92 is an environmental um, grant that our um, sustainability team is putting out. It's a beautifully written grant. I wanna ask staff, um, first of all, in the future, I, I would have loved to have uh, had an opportunity to see it because I'd like us to partner with the Air Quality Management District here because I think we could leverage some funds for them. So if the grant is received, I'd like staff to reach out to them to determine whether or not there are opportunities for further resources for the County of Santa Clara. Item 98, this is the drought um, management, uh, I'm sorry, the drought uh, declaration. Yep. And what I wanted to ask staff is to go back to Hewlett with a drought management plan, and also to make sure that we understand how, what are all the activities we can take before we um, get to our underground water resources. And that's a concern of mine. I'm sure it is to you too, Mike, given the area you represent. Um, item 102, um, I wanted to say to the um, uh, the uh, housing staff, I thought it was a really creative solution to try to um, get that some first time home buyer money out. I really want to appreciate that. I want to ask the staff um, when they come back in in September with the options for further expansion of our home uh, our our. Uh, our home purchasing programs, that they come back with multiple options and that they consider using a request for solutions as a way to get some ideas from the private sector about how we might uh, engage in further home ownership opportunities. Thank and you. then um, item 19. 19? Uh, I'm sorry, 119. Thank you. I wanted to thank Supervisor Ellenberg for um, her creative thinking about this small business fund. And I just wanted to remind staff that we'd like them to reach out to all of the cities to determine whether or not cities would like to partner there, including putting money in if they'd like so that we can be re more responsive countywide. Um, and lastly, item 133 is a report back on a grant that the district attorney's office has that they've been using to support the victims of the Gilroy um, Garlic Festival shooting. It's really amazing work. And I did want to encourage staff, uh, the district attorney's office in particular, to determine if um, VTAs, um, if the incident that occurred at VTA may also be eligible for resources, particularly long-term resources around mental health services for the impacted employees. Is that a pause that refreshes or are you finished? I think I got it all, Mike. Super, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna to turn to Vice President Ellenberg now and I'm just giving a heads up to Supervisor Lee regarding 118 that was on consent that you wanted to pull off that we just heard speakers from. When, Supervisor, when Vice President Ellenberg is done speaking, Supervisor Lee, I'm gonna come back to you and we'll deal with 118 um, right after we've approved, hopefully, the, um, the consent calendar. We're gonna do, do that one first because we've had this here, that way nobody else has to wait. Sure, that's Vice fine. President Thank Ellenberg. Thank you so much. Um, th this is more complicated today. I, I feel like there's a lot more direction going on to consent than um, than I think is is ideal, and and perhaps that's a procedural question uh, for um, for the five of us to to think about. Not today, because we do have have plenty going on. Uh, but my understanding is more that consent is really just to um, just to move it forward. So saying all of that, um, item 16 that supervisor has proposed uh, for consent, the health equity metrics referral, I would very much like to keep that on the regular calendar because I do have uh, some questions that I think can't be um, can't be answered on consent. Um, with item 35, uh, chronic school absenteeism, uh, I'm I'm happy to keep it on consent, but I but I do need then to add a comment. Uh, I appreciate staff um, for bringing forward the DOA. Uh, I will support it. Just want to highlight a concern and some additional uh, direction. I I am concerned about how thoroughly how thoroughly we have or have not coordinated with school districts uh, regarding needs for other county services ahead of next year. Uh, for example, the CFSC report on school-based behavioral health services uh, to be heard this week um, 
it only includes a couple of non, it, it indicates that only a couple of non uh, schooling service districts have been approached for discussions on supports for next year. And I'd like administration to be prepared to answer questions at Thursday's um, Children, Family and Seniors Committee meeting regarding um, what actions the county has undertaken in order to prepare uh, to meet and support whatever issues arise as students and families return to school, whether it's absenteeism, behavioral health, training for staff or outreach to students or general public health supports. Uh, with regard to item 119, also just wanna add a quick thank you very much to administration for getting the small business grant uh, program that uses a location-based diversity, equity and inclusion framework forward. I do wanna make sure that we promote this opportunity to small businesses across the county and widely share the application link. Can someone just answer briefly whether a communications plan is in place? Yes, we will be working with the um, Small Business Development Center to make sure that there is outreach and we'll also send out communication to every business that submitted a social distancing protocol. It's about 41,000 businesses. That's pretty broad coverage. Thank you very much. And, and if you could also send uh, the information or the link, James, to all of our offices, um, I imagine that we have opportunities in our newsletters or social media to promote to promote this as well. Uh, finally, in item 142, there are commendations for retiring employees. And if it weren't for the already um, tremendous length of today's meeting, I would be tempted to wax on and on both about uh, Deputy County Executive Leslie Crowell and Deputy County Assessor David Ginsburg. Both have made tremendous contributions to the work and functioning of our county. They have both been advisors and mentors to me in my, in my brief time here so far. And I want to thank them very, very much for their work and their dedication indicate that I will miss them both and hope that I can continue to call on them for advice and guidance. And that is all I have. Thank you, Thank you. definitely tremendous people. Um, Jess, Sir Wesley, you've got your hand raised. I was just gonna give, uh, go over with Jess to make sure we've got everything captured and then deal with the consent items. Did you wanna speak before I did that? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, uh, President Lossman, since sure. uh, I put those items on the consent, I just wanna make uh, some couple of brief comments on them. Uh, on item number 20, which was added onto the consent, uh, this referral is asking for staff to provide the board with information on how to become a certified welcoming county through the Welcoming American Initiative. This will enable the Office of Immigrant Relations to gain access to tools, resources, and training that will help the offices identify and design better ways to successfully integrate immigrants into the county and its communities. And I'm requesting this uh, for this item to come back in August where we could have a broader uh, discussion. Um, All righty, and that was number 30, what number? Number 20. 20, thank you. That's correct. And then uh, on number 120, which we have just put back to consent, um, I would like to request staff to provide the hate crime task force at the meeting in August with a plan of how to engage law enforcement agencies within the county and encouraging them to require sworn officers to take a post training course on how to best identify and investigate hate crimes in our community. As part of the report, I would like for staff to consider putting together a toolkit that may be distributed to the law enforcement agencies, outlining best practices and guidelines on how to conduct community engagement to inform the public of the updates made to an agency's policy regarding hate crimes. And those are the two uh, comments I want to make uh, on, the, on the consent, thank you. Thank you very much. Jess, if you'll work with me, I'm gonna reiterate what I've got from items eight through 41. And what- Supervisor Wasserman, excuse the interruption. Yes, I see your hand, Supervisor Smedium. Please go right ahead. Thank you, I uh, was trying to wait until we had cleared away some of the uh, earlier uh, comments and requests. A couple of things uh, here, I would like to be recorded as a no vote on item 89 and on item 156. Those items again are 8, 9 and 156. Then uh, on 
item number 35, which I believe Supervisor Chavez asked to place on consent, I wanted to highlight the um, portion of her uh, comments that I very much appreciated that directed staff to reach out to various other uh, offices, supervisorial offices, uh, to identify um, uh, other opportunities and venues for partnerships and uh, uh, making sure this is a countywide endeavor. I, I think um, that it threads the needle nicely uh, because I know Supervisor Chavez was anxious to move forward on this item in a timely fashion with the school year uh, you know, coming soon. And I think we, we know that uh, issues of truancy and absenteeism have been um, really uniquely uh, affected by the COVID uh, experience that folks have been through. I think we're gonna have to dig ourselves out of a hole that's very different from anything we've ever looked at before, but again, I wanted to say thank you and also uh, underline for staff the specific direction to make sure that this was uh, countywide and that other offices were consulted for uh, opportunities to partner and or to identify nonprofit partners in the community who might be a part of a helpful effort where the need exists. And we know that the need will not exist everywhere and that it will be greater in some places as well. Um, I wanted to ask then on item 15, which I believe Supervisor Chavez also asked to place on consent, yes. if we could get similar direction to staff uh, to, um, this is the uh, item that uh, asks staff to add CalFresh diabetes education and other county services as part of the outreach component to door-to-door -to -door outreach taking place for COVID-19 vaccination. We could also ask staff to, um, uh, similarly interact with all five offices to identify venues where these kinds of outreach efforts might might make sense in terms of um, uh, opportunities to reach underserved uh, neighborhoods and communities. Is that something you'd be amenable to, Supervisor Chavez? If so, yeah, I'm would, happy to leave. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. And with that, I'll, I, Mr. Chairman, I will take yes for an answer uh, on that one. Uh, and then, um, Supervisor Chavez, could you repeat, please, the direction that you were providing on uh, item 38, the, bro the broadband item? Uh, there was a, a paragraph C there, uh, and I did not uh, pick up. Again, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Today's a tech problem day, unfortunately. But if on item C, I could get clarity about what that did or did not provide in the way of direction, that would help me decide whether or not uh, I wanted to ask for this to come back onto our regular agenda or can uh, support leave it on consent. Thank, Thank you. you. What I was requesting through the chair was that the county um, work to develop a dig once policy, but work with our city partners and other agencies that are also in the process of looking at a similar policy so we could share it countywide. And presumably that policy would come back to our board for review Absolutely. before it became final. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Then with that, with my clarity and understanding, I'm, I'm comfortable leaving uh, that item uh, on consent as well, uh, Mr. Chair. And Hang on just a moment. Uh, item 16 was also identified for consent and uh, happy to leave it on consent there. I would just ask that uh, if uh, I, I think, I'm not sure who asked to put this one on, give me. Excuse me. I asked but I would just ask that. Uh, the, Excuse me, everybody, just a moment. Thank you. Please, item 16 has been put back on the regular calendar, Supervisor Smith. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that clarity. And I think Mr. Chair and members, that takes care of my issues. And again, a no vote on 89 and 156. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm sure Jess is doing wonderfully. Yes, <laughs> I am. Good. If you'll all look at your agendas for just a moment, I'm going to walk down. We're going to hear 13 and 14. 15 is on consent. 16 will be heard. 17 and 18 are on consent, 20 
will be coming back in August. 24, 25, 26, 27 are all consent. 35 is consent. 36 is consent. 37 was deleted by administration. 38 is consent. 40 is being held and pulled off of consent, excuse me, pulled off of the regular calendar. Oh, let me get that right. No, pulled off 30, of consent. Yeah, we're gonna hear 34, which was not consent, Jess. So we're gonna hear 34, that's fine. Then pulled off of consent, thank you, Jess, was 68, 88, 100, and 118. Jess, are we in sync or did I miss something? The only thing I didn't hear was that 11 is held. Everything else matches. All right, let me go back here to 11. Yes, I have 11 is continued. Thank you. That That is held. And I'm going to look for a motion to approve what I just said and the direction given. And just move. Chavez. Second. Thank you. There's a motion by Chavez, a second by Lee. Supervisor Simidian, your hand is still up. Did you have a comment before we take a vote? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're good. Okay. So we have the motion and the second. No further discussion. Jess, would you please take a roll call vote on that motion? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said before, Supervisor Lee, I wanted to hear your comments on 118. We've heard from the public. And then members, we're going to go back to number eight. Yes, thank you, uh, Supervisor Wa uh, President Wasserman. Uh, and this is really a uh, um, very uh, uh, important uh, resolution or uh, ordinance that we're trying to extend. Uh, as the county uh, council has earlier uh, opined that uh, we've been using the state's uh, temporary moratorium on evictions. Uh, we've relied on that and that one's expiring in June 30th. That is why necessitate, why we're talking about it today. Uh, we are trying to get it extended again till September 30th. Uh, uh, the current ordinance is proposed, is drafted to only cover the unincorporated area because of the potential issue regarding whether or not we have the police power or the power to declare that on the incorporated areas. So. Um, my my question uh, for the city uh, the county council uh, is as follows: uh, I understand how it's being drafted currently. Uh, the question is, what would be the downside if we were to go ahead and adopt the ordinance uh, like we did previously to apply it countywide? At this point, thank you, James. Thank you, thank you, Supervisor Lee. Um, as I think I've indicated, uh, the county cannot make the factual findings necessary to uh, step on city council's authority to exercise jurisdiction within the cities with respect to the item. And that's why it's been presented as a unincorporated um, only uh, ordinance. Okay. Right, and if that's the case, is it possible for us to draft it as a ordinance countywide and then ask individual cities say, if you want to be exempt from it, let us know. Can we do it that way so that uh, for those who don't have the resources to to pass something like this in the next few days and again at the end of the day i don't think it really matters seems like because if the, if the state are supposed to do what the state's supposed to do right uh, then this is just a backdrop it's, a, it's, a, it's an insurance uh, what my concern i guess is based on the comment from the public uh, is that there might be uh, cities who might not be as resourceful like San Jose, let's say, is ready to adopt something like this, but they don't have the, the resources that could potentially affect folks uh, uh, right now in limbo. Uh, if, you know, as we all know, the state of California has not been great about passing the budget, let's say, in previous years. And it's certainly possible that something could fall through the cracks. So in case it doesn't happen, I just really feel bad if uh, certain individuals and, and cities that does not have the resources to get this passed in a timely manner. To be subject to the uh, to this eviction order, what's your what's your view on that? 
James? Unfortunately, um, the county doesn't have the ability to adopt an ordinance that would be an opt-in, opt-out for cities. Um, that's not within the scope of the county's uh, authority. But we have uh, affirmatively provided information to all the city attorneys. We did so last week. Um, and we are certainly available to assist uh, any city with taking action. And even if in the event the legislature does not extend the statewide moratorium, uh, even if there was a slight gap, uh, cities could certainly act uh, even after July 1 if there was a challenge in them uh, acting between now and July 1. Um, and we would continue to be available to offer uh, any assistance with uh, cities that, that wished to adopt a, a similar ordinance. Okay, so if that's the case, uh, since we do have time until end of July or so, with that gap, assuming the worst case were to happen, uh, that will give us time to, to assist these cities and, and you will be able to make available uh, our counties, uh, uh, your office resources to help those counties, uh, help those cities, right? Yeah, we are absolutely available to assist any city attorney with, uh, you know, if they have any questions. And like I said, we've offered to provide a word version of our ordinance where they could simply replace county with the respective city and, and take a similar action. We we'll find and replace. Okay, good. Thank you. So Supervisor Lee, it sounds like you're satisfied with your discussion with county council at this point. You had pulled 118 off. Yes. Um, now we can take a vote on 118 Correct. And, and do that. Do you wish to make a motion? Yes, I would like to make a motion to adopt a, what, uh, the urgency ordinance uh, number NS-9.300 establishing a temporary moratorium on the residential evictions between July 1st uh, until September 30th, 2021 uh, within the incorporated areas in Clark County. Uh, and, and one uh, small amendment I want to ask is that to make sure that our county council will make uh, themselves available to help any city that would require help to pass this as well. Um, and that would be my motion. Second. Thank you. Motion by Supervisor Lee, second by Chavez. Any further discussion? Seeing none, may we have a roll call vote, Jess, on item 118? I do have one hand raised from the public. All right, oh, let's and not anymore. Apologies. Not anymore. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Travis? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. With that, we're going to move back to item number eight of public hearing for sewer service charges for County Sanitation District number two and three. And um, we're going to open the public hearing at this time and receive any testimony. Jess, I don't see any. Do you? I do not. Okay, so we have opened it. We did not have any testimony. We have now closed it. And I'll look for a motion. Uh, so moved, Chavez. Thank you. Second. Supervisor Chavez, a second by Supervisor Chavez. Excuse me, a motion by Supervisor Chavez, a second by Supervisor Lee. We have no one else to speak. And the motion uh, is to adopt the resolution as stated uh, in our agenda. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Yeah. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you. We now move on to item number nine, our good old vector control district assessments. This is a public hearing, as was the one before, not to be heard uh, earlier than 10 o'clock. And we're at 1140, so we qualify. Um, I want to open the public hearing and receive any testimony. I don't see any speakers. Jess, do you have any? Confirmed. Thank you. Then we will close the public hearing, move on to item B as in Baker, looking for a motion. Apparently, my dogs have something to say about vector control. So I'm moved. looking. A motion I have from Thank Supervisor you. Chavez, a second by Supervisor Lee to adopt the resolution of the board as listed in our agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, roll call vote, please, Jess. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? 
Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. That passes unanimously. We now move on to a public hearing for the purchase of real property at 1870 and 1888 Center Road in San Jose. Um, this is a public hearing, as I just said, not to be heard any sooner. We're past that time. I'm opening the public hearing looking for any testimony. Jess, I have none. Do you confirm? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm going to close the public hearing and look for a resolution, excuse me, a motion to adopt the resolution as stated. So moved. Thank you. We have a motion by Supervisor Lee, a second by Supervisor Chavez. Any further discussion, board members? Just, just a quick comment. I wanted yes. to really thank um, uh, Jeff Draper and Consuelo uh, Hernandez for their good work, but in particular for coordinating with the city of San Jose. Duly noted and agreed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no other hands raised, Jess, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. Yes. Wasserman. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Item number 11 was continued. We move on to item 12, which is a time certain to be heard no earlier than 11, and it is 11.50. But we confirm with that, that's consider recommendations relating to the Valley Homeless Health Care Program. And we'll take a brief report from our Health Resources and Services Administration. Excuse me, we don't need that. Possible action is to receive the report. Um, we've got Paul here. Board members, do you wish to receive a report at this time? No, oh, I don't see a oh, supervisor Lee. Uh, yes, certainly. We're on item 12, right? Yes. Correct. Yes. Certainly, so moved. Carol. President Wasserman. Yes, Vice I President Allenberg. I, I think that an important part of the audit process may be that they need to make a, a presentation to us so that we you have things to respond to. Thank you. You're absolutely correct. And I have not turned over my page to page number two. So with that, may we please have a report? Great. And Q&A as appropriate. Right. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman and Vice President Ellenberg, as well as members of the board. Um, as your board is aware, uh, since 2003, the County of Santa Clara has been a recipient of a homeless healthcare grant from the Health Resources Services Administration. And as your board is also aware that this grant is a, an essential um, component of our healthcare system, particularly in our service to the homeless population. Um, this week, uh, the healthcare system is going through uh, our HRSA site review audit. Um, this occurs every three years. Um, and this uh, review is focused on our compliance with 19 standards uh, for the healthcare program. And they range from clinical standards of care to finance as well as governance. Uh, at this time, what I'd like to do is introduce to you our site review team. Um, if uh, I can ask them to turn on their cameras if they're available. Yes, please. There um, we are. Yes, and through the chair, if I could introduce them. Uh, first, we have uh, our site team lead, uh, Scott Graff, uh, who will be overseeing the review of our administrative and governance compliance. We have Carrie Cohan, Pound, who will be overseeing the financial review. Thank you, Carrie. And then, of course, David Adams, who will be doing the clinical review of our homeless health care program. Also, uh, on the Review team, we have Marianne Ledipo, who is our HRSA program auditor, um, uh, review project officer. Um, so at, list, at this time, uh, President, I'd like to turn this over to Scott Graff, who can uh, take us through the, the review and the questions. Wonderful, please, let's do it. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Scott. All right. Uh, uh, just uh, so you know, uh, it, I'm trying to turn on my video and it says uh, the host has disabled it. All right, just so look into that. I'll, uh, I'm happy to, okay. 
All right, go ahead, Scott, and we'll try and get you on there. There you go. Okay, I think so. Thanks. Uh, and as all of you, uh, we are working remotely as well. Uh, we have, uh, we as your uh, operational site visit team, the consultants and our uh, federal representative, the project officer for the operational site visit are uh, meeting with you as the governing board of the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. And when I say that, uh, you as uh, the county uh, have elected uh, to serve as the governing board and you have uh, bylaws that you uh, uh, developed back in 2016 yes. to support uh, the uh, Santa, Santa Clara Valley Medical Center's ability to operate the and receive a grant for the Valley uh, Homeless Health Care Program. So, we are going to be visiting with you and actually wanting more to learn from you about within those bylaws, uh, the of your bylaws, Article 5, uh, how you exercise your duties of uh, providing governance to uh, the homeless health care program. But before I do that, if you don't mind, uh, um, Supervisor Wasserman, uh, how much time do we have on your agenda? Um, we're over time already, and I'm trying to catch up, which is why I was going too fast when I hit number 12. So I appreciate Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee uh, slowing me down. I'd like to make this as brief as possible. We want to meet all the requirements um, of your audit. This, this board evaluates things directly and, and approves them. Um, I believe we do everything that is appropriate and called for. Um, so the briefer you can make it the best, but okay. but we also need it to satisfy whatever you need so that we um, are found to, to be in compliance and everything else appropriate. Okay, so we'll be direct, uh, much more direct. This is a, a unique uh, experience for me because it's very, very few times do we uh, uh, participate in an active uh, uh meeting of the board of, gotcha. of a health center board. It's usually an open or a closed meeting, but given uh, your circumstances being located in California and open meeting laws to have a group meeting, this is uh, the conduit for that. But yes, before this is, I- and Scott, just for clarification, this is an open and public meeting per state. Yes. Law. Okay. Yes. Good. Right, yeah, and we actually needed to work up through the federal agency to make sure that was okay for us to do uh, our work with you this way. Good because, enough. Uh, and so that has happened. And with that being said, I'd like to uh, uh, invite our federal representative, uh, Marion, to just say a few words. Marion, can you uh, just uh, right. share a little bit about... Uh, as our federal representative, what the operational site visit is about, as Paul mentioned earlier. And then when Marion's done, we'll uh, take turns as the consultant representing the various disciplines, ask very directed questions about how you as the governing board exercises your oversight of uh, sure. the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. So Marion, are you available to- uh, Yeah, yes, can, can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll do my best at speed talking um, in the interest of time. Um, um, I, I apologize if I'm repeating what Paul and Scott have already said, but the, um, um, uh, uh, the purpose of this visit is to support the effective oversight of the health center program. And the site visits uh, typically typically takes place over um, once every project period, I believe. Um, uh, Santa Clara was originally scheduled to uh, have a site visit in 2020, but I, I believe it was rescheduled due to the, um, the pandemic. The, um, the operational site visit is conducted use, using utilizing uh, various questions, methods, resources provided in health center uh, program site visit protocol. And the operational site visit uh, provides a comprehensive uh, objective baseline information on the health center's compliance and allows us 
to uh, um, objectively assess, verify the status of compliance with your statutory and regulatory compliance of the health center program across all operational areas. And this includes fiscal, clinical, administrative, and governance. Um, this OSB allows HERS an opportunity also to document any um, health, I'm sorry, best practices that the um, health center has. Um, so the team of consultants that are here today have expertise across all those areas that I just mentioned. And over the next uh, two and a half days, the consultants will be reviewing documents and meeting with various members of the health center staff. And of course, now um, uh, we, we will, and they are meeting with you, the board of supervisors. Um, so I, I think I will end there. Um, again, I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to participate um, today in, the, in your meeting, and I will turn it back over to the, the consultant team. Thank you. It's great to have all of you here. All right. Uh, thanks, Marion. So uh, for the sake of time, uh, we're just going to go ahead and take turns asking some questions. And again, this is for us to learn how you perform your oversight uh, responsibilities to the health center program as the governing board. With that being said, uh, I'll start and then I'll turn to my colleagues uh, for uh, their respective clinical quality uh, oversight and financial oversight. But uh, uh, and Mr. I have, Graf, Mr. Graf, I can interrupt for just a minute. Supervisor Lee, you have your hand raised at this moment. Did you wish to make a comment before we continued? I was actually just going to wish them welcome to them. That was why I raised my hand earlier. So I'll go oh, good. But welcome yep. to the team for being here. Thank you. Yep, you've got a welcome for sure. And Vice President Ellenberg, your electronic hand is raised as well. No, I'm just an overachiever ready to answer the questions. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. She sits in the, fir the front okay. row. All right. All right. Well, uh, let me just start with this. I, I had the benefit. I have the benefit. Uh, we all have are receiving and looking at a number of documents in advance of starting our work this week. And so I had the benefit with my role with governance uh, review to uh, see and read uh, your hospital committee meeting minutes. And if I'm, correct me uh, uh, if I mispronounce your name, but uh, uh, Supervisor Simeon. 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 Okay. Sim is, Simeon. Uh, thank you. Uh, is uh, the representative or on that uh, committee? Yep. And he's and, on live with you right now. Okay. Perfect. But uh, so maybe uh, uh, we'll hear a little bit more uh, from you. How, how does uh, the reports for the healthcare? Uh, for the homeless program uh, get presented to uh, uh, the Board of Supervisors. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, and I'm happy to respond through the chair, uh, Mr. Wasserman, if that's okay with you. Yep. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I wanna add my welcome to folks who are uh, joining us today. I also wanna explicitly underscore the importance of the support we receive for these efforts and the importance that uh, that support plays in our ability to deliver services out in the community. Uh, this is work that um, I think everyone understands is important and needs to be done uh, and is so often the case, uh, <laughs> the work that is difficult but important that somebody has to do ends up falling on our county. And, uh, and, and that's as it should be, that's who we are, that's what we do. I want to ensure you, uh, assure you as visitors that um, not only is that service uh, well provided, and I see Mr. Lorenz leaning in here uh, from our health and hospital system, but um, there are two members of the health and hospital committee at present. Uh, I am the chair and supervisor, uh, Lee is our vice chair. Uh, in recent years, Supervisor Ellenberg has served as vice chair, but all five members of the board on a monthly basis uh, receive the report uh, that we're receiving today. 
And uh, people lean in. If you were to go back and look at those minutes, you'd see that each and every one of the five uh, colleagues, and I don't recommend it because it's a daunting task, uh, but uh, all five uh, members of the board lean in with very specific questions and concerns, both about uh, the nature and the extent of the services to make sure that folks in their district are being well served and throughout the county. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that while each one of the district supervisors is an advocate for his or her district, uh, I think our board is very good about understanding our common responsibility throughout the county. That said, um, it, we want to make sure that we have uh, more opportunity to really do the deep dive on these issues. Uh, and um, we have at the Health and Hospital Committee, as Mr. Graff alluded to, uh, and um, we have the opportunity there to dig down uh, in even greater depth. And we have a uh, monthly or almost monthly meeting of that committee. And this item is on that agenda uh, at every single meeting. And uh, sometimes it may not be um, agendized as such by name, but it is part of a report received by our committee uh, literally you know, uh, 11 out of the 12 months uh, during the course of the year. So that is a second venue where there is an even finer screen. And just to give all of you who are uh, participating in this conversation uh, a sense of just how finely grained it is, I'm going to look at Mr. Lorenz on my screen because I know I can make him smile. He'll tell you that we get right down to the level of what do you mean there aren't parking spaces for the van? Who do we have to talk to to make sure that the van, see? Who do we have to talk to to make sure that the van gets to the place where it can provide the services to the people who need them where they are? We are literally uh, that granular. I know we are somewhat unusual by virtue of being a, a responsible board that is a, a publicly elected board of supervisors. Uh, but if anything, I think that facilitates and enhances our ability to um, make sure that uh, the folks we're trying to serve get the time and attention that they deserve. We do it not only at the full board meetings, but also at the health and hospital meetings, as I've suggested. And then I can assure you, every one of the five supervisors is poke, poke, poking, push, push, pushing on our staff to say, hey, what about this and what about that between the meetings? So uh, that was a long riff, Mr. Chair, but I, I know we don't get to see these folks that often, and I did want to underscore all of that for them. No, I think it was well stated and very comprehensive. Thank you. Mr. Graff, any questions? Yes, uh, thanks. That was ac actually very uh, helpful and uh, uh, filled in a lot of gaps for me. So I appreciate the detail. Uh, two follow on questions, and I'm going to yield time to my colleagues. Uh, the first is uh, one of the key documents uh, that uh, we expect uh, health center boards, and in this case, the, the Board of Supervisors, to receive and review and approve is your three year renewal of what we call your service area competition or for your health center program. So in this case, it's submitted by way of the hospital system, but under your approval, uh, how will Again, this may be through the Health and Hospital Committee. How does that uh, get reviewed and or submitted for review and approval by the Board of Supervisors? Thank you. I can turn to back. Chair. Yes, so I was just going to turn Thank back you. to you, Supervisor Smitty. I would say, uh, again, we have the vehicle of the Health and Hospital Committee to um, serve as a... a a venue where uh, we can give attention even more fully at the committee level uh, when we're in this process with Mr. Lorenz and his professional team. But I, I think I should also share, uh, again, through the chair, um, that uh, while the meetings are open and public and, you know, we have a commitment to transparency here that I think uh, you noted earlier is actually uh, probably substantially uh, greater uh, than in a non-public uh, uh, venue, we, we also, as I said, reach out as individual supervisors. And some of that may not be readily apparent to you and your colleagues, but just as an example, and here again, Mr. Lorenz will know what I'm talking about. Uh, when we have health and hospital committee meetings, 
Uh, if there are issues that require follow-up either before or after the meeting, uh, that time gets scheduled. There's a half hour on the calendar all of a sudden for uh, me to talk to Mr. Lorenz or to uh, Renee Santiago, who is a key figure in our health and hospital system as well. So those conversations take place, I, I probably should have said this before, Mr. Wasserman, you know, at, at, as they say, at a third level as well uh, through, through the process, but the committee does in fact serve as a venue where these issues can be dealt with in even greater depth so that when the item comes to the full board, while there may be less uh, discussion at the full board, um, that's because uh, there's already been a careful review at the committee level. Thank you, Supervisor Smith. And Mr. Graff, if, if I may say, the mission of our county is public health and public safety. And over half our funding goes to public health. And not to belittle any other commission, but it's our health system that is so extensive and affects and helps so many people in so many ways that the people of Santa Clara County, now 2 million of them, depend on every single day in some way or another or has a friend that does. And being on that health committee is a huge responsibility. And their meetings often go on for hours so that they hear from everybody, analyze staff, the public, whatever it may be. And if they need more information off agenda or the next meeting, I get notices of special meetings that are being held just so they can address whatever the issues are in a timely manner. Okay, well, th that, I appreciate the, the acknowledgement of that. And I actually shared my observation with my colleagues in our pre-meetings is you're different than some of my other experiences in different California counties where the county is the uh, applicant you're structured differently. And just by what you said, uh, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, that it's because of the uh, influence of and the responsibility you placed on healthcare. Oh yeah. Uh, finally, uh, my last question is, uh, uh, Paul's on, I believe with us. And uh, from the health center uh, program, we look to have one employee that leads the project. Paul's the identified uh, project director for the health center program, as well as the CEO for the health and hospital systems. And uh, we look to see how the board exercises the responsibility over uh, the selection, if necessary, the removal, but. Uh, more importantly, the evaluations of your one employees representing healthcare and the uh, Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. The, there was, uh, for my review, the evaluation. Can you share again how uh, the Board of Supervisors are involved in uh, Paul's? Uh, evaluation, your CEO's evaluation, the project director for the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program as well. So Mr. your Mr. role Mr. in... Oh, go ahead. I, I thought you were finished, Mr. Rapp. Yeah, no, I, I think just trying to further define, I, I'm looking to understand how you contribute as a board of supervisors to the evaluation of your uh, CEO and and project director for the health center project. Sure, Supervisor Simidian, did I see your hand go up? Thank you, if you'd like, Mr. Chair, I, I don't wanna dominate the discussion, but it sounds like as committee chair, this is uh, my moment to share, yes? Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. I What I would uh, share with the folks who are uh, joining us today is, we as a, a five member governing body are all mindful of the fact that none of us none of us can give direction to county staff. So in a 20,000 person organization, uh, it's not only quote inappropriate, it's unlawful for any one of us to attempt to give uh, staff. And that includes our county uh, board appointed officials, the county executive, for example, because uh, the appointed officials work for our board uh, and Toto, not for any individual one of us. That said, uh, nothing precludes any of us 
from sharing concerns, raising questions uh, with uh, the various members of the staff, including Mr. Lorenz in this case to your question. And again, I can assure you uh, that uh, I don't quite have Mr. Lorenz on speed dial, but I might as well uh, because he and I are in very frequent touch on a range of issues, including uh, this set of issues. So if I have questions or concerns, my staff will reach out to him directly uh, and uh, or I will reach out with, uh, to him directly and or we will meet either in person or more recently by Zoom. Uh, but this is not a case where uh, the leader of the organization in this or the person with the responsibility, in this case, Mr. Lorenz, is, is uh, remote in any way, shape or form. Uh, we, uh, we talk to each other on a fairly regular basis. I would say further, and I'm going to ask Mr. Lorenz just to make sure. Mr. Lorenz, as I recall, you are a direct report to whom? Renee Santiago and then to Dr. Jeff Smith. Yes. Our Who's going to speak Mayor. next? And, and what I wanted to say for our visitors in, in response to the question is um, respecting the uh, fact that board members are not uh, empowered to give direction to other employees. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I have a call scheduled literally every month as the chair of the Health and Hospital Committee prior to our Health and Hospital meeting with Renee Santiago, who has the responsibility for the health and hospital system. And then in addition, folks, I meet, and I suspect other board members are in much the same position, I meet uh, pretty much once a week with our county executive, Dr. Jeff Smith, so that if there were questions or concerns uh, that uh, we had about the program vis-a-vis uh, -vis Mr. Lorenz's role, uh, we would do it uh, according to protocol, uh, which is to say, hey, Dr. Smith, what about this? What about that? Is this something you could work with Mr. Lorenz on? Uh, and in the highly technical parlance of county government, that is known in my office as the talk to Jeff list, because that's what I do. I talk to Jeff Smith. And then uh, he appropriately has those conversations and provides direction. Uh, and on a twice a month basis, I talk with our county council so that if there are any legal issues, uh, they can go on the talk to James list. Uh, that's a much less frequent uh, venue for conversation about this program because the legal issues haven't, haven't really sort of risen to the top. But I, I wanted you to know that Mr. Lorenz is both very accessible directly to us and certainly to me in my role as chair of health and hospital. And then if there uh, are follow-up issues uh, where uh, he says, really need to hear from the county executive on this, uh, that, that process is literally a weekly uh, opportunity uh, as well. Thank you. And Mr. Graff, if I may, I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Smith. He has his hand raised to speak. I think uh, Supervisor Wasserman, I think uh, Supervisor Ellenberg should go first and then I'll follow up. There you go, Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, <laughs> sure, that's fine. I suspect we were going to, to say the same thing. In addition to all of the informal uh, methods of providing feedback, Renee Santiago also um, uh, evaluates the uh, evaluates Mr. Lawrence and the program every year. That evaluation is submitted to the Board of Supervisors for our consideration, and, and that's another opportunity for us to um, ask questions or or dig a little bit further. There you go, Mr. Graff. Yes, oh, chair. Now back uh, to Dr. Smith. Supervisor Ellenberg is exactly correct. The board hears the evaluation of uh, Paul Lorenz as the director of the Valley Healthcare Homeless Program. And um, <clears throat> if there's disagreement with it or input that they want to make into it, they're free to do that. If it comes to a point where there is a fatal flaw in performance, um, the way they would communicate that would be to me during closed session as part of my evaluation, basically saying that I was doing a bad job supervising Paul and um, we would take appropriate action at that point. Luckily, we haven't gotten to that point, but I uh, wanna assure the auditors that uh, the board does have control of that issue and if they're in, unhappy with performance, they'll make that clear. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith. Supervisor Ellenberg, your hand your hand is down now. Dr. Smith, did I cut you off or did you have more to say? No. With regard to electronics. <laughs> Mr. Graf, you you you've heard about Paul Lorenz and yes. Denise Santiago and, and Dr. Smith. I've been here 11 years. Um, these are three of the finest, most caring, intelligent, professional transparent individuals um, that I've ever known. And I've been in government 20 years, supervised submitting, and I think it's got 30. Oh, I always miss that by a little bit, maybe it's 35. But um, the people running our healthcare program at Santa Clara County are phenomenal. And at the end of the day, they're all accountable. And I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. They are all accountable to the board of supervisors and actions of any significance go through the health and hospital system, and then ultimately come to the board for our public review um, of them. All right. Well, thank you, uh, you all very much for responding to my two question areas. I'm going to yield to my two consultant colleagues. Uh, and so we'll follow the same order we've been doing today. Uh, Carrie, do you have uh, any financial oversight uh, questions you would like to bring to the Board of Supervisors? Thank you, Scott, I'd like to do that. And just as Marion said, she'd like to speed talk. Uh, I will attempt to do that, but being from the South, that may just be physically impossible, I'm not sure. Um, a big part of the program is to obviously use data in making the decisions that you make. And I am curious to understand if you've been a part of any siting fee discount program evaluation in determining whether it is effective in reducing financial barriers to care for your homeless population? And if so, is there any data that you are receiving in making that determination? Thank you, Mr. Lorenz. So I, you know, I'll start off, but I, I believe um, some of the questions are, are coming to your board, but yes. as, as, you, as your board is aware, uh, we just presented our sliding fee schedule to um, in our last operations report um, yep. and it was one of the action items that your board took um, and in the operations report we did give some background on the basis for the sliding fee schedule um, as well as as we normally do uh, Mr. Count, count uh, data relative to the, the need to, to maintain that sliding fee schedule. Um, and that sliding fee schedule is part of our larger um, um, fee schedule that the board approves. So um, not only are is the homeless health care sliding fee schedule part of the homeless program approved by the board, uh, but all of our rates and fees as a health care system are approved by the, our county board of supervisors. Correct. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. And um, Carrie, I apologize. I didn't actually understand your question. I was I was uh, so I apologize for that. But one thing I, I just wanted to add to that is that um, we have a very big emphasis on having um, zero barriers to service. And so this is an area that um, the board actually took a very good look at, especially recently, and especially given our recent experience with COVID-19, like really trying to understand how um, both how to engage the public in a deeper way, create more trust, but also to, to, to create zero um, uh, barriers to service. So I really appreciate the question because we do spend some time thinking about fees because as a public hospital, as you know, we need to keep ourselves in business. And at the same time, we're, we're really providing um, charity care for those who have no resources. So it's a little bit complex in that I would say that we recognize, and I, and I would say it's also one of the benefits of having the board play a leadership role in this particular program, because it allows us to integrate more fulsomely all of our strategies and to test those strategies, not just program by program, but countywide and program by program. Two good points. Carrie, anything else? Um, and, and just to, to be more specific with the question, Supervisor Chavez, it's it's also we're looking at that data to to see if we can identify any disparities that are not being met was the question. So I, I maybe oh. didn't address it appropriately uh, in, in asking that and I apologize if I if I misworded that. 
The, uh, the next uh, thing is also going to be about data because I am uh, responsible for answering questions about the data that you receive. And I'm going to ask specifically, uh, do you receive any data about trends and patterns in patient populations and as they change over a period of time? And specifically, like one thing I would say is I noticed between your uh, 2019 reporting information and your 2020 reporting information, there was actually a sizable change in the gender of your patients. You had been a heavy male population and it went a lot heavier on the female population. So as you look at overseeing this program, I was just curious what type of data you're getting about uh, trends and patterns in patient populations. Thank you. Did that type of information, Sir Resumidian, go through Health and Hospital? Yes, and uh, I would say that, um, and I'm smiling a little bit here because I, I know Mr. Lorenz uh, has responded to um, repeated requests for data, more data, and then a little bit more data, and could you slice it for us this way? Uh, and Mr. Calhoun, I would tell you, for example, uh, given uh, your uh, organization's mission, at, at which uh, overlaps with ours, obviously, you know, just within the last month, for example, I was looking at the data uh, provided about um, the uh, percentage of folks in Santa Clara County who are insured, what the source of their insurance was, uh, the percent that were, had employer-based insurance, the number of folks who were on Medicare, the number of folks who were on Medi-Cal, the number of folks who were covered by our exchanges, uh, the number of folks who were subsidized on our exchanges, the number of folks who were uh, coming at us through our uh, Santa Clara Valley Health Plan, and the number who were uh, or are unfortunately uninsured, and then what programs do we have in place that nonetheless provide access to folks even though they are not insured? Uh, and you know, the, I, I'm sure you know, getting a, a hard, reliable number on who is still left out is sometimes tougher than uh, we think it should be. But you know, here in Santa Clara County, that number is below five percent now. That sounds like a pretty good number, but I am ever mindful of the fact that that's 100,000 folks in our county. So then we got to talk about, all right, how, what programs and services uh, do we provide? What programs of access do we provide? And all of that then informs the work of the county as well as the individual initiatives of uh, our, uh, our board members that we are then able to persuade our colleagues to support. So for example, we have something called the Better Health Pharmacy, which provides pharmaceutical drugs uh, literally free, free. So if folks show up and they have a prescription, uh, they need the, the support, they get it. If we have it, they get it. Uh, this happens to be a particular passion of mine, which is why I'm making you listen to it right now. Uh, similarly, we're in the midst of a, um, a second uh, effort on what was a pilot project to make sure that we have uh, both medical adherence and price supports for, or uh, cost reductions for what I call the, the life essential but high cost drugs. I'm thinking about things for anaphylactic shock, for example, uh, or a sim something as simple as an asthma inhaler, whereas you know, you know uh, these are literally life or death to the people who need them, but incredibly highly priced. All of that is a function, again, of the data provided uh, by the organization uh, and uh, we're, I think we're very mindful of the fact that as much as we wish we could do everything for everyone, we know we can't. And that means we've always got limited resources. And that means we've always got to be looking hard at the data to figure out how we can do the most with what we've got for the folks who need it the most. And uh, so it, you, please rest assured if, if data you want, data we got. That's for sure. And the data often drives our actions. As Supervisor Smidian said, we found where we didn't meet a certain population of whatever type, we increased our outreach specifically to that pipe, that population, where the data showed, you know, we might be underserving or could do more. And again, when you're dealing with Santa Clara County, two million people, the most, you know, north of LA, five percent, as Supervisor Smidian said, is a hundred thousand people, and that's about half of all of Santa Clara County. And it's about three times Calusa County. So Santa Clara County serves many, many, many people as best it can. But those numbers, Carrie, 
those numbers help us drive and see where we're doing a good job and where we can do better. Vice President. And, oh, Supervisor. And then, I, I apologize. I just uh, I I'm, I'm going to double dip on you here, Mr. Calhoun. I, I I should have mentioned as well because my colleagues all know we've we've also put great emphasis on. Uh, what we call health disparity assessments. Mm -hmm. And so historically, uh, we know that in a county as large and diverse as ours, where close to 40% of the population is foreign born and probably close to 70% of the population is in a household where at least one person is foreign born, that access and quality are disparate. Uh, no, no, and so we've done the health disparity studies not just sort of the Latino community or the African American and African ancestry community and the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, but we've even more recently, for example, done a study of disparities within the Asian American and Pacific Islander community because what we thought we knew and what was suddenly borne out by the data was that even within the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, there are great disparities between and among different subsets uh, of that community. So we are, as, uh, when I made a passing reference to slicing and dicing the data earlier, it really was with that kind of effort uh, in mind. And um, I apologize for uh, stepping in again. I'll get out of the way now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Sure, I want to share a couple of thoughts and example um, to the to the way that we, we use data. Um, is that we were we were getting reports from our, our VHHP backpack medicine uh, workers that they were encountering more pregnant women and infants. And this is a piece that led us uh, initially to the expansion of OBGYN services. And then um, taking that even a step further, noting that this is a particularly vulnerable group that needs housing, that needs a, a specific focus. And the fact that the, the is really such a key piece for us and really the very best opportunity to, to provide feedback to the board that comes directly from, uh, from the folks that they are engaging with. And uh, I suspect that all or most of my colleagues have, have done as I have, which is to take a trip out with the, the backpack medicine team uh, to go and, um, and experience that for ourselves as well. My team has also made an effort um, to visit the, the Alexian and the Monterey uh, Road Clinics and the mobile site at the Sunnyvale Shelter. The relationship that we have with our administration and staff is really such that we're able to see firsthand for ourselves the kind of work that, that they are doing. And then of course, make a point also as well of following up as individual board offices um, following the uh, receipt of the VHHP monthly written reports. I have a team member who is focused specifically on, on health issues and will follow up on a lot of the questions and issues that arise don't, during uh, those reports. So it, it is, I, I assume, clear to you now, by now, that this is an important focus of the board, that we are deeply engaged and we are mindful of um, of the need to continue to support them and to add resources and particular services as they as they identify those. Yep, number two. Gary, anything else? Carrie, I'm sorry, anything else? No, thank you very much. And uh, I guess my last uh, comment is maybe Supervisor Smithian's uh, request for more data will come along and that uh, packet, what, the board packet will be just a little bit longer for everyone to enjoy. Thank you there very you much for your time. No, it's um, not numbers carry, as you know, are important. You know, you you often learn things that aren't visible or obvious. And I think each of the supervisors that have spoken have said how those numbers, you know, have have enlightened us. And then we've directed resources and attention and personnel to that specific area to, to improve things. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, I echo my uh, fellow um, Supervisor's uh, observation on how uh, active we are regarding the outreaching to our homeless populations and how our VHHP team has been uh, working tirelessly to get our unhoused uh, residents uh, the need, for example, during COVID to getting the testing out there uh, early on and of course getting the vaccination. Uh, we've been focused quite a bit at first in terms of the granularity as to, hey, let's see if we get the Johnson Johnson vaccine since the one and done, right? 
we tried that, but of course it got stopped for a few weeks and got us kind of like, hey, even though stop doesn't mean we stop. So we get the two vaccine out there. But now, of course, uh, again, these are the, the way our vaccine uh, group in the backpack and all that working together. Uh, so I just wanted to state that uh, we've been very much uh, very proactive on, on making sure that our, our, our unhoused population is, is being vaccinated, is being taken care of. And along with the vaccination, we always use that as opportunity to also ask about other issues regarding housing and try to get them to the VI SPDET, uh, our, our own county's uh, uh, OSHR office support housing uh, metrics to, to try to get them housing. So it's all really a, a wraparound service that we provide and we're very proud of that work. I myself go out there and my team, uh, my district team, go out there usually once a month, if not even once every couple of weeks to various homeless camp and talk to their folks. And so far, I just I'll tell you that uh, they've been they've been uh, happy with what the county has been able to help them during the pandemic. So I just want to add those two cents of my observation. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Kerry, anything else? No, I've uh, overstayed my welcome. Thank you very much, <laughs> David. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Thank David. you. Yes. Thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Uh, again, I appreciate everyone's um, help and, and, and your uh, commitment to this program. Uh, it, it's very well seen how you guys are involved in the program. From the, from the clinical standpoint, understanding how COVID has impacted us, and, and, and I can say us, I'm the COO of an FQHC here in North Central Louisiana. Uh, I'm a nurse clinician practitioner by training and uh, serve as a COO. And of course, there was, a, there was this paradigm shift of how we took care of our population during COVID because we had, we had to change some things. So uh, it's, it's also been back to a, another paradigm shift from the standpoint of ensuring that we're providing good preventive care going back to our regular way, understanding that with telehealth and all of those things that came in play during the COVID time, there was just a shift of, of care that was being provided. So I'm, I'm interested from uh, perhaps, uh, again, uh, Commissioner Samidian's group as to how you guys are, are monitoring as it relates to quality of care, because I'm sure you're getting that type of information as well in the way of data, in the way of various clinical outcomes and what have you. But I would just like to hear you know, do you feel like you're getting good information, good enough information that you can ask the questions that you need to ask as it relates to the quality of care being provided to this population? Sure, and this answer could last for hours. I'm, I'm gonna, sure. I'm gonna turn to Supervisor Smidian, um, as you requested, David, and he's chair of Health and Hospital. The effort of Santa Clara County in this area has been nothing short of Herculean. The CEO has plucked people from every department to outreach and serve this community, both when the pandemic started, during the pandemic, and now as things are, in, are improving. And I'll leave the rest to Supervisor Samidian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adams. I, I got the subtle hint from my chair that I should be tight with my comments, so I will try. Uh, and here's what, I would, here's what I would tell you. For many years, prior to the pandemic. We have focused on uh, the triple aim and the triple aim plus. I know these terms are familiar to you. And I know that you know that patient experience is part of the triple aim and the triple aim plus. So we are um, focused on that patient experience, but we're also focused on the other elements of the triple aim, which are uh, of course uh, the cost for service to make sure we're using our funds effectively and most critically, because I saved the one that to me is most important for the triple aim uh, till the last, uh, patient outcomes. And obviously we can't have those conversations if we're not getting the data about patient outcomes. And we have those in, in great detail uh, at the full board. The second thing I would say to you is, I think we are um, smart about in the county about understanding that as much as we do, we have to do it in concert with our other healthcare partners. So those could be community clinics, and as an FQHC, you know what I'm talking about. It uh, could be the community clinics, or it could be with our larger partners in the private sector, uh, nonprofit sector, uh, the Sutters, the Kaisers, the Stanford Healthcares, uh, who are out there as well. 
my colleagues never tire of hearing me complain about the fact that mine is the only supervisorial district that does not have a community clinic that is a county clinic. And I'm uh, taking this opportunity to raise that with them one more time and you can see them sure. smile tight, tightly. Uh, but my point is, so that means then that we have to step up our effort to use those community clinics as partners and we do. So I am literally on the other side of the wall from the Ravenswood Community Health Center in our North County Courthouse here in Palo Alto, California. They are essential in getting this work done because uh, we know that we don't have the community clinics that are county clinics here in my district for reasons that I understand and that are largely historic. Uh, but we use those community clinics. To Mr. Calhoun's earlier comment about gender, it's why I have been pushing, and thank you again, Mr. Lorenz, to uh, have county services literally on the same site co-located with Planned Parenthood in Mountain View, California, just across the city limit line from here. Uh, because again, we know that Planned Parenthood as a community clinic and as a partner can help fill the gaps. Uh, and that if we're smart about this, they can provide a set of services, but we can provide services that are complementary to, not competitive with, and again, meet the, but again, we need the data to your point, to Mr. Calhoun's point, to tell us, all right, who's getting the service, who's not, uh, and what can we do uh, in the way of partnerships to make that happen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Thank Adams, you. any follow-up? I don't think so, Supervisor Wasserman. Uh, I greatly appreciate, I know you guys are busy, and um, I'll get out of the way, and I'll yield back to the, the chairman, uh, Mr. Graff, again, thank you so much. Mr. Adams, you're welcome. And again, whatever questions you have, we're all here for it. Um, my, my job and comments earlier is always to keep a meeting moving. Um, we have 185 items, but it, that's today, today. Um, but at the end of the day, this is more than half of what we do where we devote our resources. I have my one aid I have is a health and hospital aid, and the rest all have multiple responsibilities. But the one aid is health and hospital because that's what Santa Clara County is and does, and the people count on us for. You know, the state does their thing, the Fed does their thing. This is the county's responsibility. We all take it very seriously. It's a priority, and we're not giving you the bum rush by any accounts. So and whatever no. time you need, we will take. I greatly appreciate that. You know, really from the standpoint of the FQHC, the most important, the most important piece that the board plays from my standpoint is is from, from the clinical standpoint is the oversight of quality. Yep. And and so you you've answered that quite well. And uh, it's not to say that uh, the finances are a very important piece of it. If you know, no margin, no mission, you've got to have it. But from the quality standpoint. You definitely, um, you definitely have answered my question as it relates to that. So thank you very much. Thank you. We, we take our oversight very seriously and, and yes, it does come to us for approval. Thank you. Mr. Graff. Yes, uh, so uh, Supervisor Wasserman and the other board members, thanks for indulging us and giving us as, us as much time as you have today. I think that concludes uh, our questions, I know, you, as you said, you have a big agenda. Uh, we, we just started our work and we, our agenda starts at the top of the hour as well. So I think for our mutual benefit, we'll, uh, we'll conclude our time with you. Thanks very much for give, giving us this opportunity. And any questions for for us as the team or uh, for Marion as your federal representative before we leave the meeting. Thank you, I'll look to my board for any questions for the representatives we have here today. And I think you've satisfied everyone and it sounds like we've satisfied you. Whenever you wish to be agendized, please contact me, we'll put you on the agenda and we'll be happy to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much as well. Um, the action we had was to receive the report from the Health Resource Service Administration, which we did, and then to approve the operational report 
from the HRSA project director. And that I need an action, a motion for to take that action. So moved. Motion Second. by Supervisor Lee, seconded by Supervisor Ellenberg. We have no members of the public in the queue as I see Jess. So if you'll call a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. If you'll unmute. Thank you, Jess. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you very much. That passes unanimously. And board members, unless you disagree, we're going to take a break here at 1245 and we are going to adjourn at 115 when we will start with item 13, which is our um, COVID report that we receive each time. All right, we good with that? All right, have a good lunch. I'll see you in 30. Recording stopped.
Terry Freitas, if you are at your computer, I see you have a hand up. Can I help you with anything? Yes. Oh, apologies, Supervisor Smitty, and I just muted you. No worries. Could I ask you a quick question as long as you're helping out? Please. Uh, I just wanted to make sure <clears throat> that I know what our order of business is again and what is and isn't on the consent calendar. So I know when we come back, we're going to go to item 13, which is the COVID report. And then could you walk me through what is or isn't on consent from 14 forward, please? Um, can I give you just a list of regular agenda items to take that we have left? Yes, thank you. That'd be great. Sure. So we'll start with 13, then we have 14, 16, 19, Hang on, 20, Jess. oh, pardon. 16, 19, 20, okay. Sorry, it was 21. Order. I'm sorry, so, what, so 20 is not on the list. Right. So we go 16, 19, 21? Yes, then 22, 23. Got it. Then 28, 29, 30. Okie doke, keep going. 31, 32, 33. Okay. 34, 39. Gotcha. And then we have still that's pulled. That's good. Okay. That's, good. That's, I, that's all I needed. Thank you. Sorry to intrude on your very brief break, but that, that helps me get squared away here. Much appreciated. Not a problem. Thanks. Looks like we solved Harry's problem too, whatever that was. Hi, Jess. This is uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, I heard 16 is is not on consent now, correct? Was it? Sorry. I tried to put consent uh, earlier, but did it get pulled yes. back? Up? There were requests from, I believe, Chavez and Submitian to keep 16 on the regular agenda. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to no confirm. Right. Thanks so much. There we are. Jess, can you hear me? I can. Yep, we can hear you, Jeff. Not anymore, though. Did you have anything? No, I was just testing. Oh, OK. Yeah, your microphone sounds great. OK, thanks. So Jeff, I don't think I've uh, I've mentioned to you we're moving in 30 days on uh, July 21st. 
we're moving after having been here for 37 years. So just, yeah, no. just uh, a door or two away. But uh, holy mackerel, cleaning and moving a house after 37 years of uh, saving everything and kids stuff and attic and basement and it, oh is, my gosh. it is an <laughs> unbelievable. We've, we've rented multiple storage units to put stuff in. We've three times had that, that company where either you point at it, got junk or whatever come. Kim has donated 20 some hefty bags to Goodwill. 200, 200 books to the library. It's, we put beds and, and dressers and armoires out on the street with sign free file cabinets, coffee tables, and they're all gone the same day being repurposed by other families. For two doors, Mike? Yeah, we're, we're building next door to us. So we're literally moving six inches, the width of the fence. <laughs> but but that won't be ready till next June. Oh. And so we're moving into the house next door to our house. So we're literally moving 50 feet, six inches. And um, we move on July 21st. And there's, there's, it's, there's seven contractors here right now doing electrical window pane, clouded window pane replacement, carpentry, um, and they, they come in mass on, on Monday after my son gets married on Friday. <laughs> Would you like me to start the recording? Yes, please. Recording in progress. Thank you. Thank you. And just, just so we establish the presence of a quorum, I know everybody's here, but if you'll please take a roll call vote. Supervisor a roll call, Lee. not a vote, just a roll call. Present. Oh. Thank you. Supervisor Travis. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. President Wasserman. I'm here too. Thank you very much, Jess. And we're going to go with item 13, which is to receive a report. And we all, we always open up this part of the meeting with the fabulous Dr. Cody. Big build up, Dr. C. <laughs> All right, I'll take any doctor. Yeah, actually, Dr. Cody is not available today, so we're going to start off with Dr. Finstersheim. Wonderful. Dr. Marty, take it away. Okay, thank you. Hey, short timer. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll start with Dr. Cody's slides, and the first slide is the case reports again. And Marty, could you move, perhaps move a little bit closer to your microphone? Yeah, we have the microphone in the middle of the how is this it's it's better everybody else better? okay Suraj Chavez can you hear him okay yep all right go ahead then I mean I can move around on the other table if you want but let me move this. okay now I'm really close okay so this is the um again the case report as it is on our dashboard and of course you can see the downward trend that we have uh, been seeing for the last several weeks, which is really good. We are now at a seven day average of 27 cases. Um, so that's really, really good. Um, and we are, just to mention, since we're talking about cases, um, that we are seeing variants in our county. Um, we have our dashboard up. And if you look at that, you can see what we have already identified, realizing also that there is a delay from the initial test. Uh, someone testing positive until we get the sequencing. So again, uh, there is a delay in those numbers. Um, but uh, but the, the important point is that the current vaccines are still effective against all of the variants um, and that data from the United Kingdom um, that really is showing that the Delta uh, variant, was, which was first recognized, as you know, from India, um, is more likely to cause hospitalizations than the other variants. So really, again, very important why we need to get people vaccinated. It's also very important to know from their research that um, you need both doses um, of the vaccine in order to be fully protected. Um, single doses against that variant were not very effective. Next slide. So this is the... Um, 
the death report also, which appears on the dashboard. And you can see again, which is really good that the numbers um, of uh, people dying from COVID really have dropped off tremendously. And if we look at the last two week period, there were 11 deaths um, in a two week period, specifically between May 31st and uh, June 13th. So that is uh, down 67% compared to mid to late May. So again, really, really important information to know regarding uh, the deaths in our county and how, of course, vaccines have made a big difference. All right, so now we're going to move to my usual part of the presentation. And um, as far as the vaccine overview, again, vaccines remain really plentiful. Uh, we're just utilizing our inventory on hand, both from the hospital system and the health department. We, our supply is uh, just about 250,000 doses of vaccine on hand, and 25,000 of those are J and J. And as you know, the J and J vaccines um, expiration date has been extended until August 7th, so we didn't lose those uh, vaccines. However, the demand again for the vaccine has been slower, and um, we've been required then to really focus more on our outreach and messaging into the communities of take vaccines to the communities in need. We're also, again, pivoting, uh, moving away from our larger vaccine sites, our mega sites, to onboarding private providers and um, retail pharmacies. I'll talk more about that in a bit. Next slide. This is our great dashboard view of where we are right now with our vaccinations. And, um, you know, drum roll, we have hit 80% of uh, those over 12 years of age having at least one dose. So that's really admirable, it's amazing. And I'm really pleased with that. Um, at our last report to the board on the state, we were at 77.6% for your reference. Um, to reach our 85% goal though, of at least one dose, we're gonna need to um, vaccinate another 85,000 plus people. And um, just doing a little back of the napkin, math, um, we're seeing about 2,000 first doses uh, daily in our in our county. And at that average, we could reach our 85% first dose uh, by the end of July. So we're hopeful for that. Uh, but you can see the drop off. And um, again, that's why it's been just uh, more difficult again to get those last few percentages of vaccine um, within our county. So next slide is the um, same picture, but it's looking more of the demographic, uh, gender and age. And if you look at the age groups, again, the youngest, um, the youngest among us have the lowest vaccination numbers. Of course, they've been eligible for the least amount of time, uh, especially again in the 12 to 17 year uh, age group, as well as the 18 to 20, 29. And I would note, note that the that females have a 4% lead over males in their uh, vaccination success. Next slide. So again, I've showed this before, but this map of California, and this is showing fully vaccinated um, counties and the darker colors, obviously the darker greens show the uh, highest percentages of fully vaccinated. And there um, have been a, a couple of additional counties added since we look, last looked. Uh, but again, the Bay Area has a very high complete vaccination rate. Ours is over 71%. And um, we are paying attention to some of the national data, looking on CDC data website. Even today, Santa Clara County is at uh, is the 17th highest among all 3,000 counties of any size, very small counties to, to us. We're the largest county in that first group, and we are actually number one. Um, for large counties over 1.5 million having fully vaccination uh, rates of um, over 71% for so That's a great accomplishment for everybody. Next slide. Again, just looking at the vaccination among county residents, but this is again a specific breakdown of age and the demographics. And you can see the first um, 12 and older that we are at the 80%. But if you look at the demographics, as we have seen all along, uh, there are continued disparities um, amongst our, um, our racial and ethnic populations, um, but they are 
you know, they are coming together. They are moving up through all of the effort that people have made. Um, again, if you look at the 12 to 15 years of age, that's our lowest group kind of holding us back a bit, uh, but nearly 50%. And if you add the 12 to 17 year old group in there, we're at 56%. So I think um, with the effort that we're doing on outreach um, and with schools, as we'll talk about in a bit, we are we are getting uh, getting those those population, those teenagers vaccinated. And then looking down at the 50 plus, um, really amazing at 80, nearly 83%. And let's move on. And this is just, again, a, another picture of that same, but with a trend showing the uh, increasing numbers of vaccinations by the racial and ethnic group. And um, the Asian population, again, has been outpacing um, on a regular, since the beginning. Um, but all of the other populations, all the other ethnic and racial groups are pretty much um, huddled together there. Uh, and so not a lot of gaps in our ability to reach all of the populations within and we'll move on to the next slide. And this is again, uh, a look at the providers by the week um, and who's, who's actually providing vaccine. So you can see on this slide um, that the numbers of course have dropped as we know, um, but if you, if you kind of look to see who's doing most of the vaccinations, the, the salmon color um, really is, is amazing. Um, that's the retail pharmacies. And so they picked up the slack but that's what we expect, that's what we want to happen, that those pharmacies along with other private providers that we are beginning to onboard. And um, in that regard, we have onboarded 35 new providers um, that are again, small practices and some independent like mom pop pharmacies that are single pharmacies that are also in neighborhoods that we are onboarding. Um, we have um, an additional 58 that we are just, that have been approved and that uh, we will be giving getting a vaccine distributed, redistributed to them, and an amazing 175 uh, pending approvals that we have to work to get them finalized. And um, that's in addition to that, that doesn't count the 170 plus pharmacy, retail pharmacies in the community. So there are plenty of places as we begin to pull back um, on our mega sites, um, there are plenty of places for people to be vaccinated. And the next slide, um, again, this would usually be, um, Brian doing or Rocio, but um, I'm just going to provide you with the update. Again, we are still in communities. We have uh, more than 100 community health workers doing vaccine outreach in the high need areas. And uh, Brian just mentioned to me earlier that we have reached the 100,000 people mark of people that we have actually talked to, knocking on doors and talking to people, 100,000 people that have been reached. Um, lots of work with the mobile unit going out to school events and trying to reach again those youth working with the county office and going actually to schools and providing vaccine to them. So that will continue. Um, again, to reach the youth, uh, we have concert and sports raffles going on. And I think tomorrow we will announce the first winners of the Bad Bunny tickets. Um, and so I, hopefully we have reached, I, don't, I haven't gotten any sense of how well those are doing, but uh, perhaps Brian can get that information to us later. And then we are doing a late night clinic in downtown San Jose, um, which um, the mobile team is going to be at uh, San Pedro Square on Thursday night. And um, we will be offering some incentive um, diner discount cards for some food at St. Pedro Square to those who haven't been vaccinated. We're trying to again reach, reach the young adults. I will be there um, to help out. Um, we are continuing also to offer worksite clinics, um, especially to uh, construction sites, again, going where, where the people are that have perhaps not been vaccinated. The state also came up with this partnership with uh, McDonald's and identified a number of sites around the state. We have two sites in our county um, where we will be out providing vaccinations in partnership with the state and Amazon. So I think that's the end of my slides, but I wanted to just take um, the personal opportunity to thank everyone as we give these, these um, updates to you all the time. Um, there are a lot of people behind the scenes um, that have been working very, very hard. It, as we say, it takes a team or a village the county health system testing unit um, with a multitude of people under the direction of Dr. Jennifer Tong, 
has just been outstanding, um, hats off many times for their ability to provide the testing and the vaccinations by the, by the team. The pharmacy team at all the sites that prepares the vaccine, our mobile vaccination team that's out there um, all the time in the community, our outreach and community teams, um, the data, the people that bring you all of the information on all of this on our dashboard, our stakeholder community group that has been meeting for months, um, the provider task force, again, meeting since November, um, all of the community clinics that have been working so hard, and um, all of the family within the county system, the county council office, public health, labor relations, and all the other too numerous to mention, and then support from the board. Thank you very much for the, for, for the support of the board and the leadership from Dr. Smith. All right, Dr. Marty. Oh, I have one more slide, one more slide for testing. Um, All right. Again, this is just, um, it's, it's what we've shown before. We're still doing plenty of testing. We're cutting back a little bit. There will be plenty available. And the thing to, re again, to mention on this slide mainly is that our positivity rate is, is at 0.4%. So again, a great milestone for all of us. Thank you. And members of the board right. and the public, I want to. Oh, Dr. Smith, go ahead. I want to make sure you know that uh, this is the uh, last uh, COVID report that Marty will be attending. Um, That's what I was just going to talk about, Dr. Smith. Oh, okay, well then go ahead. I just didn't want thank people you. to forget. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'm I'm proud to serve with Dr. Smith twice. Dr. Smith, Dr. Marty Fensterscheid twice. When I first got here, heard all about him, was impressed. Fabulous, fabulous man, person, doctor. And uh, then we pandemic came along and Dr. Cody reached out to the right person and Dr. Marty graciously came back, disrupted his life that he had created since retiring, came back here and spent 15 months on the front lines, being the fabulous, fantastic doctor, human being person that uh, I've known him to be. He is as gracious and humble as any person. It might be more than any person I know. Um, and, Dr. Marty, I just want to thank you from me personally and president of the board. And um, I'm sure a few of the others have something to say about you that have had the opportunity to serve with you as well. Um, you're coming in and Dr. Tong and Dr. Cody and everybody else and all the people you listed just formed an incredible army against this invisible menace. And uh, we're coming out of it. And the economy's coming back and it's a huge thanks to you and all the people that you motivated, Marty, all the people that you influenced, all the people that you helped to guide. Um, I know you won't take any of this credit for, for you, but uh, we couldn't have done it without you and we're better because of you and thank you. And any other supervisors that wanna chime in anything? As Dr. Smith was saying, this is Dr. Marty's final presentation to us. Vice President Ellenberg, I saw your hand up earlier, and I just took the president's prerogative and I cut in front of you. Go ahead. Good for you, and I am happy to add in the in the praise heaping because Dr. Fensterscheid has really done remarkable work, serving initially as the lead for scaling up testing and then vaccination efforts over the past year, and I pause to think this morning about where we were a year ago. In June 2020, we were just beginning to reach our local goal for daily testing. And since then, we have maintained one of the most robusting, robust testing efforts in the state. And as you just highlighted, Santa Clara County has the highest vaccination rate of any large county in the U.S., representing an enormous lift from all of our many, many county responders. Dr. Marty, you're coming out, coming out of retirement to take on these daunting tasks after having retired in 2013 with 29 years of service to the county, serving as a physician on the front lines uh, in treating HIV and as health officer during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. It is just remarkable and to all of our great fortune that you answered the call to step up again to serve the residents of Santa Clara County and bring your expertise and your relentless effort and your good humor to such a critical role in this response. I wanna thank you 
for your service to our county, and I wish you every happiness as you resume your retirement. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, Supervisor Chavez. Uh, thank you. I, I too want to share my appreciation, and I, I really appreciate um, Dr. Fenstersheib, the approach that you've taken to listening to the community in a really deep way. And, you know, I appreciate to your point that, you know, there's Dr. Kamal, Dr. Tong, Dr. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Cody, Dr. Luna, we've got a lot of doctors around here, Dr. Smith and- And attorneys. Yeah. And James, I was gonna say James and, um, and Greta and Hillary and Brian and Betty, and you know, just a really a deep well of leadership. But I will say that what, one of the things that I know but uh, that I really, oh, um, and I'm also thinking of Dr. Uh, who's, uh, who's our doctor who led the, um, who's leading contact tracing, Sarah? Redmond. Thank you. Redmond. Dr. Redmond. I mean, just a, a really amazing array of, of folks. And what I think is so was so critical is that at very, very dark times when people were really upset and scared, um, Dr. Marty, I, I think that one of your great gifts to us was just modeling calm, calm uh, leadership and just a real ear to be inclusive and to help people not just feel like they were being heard, but letting them see the fruits of their labor and the way you provided um, leadership to the county. So thank you very much for coming off the bench. And I also just want to acknowledge Dr. Cody, who I know isn't here, but you know, often it's so easy to let egos get in the way. And um, you know, people were just really able to put that aside and 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 serve and save lives. So thank you. Thank you. All right, we don't have- And uh, I just want to say one oh, last thing, uh, uh, President Supervisor Watson. Supervisor Lee, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, Dr. Fenstersheib or Dr. Marty, uh, first of all, I just want to ask for your apology for having mispronounced your name for many, many months. And I think finally, I, I finally think I got it and we're gonna lose you. First of all, thank how, you How so tough is for... Marty, Supervisor Lee? <laughs> exactly, Marty is much easier. Yeah. But first of all, I'd say thank you so much for coming out of retirement. Uh, that is truly uh, uh, something that is so selfless what you did in the very momentous time of the history of our county's public health. Uh, and your effort clearly has saved literally thousands of lives. And I just want to put that on the record of, of your dedication back to our county is so, uh, so, so much, much appreciated. Uh, and, and one thing I would say is we, I'm, I'm certainly very sad to see you going, but I guess that's also the good news showing that our numbers of, of, of cases are dropping to the point that is uh, to a manageable level. Now that EOC, you know, is now no, no longer doing the 24 seven like we used to. Uh, so really, really thank you for all your great work and wishing you the, the, the best of the rest of your retirement times. Uh, and as much as I want to see you come back and say hello to us, don't be a stranger, but I don't hope we have to have you call you back because Delta have gone crazy on us. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. That Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you. And I just uh, want to associate myself with the remarks of my four colleagues, Marty. But more than that, what I want to say is, um, apart from the challenges of the pandemic, we are challenged right now in this country by the deep divide between those who believe that government can be a force for good and those who do not. And when I look at Marty Fenstershive, what I see is the face of public service. And I th think for anyone who wonders whether the notion of public service has come and gone as an American value, I would just ask them to take a look at Marty because what I see in him is someone who is the, the personification of public service in a way that I think really should give um, courage and strength to any who doubt that we still have it in us as a nation. So thank you for that, Marty, in addition to all of the tangible work you've done to help get us to a better place over the last year and a half. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We, pra we practically have him on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> all right. That's where he deserves to be. Yeah, I, I know. I know. He's a fantastic human being. He's probably blushing. All right, sir. Yeah, he is blushing. All right.
Thank you, Marty. I hope our paths cross somewhere. Take care. All the best. Thank you so much. You bet. All right. We were just to receive the report. We have no member. Supervisor Smitty, and your hand is still up. Did you have a further comment? I do not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, you got it. We now move on to item 14. Um, oops, I bet not. Let me see my clock here. It's 140. We're not doing 14 right now. Mike? I, yes. There's still a, a there's still more of this presentation. There, there's th two more parts. On item 13? Yeah, yeah we only did the first part. There's okay. a health order and then there's the the um the, the evaluate, I'm sorry, the research uh, component, the public policy, I mean, the public uh, opinion polling. Supervisor Rossman, I just have one quick slide on, uh, on regarding yesterday's announcement with respect to the health order. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, the uh, Dr. Cody yesterday announced the issuance of a new order that phases out the May 18th health order. This is in light of the state's new regulations that took effect last week, in particular, the Cal OSHA emergency regulations related to COVID-19. Those regulations require employers to uh, have documented whether employees are fully vaccinated in order for those employees to uh, be able to take advantage of the uh, different safety rules in place for fully vaccinated employees, such as uh, no longer needing to wear face coverings indoors. Uh, as well as quarantine requirements and the like. Uh, yesterday's order sunsets that ascertainment requirement from the May 18th order. Once uh, employers have completed two rounds of ascertainment, uh, if they were on schedule from the May 18th order, that should have already been completed. There are therefore no other community-wide local health orders in effect, just the state rules. Uh, and just as a reminder regarding face coverings, uh, for those who are not fully vaccinated, uh, the state's uh, uh, rules still do provide for use of face coverings. And then there are certain specific settings, several of which are settings operated by the county itself, uh, where everyone, regardless of vaccination status, does still need to wear face coverings. And those are listed at the bottom of the slide here. Um, happy to answer questions, but otherwise we'll keep that update brief. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Supervisors, any questions? Nope, seeing none there. Thank you, James. And I think we now move to the EMC presentation. Yep. Mike? I yes, do have, Supervisor I have, Yeah, I do have one question. I, I just wanted to make sure I that I um, heard this. And that was uh, in um, Dr. Fenstersheim's report. He was saying that if you had one vaccine uh, dose that that the emerging variants are are very they're very powerful against that single dose. Were you speaking specifically of a, a particular variant, Dr. Fenstersheim? Yeah, yes, I was. It was the re some research that came out of the UK, and it had to do with the Delta variant, which is the variant that was identified in India recently. Thank you. And then the second question that that um, I just want to make sure I, I understand better is that we had set a countywide goal of 85% vaccination. And I, I, when I say we, I think Dr. Marty, this was your goal. And I'm wondering if that's still the county's um, North Star that we're trying to get to 85% of everybody being vaccinated. Doctor? Again, yeah, I think it was my my goal, but in talking with Dr. Cody and Dr. Smith and others, um, it's a good place to be. If you remember, Dr. Fauci originally said we really don't know where herd immunity needs to be, 70, somewhere between 70 and 85 percent. So we've done so well here, you know, it's like I think getting to that 85 percent goal is something that's within reach. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. Um, President Wasserman, um, the, the chart has certainly shown that uh, the highest uh, percentage, uh, excuse my French, uh, this, uh, excuse me, the lowest percentage of those who have been vaccinated right now appears to be uh, those uh, 12 uh, years old and up, the young, the young ones, the young people, uh, especially of the Latino and the African-American uh, descent uh, based on those uh, um, 
graphics that we've seen. Uh, so one of the things in terms of outreaching to young people certainly is the the, the TV channels. I just want to ask to see uh, what specifically which have we done? Do we send those to? Uh, I know we talked about the sports channels uh, advertising for a certain group previously. Uh, do we advertise those to any of the like children channel like on Nickelodeon? Would that be too young uh, or, or too young for the twelve year old and up group? And uh, what what's the strategy we also do and try to outreach to the younger? Um, uh, uh, youngsters, shall we say. Hi, Supervisor. This is Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't have the exact TV channels that we've been advertising to. We can uh, check in with our PIO team and um, can get back to you on, on the details of, of channels. But in terms of just general outreach to that young population, particularly the uh, Latino population, uh, a big part of our strategy continues to be hosting uh, pop-up vaccination clinics in partnership with the schools. And we've really tried to focus um, in the parts of the community that have high, um, uh, high, a high share of uh, Latino students. And so we've, uh, I know we've done well over 30 events at schools at this point, and we have a number of events. I think Marty's slide highlighted some of the, um, just this week, the events coming up at schools. But uh, So that's really a continuing big part of the outreach. And, and um, just want, you know, in, in defense of the 12, 12 and up, they've, they've of course been um, eligible for the least amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but we, so the school strategy, and then also we've really been trying to do some other kinds of um, more focused outreach for our uh, Latinx youth. So we've done some vaccine events uh, in partnership with the San Jose Earthquakes. We have the raffle that, um, you know, actually uh, some of the musical acts that we've, we've um, gotten the tickets for were really aimed at uh, younger residents, particularly young uh, Latino residents, uh, Bad Bunny comes to mind. Uh, and then, uh, but we'll get back to you on the exact channels that we've we've because there's been a lot of paid media um, that has been done. And we certainly have access to say Instagram as well, right? For the social media side of the the outreach for. Absolutely yes, so, so the social media side of things is that is a big part of our push. And, and today, I think. Um, I think Marty mentioned, yeah, the raffle will be on Instagram Live today announcing those, uh, those or I'm sorry, not today, tomorrow at two o'clock on Instagram Live. But so, yeah, social media is a big part of our push as well. And we've really been trying to um, connect through the um, ambassador program, too, that uh, Supervisor Chavez leads with, with youth ambassadors and trying to work through some other kind of youth leadership through the schools to, to try to push out, not just from our social media accounts, but from the youth themselves. Right. As you know, school is about out now. Most of the schools are already out uh, for the summer. So I, I would imagine reaching out to schools to try to get the students will be a little bit harder these days. So I just want to make sure that we are not uh, losing momentum of getting the word out to the to the parents and the kids. Great. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. And you're right. Schools, schools are out. Um, it is what we've seen is that at least the schools do have some pretty good lists. Um, contact, uh, you know, able to, a lot of the districts are able to, to contact the parents pretty, pretty well. Um, and that's kind of why we wanted, and people do go on vacation though. So we've been trying to, um, you know, keep our mobile vax team in place so that they can, if you can't make it to one event, then maybe you can make it to the, the following weeks. Exactly. Event. Right. Yeah. Make it very accessible. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. All right, let's move on to the next part about the EMC presentation, if there's no other questions from supervisors. All right. James, who's leading this next part? No, uh, Martha okay. and uh, Ruth are doing this part. You got it, thank you. Correct, let, let me introduce Jessica Hi, Polsky Sanchez and Riley Jones from EMC. They'll be projecting their screen today. All righty. All right, Jessica, we're, Jessica, we're not able to hear you. Looks like you're muted. Nope. 
Um, this is Riley from EMC. Let me ping just real fast. If not, I will take over for her. Sure. This is Riley from EMC. Thank you. Martha, do you have anything more to add at this time till we get the others back? I think what I'd add at this point is we had brought um, a survey back to the board last time we met, and we wanted to wait to do this qualitative research with the focus groups until we had a little more experience with vac vaccines with the, the hesitant uh, group. And so what you're seeing here is not a, a survey that you've normally seen, but this is more of a uh, fo uh, focus groups for those vaccine hesitant individuals to see what what messaging might be able to be more effective with that group. Thanks, Martha. Um, this is Riley. Um, Jess has been having some technical issues with her internet, so I'll just go ahead and start talking for her. And if thank you, Riley. Go right on and we'll take over. Sorry about that. The Super. Joy of technology. Um, so as Martha kind of teed us up. Um, we did a series of qualitative research with some of the vaccine hesitancy groups that um, you all identified. Um, so we were conducting this research the week of June 7th. We did several focus groups. Um, we did one focus group of parents that had unvaccinated um, 12 to 17 year olds. Um, we screened those parents to, about their attitudes about getting their children vaccinated, taking people who were kind of wary, so nobody who outright rejected it and nobody who was super excited to get their kids vaccinated. So trying to get the, the parents who had concerns. We also talked to a couple of different populations of unvaccinated men. Um, we did one group um, of middle-aged, so that's anyone aged 50 to 64, uh, Caucasian men. We had a group of seven men. And that group, we also made sure that if they were unvaccinated and not planning to get vaccinated. Um, we had another group in English of young, so that would be 18 to 29 Latino men. We had eight participants. Again, they were unvaccinated and not planning to get vaccinated. Um, and then in Spanish, we did um, five individual interviews, um, again, with young men, 18 to 29, um, that were unvaccinated and not planning to get through. So um, kind of our first takeaway, um, I'll talk through the key findings from the focus group with parents of the vaccine eligible, but unvaccinated children. Um, I do want to note that these parents were screened. Um, to be those that are at least somewhat concerned about COVID vaccines for their children, um, as we wanted to explore what is kind of driving their hesitation. Um, we should also kind of note that when we were doing these groups, the vaccines had become, um, we were thinking about the context we heard, um, children of this age had been eligible to get vaccinated for less than two months. Thinking back about um, on some of the research we've done um, on vaccine hesitancy generally earlier in the pandemic, we saw initially pretty high levels of um, hesitancy that decreased as people were able to um, kind of see time pass. Um, we don't have necessarily any solid data to back this up, but we would expect kind of a similar attitude here. These parents have had access to the vaccine for a short amount of time, so they, a lot of the wariness is just how new they were. So starting with the parents, our first key finding is we want to point out the parents we talked to were not anti-vaccine. In fact, most were vaccinated themselves. These parents simply had concerns about the vaccines for their children. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I got a little uh, dry throat. Um, so to sum up their concerns, one parent said, it's just not enough data. I think for the young body that's already healthy, pointing out to these parents, um, these, they want more time to pass to have more data. Um, so they know how these vaccines will impact young children. They just don't feel like there's enough information. On the next slide, um, we see concerns for their children are focusing on the unknown long-term impacts of the vaccines. Um, they take seriously this decision um, and they're thinking about the impact it could have on their children for the rest of their lives. So less concern maybe about the short-term impact. Um, severe side effects is really about kind of the drastic long-term potential um, that could include anything some of these parents mentioned fertility um, or permanent gen genetic harm. Um, 
again, these parents are pointing to the fact that these vaccines hadn't been used long enough on their children for them to feel comfortable that these things wouldn't happen. So on to the third finding. Um, it was interesting to hear from this group of parents the extent to which their children's autonomy and preference factored into their decision about whether or not their children would get vaccinated. Um, while their children's preference about getting vaccin vaccinated factors in heavily, some parents said they would likely encourage their children to get vaccinated eventually. Um, other parents in that group said they would wait and see if it becomes a requirement for school or other activities. Um, on the uh, finding on slide four, um, kind of related to this, we heard from many of these parents that they expect vaccination will be required for their children for school or to participate in sports and other extracurriculars. So along those lines, thinking about the possibility that their children might be excluded from some of these activities, um, this could serve as a motivator to allow or encourage their children to get vaccinated. Certainly, we've seen throughout the pandemic, the impact of isolation has been particularly challenging on this age group. Parents are very aware of that and they want their children to kind of get back to normal, get back to socializing with their, their kids, even if it, that means setting aside some of their concerns about the vaccine. On slide five, the fifth finding here. Um, so as you might expect, these parents are aware that children and young people are at a lower risk for, sev for severe illness from COVID. They know that there are some cases where there have been kids that got seriously sick, but they think overall, um, most kids kind of sail through COVID okay. And so this factors into their lack of urgency about getting their children vaccinated. And if you combine their fears around vaccines with their lack of fear about the disease itself, that's why you can see these parents um, are kind of conflicted and haven't necessarily gotten their children vaccinated yet. On the sixth finding, uh, some of the parents we talked to are aware that, that children can spread COVID even if they're asymptomatic or don't get very sick themselves. However, the fact that children need to be inoculated in order for the community to reach herd immunity or the idea of vaccinating adolescents in order to reduce risks for those who are vulnerable doesn't really seem to be present in their decision-making processes. Rather, these parents are kind of focusing on, you know, how will this choice impact their children? Um, what's the cost-benefit analysis for their child alone in getting them vaccinated? On slide seven. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, the parents we talked to consider their children's preference to be very important in, decision, in making the decision about whether to get vaccinated. Um, and these parents told us that their children are getting a lot of their information from their friends, from social media, not necessarily going to the CDC or listening to health experts. The parents kind of both believe their children are doing their research, but then they question the dependability of the sources they're seeking out. On C finding eight, um, so this is kind of our last finding for parents. Um, it's pretty similar. Again, we see that children are clearly influenced by their peers, um, often through social media um, or influencers. And so this really drove home to the extent to which many children are likely to get vaccinated eventually because they see their peers and their friends doing it. Um, we had one parent who mentioned he had a 17-year-old son. He was already vaccinated because his girlfriend made the decision for him. So before we kind of move on to the findings from the men's groups, any kind of Thoughts, questions of parent groups. Okay, sounds like I will move on to the men. So um, I'm on uh, unvaccinated men finding number one. So while most of the unvaccinated male participants we talked to believe that COVID is a real disease, serious, has hurt um, or killed many people, they also think the pandemic response is overblown. This is particularly true among the Caucasian middle-aged white men. Um, there, we heard that they were just over it and really want things to go back to normal. Um, another common thread we heard from both groups and, and populations of these men is that many of them believe that they are personally at risk for getting a severe illness from COVID-19. So kind of unsurprisingly, the motivation to get vaccinated is severely diminished because they just, they don't think they really need it. They don't think they're at risk. Um, some of the men that we spoke to actually have had COVID, 
Um, so in many cases, they felt confident they would survive it. And in fact, believed they didn't need a vaccine because they had natural immunity. Um, they were even frustrated that there had been a push for them to get it um, without acknowledging that they don't need it because they already have antibodies. One of these participants who had COVID um, thought he even had quote unquote better antibodies from having the virus itself that he would get from being vaccinated. There were a few exceptions to this belief that COVID isn't a threat to them, especially among some of the young Latin, Latino men that we spoke to, um, particularly the Spanish interviews. A couple of them were fearful of COVID, but still seemed more afraid of the vaccine. So we'll kind of circle back to that. But in general, most of these men, both among the kind of older Caucasian white men or Caucasian men and the younger Latino men felt that they would be okay um, getting the virus. Um, and they all had concerns about the, the vaccine itself. So on the second key finding, um, particularly among the unvaccinated middle-aged Caucasian men we talked to, they seemed very focused on the impact of COVID-19 and vaccination on them personally. They weren't really thinking about the wider community. So by that, I mean, they were thinking about the potential benefits of vaccination. Um, the, the potential benefits for vaccination for the broader community are not top of mind. Um, this is a very personal thing to them, thinking about whether or not they should get vaccinated. Um, among some of the younger Latino men, um, they also were kind of started from a somewhat self-centered view, thinking about, you know, do I need the vaccine? What are the consequences of the vaccine? Um, however, many do indicate concern for their families. Um, there were a couple who are even continuing to social distance, um, avoid family in order to keep them, to keep their loved ones safe. Um, Finding number three for the unvaccinated men groups. Um, unvaccinated male participants are distrustful of how quickly the vaccine was rolled out and how quote unquote new the technology is. They fear the unknown potential long-term impacts of the vaccine more than they fear the disease itself. So we kind of mentioned that earlier that most of the men we were speaking with didn't really think that the virus was a huge concern for them or they did um, have concerns about getting sick with COVID but they had more concerns about the vaccine itself. Um, to that point, a couple of the young Latino men we spoke to in Spanish specifically indicated that they were afraid not only about the side effects from the vaccine, but they actually believed that the vaccine would give them COVID. We had um, a couple of participants mentioning that they had heard about women having miscarriages as a result of the vaccine, and some mentioned the idea that the vaccine could make them sterile. Um, some of them thought that it would uh, make them quote unquote weaker. Um, and another said they were afraid of dying from the vaccine. So I think kind of one quote that we heard that really sums it up is I'm just worried, you know, we haven't had it long enough to test enough people with it. Um, and kind of our take from this is that we think fear is a primary driver of a lot of the resistance to getting vaccine. They just don't know much about the vaccine, don't know how it works. Um, have heard some really scary things. Um, and they also don't think the virus would be so bad. So for them, that's an easy calculus to avoid the vaccine. Um, um, so key finding number four for the unvaccinated men, many of the young Latino male participants did tell us they aren't entirely closed off to the idea of never getting vaccinated. They just wanna wait a little longer and see how it goes. In fact, many said they thought they would get it eventually. Um, some just don't feel they need it right now. There's no rush, no sense of urgency. Um, others thought they would get it soon, but they feared the side effects. Um, the fear of side effects was making them wait. And they were using that as an excuse to just not having gone around to it. On key finding number five, um, participants in both the Caucasian middle-aged white men and the young Latino men groups seem to strongly resent the idea of vaccine passports. However, kind of while they thought they were a bad idea, intrusive, um, unnecessary, they did seem to understand that they were probably inevitable, that their view was a minority in this area, and that future restrictions in the Bay Area were probably coming for those who were unvaccinated. Because of this kind of awareness that they're probably going to be asked about their vaccination status or needed to do things, and because they so desperately want to get back to normal, um, this kind of requirement um, could be a motivation for some of them eventually. 
to one person in the Latino men's group told us that, you know, if they said, if you get a vaccine, we would guarantee you'd come back to normal. Then yes, I'm totally down for it. I will get it. Other than that though, I'd rather just wait. On to the sixth finding. Um, many of the men we talked to claim they would not be enticed by monetary incentives to get vaccinated, um, like the lottery or gift cards. Um, a couple of the men we spoke with even thought, thought that they were evidence that the vaccines were not that good if the state or the county or you know government was having to bribe people to get them. However, if we ask them to kind of step outside themselves and think about, you know, do other people find them appealing? Do you think it would work for other people? Um, they thought that they would help drive vaccinations, kind of particularly in light of some of the economic COVID hardships that had happened over the last year and a half. And we heard a little bit more kind of openness among several of the Spanish language interviews. Um, some of those individuals we spoke to, the incentives sounded particularly good. So it does seem that, you know, although they may not want to admit it, incentives could be an effective approach to encourage some people to get vaccinated. Um, we did present a series of messages here, which for time we're not including, but we tried to cover, you know, what might be persuasive reasons to encourage these unvaccinated men to get vaccinated. Among the middle-aged white Caucasian male participants, messages about the risk of the virus or protecting their family and others. Um, they got pretty defensive hearing those. They thought they sounded manipulative, exaggerated, or untrue. Um, however, message about how COVID might impact them personally, um, particularly we, we had one message that said, you know, COVID might cause erectile dysfunction. Those did seem to cause them to think twice and potentially start to think that getting the virus might have implications for them personally. Um, a bit of a different reaction among the young Latino male participants. Um, this group messages that forward the idea of being a leader, protecting their community, frontline workers, um, and family resonated much more strongly. Um, you know, again, we said when we first talked about the vaccine, the idea of protecting others didn't really come to them unprompted. Um, however, if you can help them that, make that connection, they were seeing the value of getting vaccinated as a way to, to help protect those that they love. Um, so, you know, this in this regard, a pretty considerable difference between all Caucasian middle-aged men and the young Latino men were being persuaded by different information. On to key finding number nine, um, another approach that seemed effective specifically with the middle-aged white or Caucasian men was that we talked um, to them about kind of how the vaccines were developed in a more straightforward fashion. Um, we talked about the history of how the mRNA vaccines were developed, how long the technology had been in process. Um, and so rather than using messages or statements that were more in attempt to persuade, we tried an approach that just kind of laid out the history and kind of process for how these vaccines were um, developed. And that resonated much better with this particular group. So for these participants, um, they said that what they wanted was to be given the information um, and allowed to make their own decisions. They didn't want to be pushed, shamed, or pressured. Um, to illustrate this point, one participant said, hey, treat us like adults. We can make a decision. You might be surprised and agree with you. Just let us know the facts. On slide 10, so if these men just want to know the facts, you know, this begs the question, who, sh who should give them those facts? Who will they trust? Um, we asked if they would trust doctors or healthcare professionals. Um, and in both groups, the middle-aged Caucasian men and young Latino men, they trust their doctors with likely them to them. Um, however, there was a couple who did indicate they believe doctors might be under pressure to quote unquote, sell the vaccines. Um, interestingly, some of the young Latino participants said they wouldn't listen to their doctor if they were told to get vaccinated, but would trust them as a source for information. So again, Riley, I'm, oh, Riley, I'm, Riley this is Mike. I, I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute. Yeah. I see that Supervisor Lee has his hand raised. Uh, perhaps we can take some input here. Go, go oh, ahead, sure. Supervisor Lee. 
No, thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt your report uh, uh, <laughs> here. Sorry about that. Um, actually, I think some of these messages are extremely uh, 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 insightful of what it is. And I just want to also mention that uh, I did hear a uh, podcast a while back, about a couple months ago, uh, and it was about the uh, individual named Frank Luntz, who is a very powerful uh, messenger for the for the Republicans on many issues for decades. And he was actually doing a, a similar uh, research. Uh, and it turned out after a lot of the uh, different messages being given, the one that seemed to be most powerful was actually the one from uh, Governor Chris Christie explaining uh, how he got COVID and how he, within the uh, uh, the orbit of the eight people training the pres or pre preparing uh, then President Trump for the debate before President Biden, and how seven of eight of them got COVID right afterwards from their individual experiences uh, of how serious and how how um, how it affected everybody, including young people like uh, in this case uh, 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 Hope Hicks, who is a young woman who is very uh, uh, athletic, uh, running three four miles a day. Uh, and still got very, very sick from COVID. So I, I thought there was that was a, a bit of a, a information that I was able to get. I'm not sure you have heard that uh, that podcast, but I just want to share it with you to uh, see if these are uh, some of the information we might be able to use in terms of uh, uh, honing our messaging better for those uh, for that group of uh, uh, the, uh, individuals who's not been vaccinated. Yet. Thank you. That's yeah. all. I have. Thanks for bringing that up. I, I am aware of uh, Frank Luntz's research, and he's been doing stuff throughout the pandemic, and it's kind of uncanny how much some of the national research can mirror some of the attitudes um, locally as well. Um, I would say that, and again, this is qualitative research. We should take it with a grain of salt that we have, you know, one group of one small group of people. They aren't necessarily um, representative of everyone in their cohort, but. Um, a few of these men, particularly in the Caucasian middle-aged white group, you know, knew people who had gotten sick, knew people that had gotten sick themselves. I think one person even knew they knew someone who had died. Um, and the challenge with them is that they saw themselves as, you know, even though we're of this cohort that could get sick, or even though they're young, healthy people um, that have gotten severely sick, like Hope Hicks, and we brought her up as well in these groups, they they had this mindset that you know, I'm healthy, I take care of myself, I'm not at risk. So there is a challenge there of trying to convince them it could happen to them. What they seem to respond to is just this really straightforward, hey, here's this information, you make your decision, but like, you trust me, here's here's what I think, uh, and make your own decision. So maybe a bit of a difference there. And again, it's just a group of seven men, but uh, we did observe that. And Riley, what I'm going to ask due to the length of our, our um, agenda today and the time that we spent on this, and we've all read the poll, is that we stop things here. I looked to any other supervisors for any questions. I'll check with Jess if we have, we don't have any public speakers wishing to speak on this. Um, That's correct. Supervisors, any other questions for Jess, excuse me, for Riley? I'm not seeing any. Riley, any concluding comments that you want to make? Yeah, you actually, it's just the next slide. So here, I mean, just to go back to the parents, um, I would just kind of the main takeaway there is, you know, they're not- It's a little hard to understand you right now. Uh, how about this? Can we lean in? Can you hear me better? No, not yet. <laughs> is this better? Yes, it is. All right, <laughs> just muted and unmuted. Um, I'm showing my final slide here. There's just kind of two takeaways for each population. Um, so for parents, just keep in mind, they're not resistant to the vaccine generally. They're just kind of scared about long-term safety effects. Um, so kind of reassuring them about that, as well as acknowledging that peer pressure, as well as getting things back to normal, um, are probably gonna be motivators for this population. Um, and they also listen to their kids a lot. So make sure you're talking to the kids because they're of an age where they have an opinion and their parents are trying to respect that. Um, for the unvaccinated men, they seem pretty entrenched in their views. Um, they don't believe it's necessary for them. Um, some may be persuaded and really trying to make it about the personal benefit for them as well as framing it as a choice and here's the information to make it. Uh, that seemed to resonate. Super. Thank you very much for your report and we will consider it received. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item number 14, which was to be heard no earlier than 2 p.m. 
We now are a quarter after two. So we will go ahead with that. Supervisor Chavez, we're gonna open up with you. And I just wanna point out to anybody wishing to speak. I don't know if we'll have a few or a lot. Um, I know we certainly had a lot in the way of emails and reaching out from the community in support of this. And I just wanna remind anybody that this is a referral, um, no action being taken. It's a request for um, administration to get back to us in reference to um, this particular item. Supervisor Chavez, why don't you lead off? Thank you, if it's okay with my colleagues, um, I'll read just a little bit of background and then um, uh, put a motion on the table and that Great. way the public knows to what they're speaking. So this is a referral asking for the establishment of the County Office of Disability Affairs. The board and the county have demonstrated our commitment towards equity, which is evident in many actions we've taken prior to COVID and during COVID-19. As a matter of fact, last week we voted to add positions to the new Office of Diversity, Equity and Belonging, including the newly created Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer. This referral asks that we, we act with intentionality relative to equitable access, opportunity and inclusion of, of by four people with visible and hidden disabilities. To that end, I'm asking for five actions to come back to the board on September 28th. One, a staffing framework mandate and timeline for the County of Santa Clara Office of Disability Affair, Affairs, Disability Affairs, I apologize. Two, estimated costs and source of funding for the establishment of the office. Three, options for consideration relating to establishing the Disability Community Accountability Advisory Board to guide the work of the county and the office relating to access and inclusion. Four, a plan to engage stakeholders to obtain feedback on the initial framework of the Office of Disability Affairs and an ongoing plan for community engagement. And five, a historic over, I'm sorry, an overview of historical and current efforts of the County of Santa Clara to address the needs of the individ of individuals with disabilities and analysis of opportunities to leverage existing efforts. Um, and I would make that motion and then I'll make a few comments. Thank you. We have a motion by Supervisor Chavez. Do we have a second? Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. Second, I was waving. <laughs> Vice President Allenberg, you're seconding. Happy to second it. And Supervisor Lee, you have your hand raised to speak. No, May I was not just... thinking it, but that's fine. I'm perfectly happy that uh, my fellow uh, survived the second, that's all. Okay, go ahead, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And I just wanted to share that the, with my colleagues that the proposal before you was drafted in close partnership with a coalition of by, of, by, and for people with disabilities. And the idea was met with enthusiasm and an awful lot of um, feedback by over 70 individuals who participated in a preliminary stakeholder engagement session. And people with disabilities, as you all know, are vital members of our community. They are family, friends, colleagues, and neighbors. And people with disabilities are also generally more likely to experience poverty, food insecurity, health problems, discrimination, and exclusion from built environments and inadequate social services. My intention with this referral is to ensure that the County of Santa Clara leads with equity, inclusion, and accessibility as it relates to individuals with disability. I do just wanna say um, how, how important it was to me to get the feedback from the community um, relative to this proposal before I brought it forward to all of you. And I'm very excited, um, very, very excited to bring this forward and, um, and request your enthusiastic support. Thank you very much. I am certainly in support of it as well. We're now gonna to turn to the public. And for the people that have registered um, to speak about this, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. We have a motion by Supervisor Chavez to approve the referral. We have a second by Vice President uh, Supervisor Ellenberg to do that. I'm certainly in favor. So um, that's what it takes to get this thing passed. So that you're welcome to speak and say whatever you wish. We'll go ahead with one minute each. Jess, if you could uh, invite our speakers to participate. And I hope you all heard what I said and I look forward to hearing what you say. Go ahead. Our, our first speaker is Kristen Brown. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. My name is Kristen Brown, and, and uh, you'll have to forgive me. I'm a little verklempt at all of you supporting this. Thank you so much. You bet. Uh, thank you. 
People with disabilities include those with physical, mental, or emotional impairments that often make everyday experiences more challenging. The disabilities can be from birth, brought on by life, or temporarily onset from an injury. People with disabilities need support for access to their communities. Your website notice, notes under ADA Title II from 1998, people with disabilities are protected from discrimination. Please understand that Title II currently reflects the 2010 revisions. This is a small matter that reflects how deeply people with disabilities have been in the shadows of the County Office of Supervisors. People with disabilities are one of the disfranchised community groups that need to be part of all equity considerations. Thank you. For Thank you. Our next speaker is Eva. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one more question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I want to give my testimony and uh, my comment in Spanish. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Eva Heredia y soy madre de dos. Hoy estoy aquí en apoyo a los papás y mamás del grupo de Yo Soy Tu Voz. En apoyo también a la propuesta de nuestra supervisora, Cinda Chávez, de tener una propia oficina de asuntos de discapacidades en el condado de Santa Clara, en nuestra propia ciudad para todas las comunidades que lo necesiten. Por favor, apoyen esta propuesta y en nombre de todos los papás que no pudieron estar aquí, pero quiero que se escuche su voz. Muchísimas gracias por su tiempo. Thank you very much. And just if we have a translator, that's, that would be great. If not, it was thank you to Supervisor Chavez for bringing this motion forward and she was really happy about it. We do, do we have, have Rosario on the line. Wonderful. Rosario, could you please give a translation of what we just heard? Rosario, I see you on. I'm sorry, I was halfway. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So I'm here supporting the, not only the families, but only supporting the, but also supporting the group Yo Soy Tu Voz. Um, also supporting um, Supervisor Cindy Chavez for the proposal and of having our own office in Santa Clara, which is our place and in and have an own place in our community. So um, I would like to support all parents that weren't able to be here and I'm speaking on their behalf. So thank you very much. And I please ask you to approve this motion. Thank you. Thanks, Rosario. And before we continue, Jess, Vice President Ellenberg, has her hand raised, we'll hear from her first. Okay. Are we in the midst of public comments still? Yes, yes, we are in the midst. Oh, I, I'm, I'm happy to wait until it's finished. I had a few uh, questions and a, um, a request for uh, a, a friendly amendment to just add a little bit more information to the referral. Gotcha. But I'm glad to wait until after the comments. Thank you. We have uh, 23 people waiting now. Go right ahead. Our next speaker is Sandra Asher. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sandra Asher and I'm a resident of District 1. I also happen to be a board member of both Community Solutions and Parents Helping Parents. And I'm also a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. Together with all of this, I'm also a person with a non-apparent disability, as, whether, as well as a mother to an autistic son. We need an Office of Disability Affairs in Santa Clara County. This office can be the hub of support this community needs. It can provide one-stop shopping for information and referrals to the public, disability training for county offices and community partners, and drive community engagement. Most other large metro areas have already implemented a similar model. Just look to San Francisco. So LA and New York, what are we waiting for? Let's make progress together and support all our county residents. And I thank you uh, to the supervisors who have already mentioned their support. Our next speaker is Molly McLeod. Please go ahead. My name is Molly McLeod. I urge the Board of Supervisors to support this referral enthusiastically and thank uh, Supervisor Cindy Chavez for bringing it forward. I appreciate uh, El uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's um, second as she represents uh, me, I live in the district. The proposal to create an Office of Disability Affairs, the reasons are so numerous and could be summed up in the call for nothing about us without us. This is a matter of life and death 
of representation instead of exclusion and celebrating disability culture. It's about liberty and independence 22 years after the US Supreme Court issued the Olmstead, Olmstead decision today. It's about stalled progress 31 years after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is about making a future decision in, in September about a budgetary commitment, staffing commitment, public engagement commitment to build on the work of prior generations for the future of all of us. Thank you for your support. Our next speaker is Brenda Zendejas. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Brenda Zendejas. I'm calling from District 5. I'm calling today because I want an Office of Disability Affairs in Santa Clara County. I think that this has been long overdue, and I'm happy and very excited to see this is happening now. People with disabilities suffer greatly during this pandemic, and many were forgotten. This means a lot to us parents who have children with invisible disabilities. A Santa Clara County Office of Disability means inclusion for all, and that no one has been left behind. Thank you so much for everyone who's already uh, given their support, and to uh, Supervisor Cindy Chavez for championing this. It was really needed in Santa Clara County. Thank you all. Our next speaker is Luz Ramirez. Please go ahead. Luz, there you are. Buenas tardes. Uh, yo lo voy a decir en español. Uh, go ahead. Sí, buenas tardes. Nosotros somos del grupo Yo Soy Tu Voz y estamos pidiendo por una oficina para nuestros niños con discapacidades, ya que Nosotros no tenemos la, la misma apoyo para ellos que todos los demás. Y aparte, pues hay muchas organizaciones que solo buscan el beneficio de ellos y no de nuestros propios hijos. Y nuestros hijos tienen derecho a tener un lugar especialmente para ellos en donde puedan um, ayudarnos y darnos la información que necesitamos, la ayuda que ellos ocupan y no darnos la a medias. Y pues... Nuestros hijos con discapacidades son ciudadanos que merecen también el respeto y pues uh, todo lo que ellos necesitan. Y se nos haría muy buena idea que por favor nos puedan apoyar para que puedan abrir la oficina para discapacidades. Gracias. Pasen buena tarde. Thank you, Rosario. Yes. Okay. My name is Luz Ramirez and I am, I belong to the group Yo Soy Tu Voz. Um, we are asking you to open this uh, office for disabilities for our children that most of the time they are not having the proper support and um, also many organizations they are look that existing organizations they are looking for their own benefits they are not looking for the benefits of our children and they have the right to have their own place so they are in need and we need your help and we don't need the help in we don't need only half of the help we need, we need the full help. Also, our children are citizens and they need to be respected and they need to have everything they, they are, they, and, and they need to have everything they need. Uh, so please um, open this office for disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Rosario. Our next speaker is Peter Ortiz. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Yes, we can. Hello, my name is Peter Ortiz. I'm a trustee for the Santa Clara County Board of Education, and I'm calling in support of the formation of a Santa Clara County Office of Disability Affairs. It is important that our county is inclusive to all members of the community, and we cannot reach this goal unless we are intentional with the inclusion of our differently abled neighbors, loved one, children, and family members. As our county grows and builds resources for our vast population, the accessibility of its infrastructure and services for those with visible and invisible disabilities must be made a priority. It is also important that the county conducts a review of all existing policies to ensure that they accommodate those from the differently abled populations. I thank Supervisor Chavez, Yo Soy Tu Voz, and the Community Coalition for their leadership on this important front. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherry Burns. Sherry, you'll have to click once to accept the unmute. Uh, You're there, go ahead. 
you can hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. I'm not Sherry Burns. I'm Christine Fitzgerald from Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. Long story on that one. Um, I'm here to voice my support in the creation of Office of Disability Affairs. We need one. We're one of the few um, mid-sized counties that do not have one within the entire United States. Why this is, I don't know. That it is, it's sad to say. Um, so many of our communities are not being heard. Those of us with disabilities, whether they're visible or not, need to know that our voices count. Nothing about us without us. Uh, we need an Office of Disability Affairs by, for, and about people with disabilities. Thank you. Our next speaker is Francisco Valenzuela. Please accept me on mute. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, on behalf of San Andreas Regional Center, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Chavez and the board for taking San Andreas Regional Center serves well over 12,000 families who have a loved one with a developmental disability. And on behalf of those families, as well as the entire Santa Clara County, we look forward to working with the county, uh, with this department and going forward and not only supporting it, but also being a voice and a stakeholder in seeing it's uh, seeing it come to fruition. Um, the work that we've done in the community and the community partners out in Santa Clara County, I know there's a lot of individuals that would love to be part of not only seeing it become something, but also um, planting the seeds to help it grow. We have a lot of professionals and families and individuals served who have some great ideas and I think bring them to the stakeholder group would be a great opportunity to make this work. Um, again, on behalf of San Andreas, thank you very much. And again, uh, Supervisor Chavez, thank you for taking the lead on this. Our next speaker is Mark Romoser. Apologies. Yes, Ma Mark Romoser, a long time resident and disability advocate, District 4 resident. Thanks for the second, Susan. Uh, we, it's, as Christine mentioned, San Jose is the largest city in the country without such an office. So it is imperative that we do this at the county level. Another good reason to do it there is that the center for which she works covers the entire county, not just San Jose. And there are, there are certainly all kinds of synergies there. Uh, emergency preparedness comes to mind as we wait for fire season. That's something that, that the county has more control over than any of the cities within it. In short, this is an idea whose time has come. I urge you to support this motion and anything that follows it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Hedges. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, my name is Catherine Hedges. I'm with uh, Santa Fe Racial Justice. And I'd like to thank um, Supervisor Chavez. I live in her district and I'm very proud that she has brought this measure forward. Um, I wrote a letter that kind of focused on how it's affected me personally, but as Mark brought up, um, emergency preparedness for disabled people typically leaves them behind, uh, whether it's wildfires, uh, blackouts, or the Coyote Creek flood. Um, we're also left behind with transit planning, uh, VTAs, reorganization of focus on workers instead of uh, community members who don't live in the um, work transit corridors, um, literally left people behind. And you know, there are just so many ways that we, the county needs to consider disabled people in its policy making. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tiffany. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Tiffany Maciel, and I live in District 2, Supervisor Chavez area. So it's especially nice that she's bringing this forward. I'd like to thank Supervisor Chavez and Maya, her someone who works in her office, for everything they've done. Um, I've, I've been advocating for inclusiveness and equity. I formed Eureka Inclusive with other family members um, to advocate for inclusion within schools. And along the way, you learn that 
this work is really brutal and hard and people say not to take it personal, but we take it personal. So I, I want to take the last few seconds to point out people who have helped keep my faith in humanity and who are unsung heroes in this county. Angie Lopez, Mona Rod, Nikki Hellman, Dayu Rojas, David Johnson, Terry Downing, Carrie Rosada, Allison King, Gail Osmer, Kathy Wall, Dr. Jean Novak, Trustee Joseph DeSalvo and Ma, Vanessa Wallace, Adon LaPercio, Sherry Taylor. Our next speaker is Rika Yakamoto. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Rika Yamamoto. Uh, I'm from Palo Alto Community Advisory Committee. We, the Palo Alto CAC, represent over 1,000 families who have students with a disability in Palo Alto Unified School District and Palo Alto. We are in support for the, uh, the proposal of new Office of Disability Affairs. We agree that the disability community underserved community, uh, countywide and its needs are underrepresented. With over 20,000 people with a disability in our county, we need a central office to develop and oversee best practice, policy program, and service. Therefore, we strongly urge you to approve Supervisor Cindy Chavez's proposal to establish Office of Disability Appear. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Michelle Mashburn. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, hopefully I can be heard. As a nonprofit professional, a Green Party representative and a disabled resident, I'm calling to support this referral. Pandemic has been hard, lonely and scary. Early on in the pandemic, my medical care center blocked the accessible pathway with a COVID testing zone. Paratransit cleaning protocols were inadequate. And when I became sick, afraid it was COVID, I struggled to find an accessible testing site because the only one readily accessible to my home was closed due to the Thanksgiving holiday. When I was able to receive my vaccination, I was left without a ride home because of a VTA data breach that took place earlier this year. What is sad is that none of this surprised me. People with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by disasters and most at risk with poverty, homelessness, inadequate education, and higher unemployment rates. This referral sends a message that we are deserving of representation and of being heard. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Our next speaker is Anna. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anna Ibarra. I live in District 5 and I'm a parent of advocate at Yo Soy Tu Voz. I have two children with invisible disabilities. I wanted to ask your support on 14 for Office of Disability and I really appreciate um, that you take in consideration all of this for the benefit of our children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lilia. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lilia Sevilla. I'm from Yo Soy Tu Voz. I'm a proud mother of an autistic child. And I feel that this is really important to have an office. Uh, we often feel unrepresented. Uh, even though our city is a multicultural city, the Latino community is who has more struggles getting access to the service that our kids need. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janet Von Zoren. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Janet Van Zoren and I'm from uh, District 5. I have a daughter with a developmental disability, and um, I'm really in favor of this Office of Devil Disability Affairs, and I want to thank uh, Supervisor Cindy Chavez for bringing this forward. I'm hoping, too, that as part of this um, office, in addition to the many recommendations that have already been made, that there'll be some focus to bring attention to how we can create more affordable housing for people with developmental disabilities and people who have other disabilities as well. I'd also like to recommend that the office look forward at what can be done to help with the aging process of people who have, de who have disabilities. Many are living longer and are having to face um, issues that haven't been dealt with in the past. So I'm hoping you can. Our next speaker is Viviana Barnwell. 
please go ahead. Hi, my name is Viviana Barnwell, and I am the mother of an eight-year-old with multiple disabilities, and I also serve as an advocate for families and individuals with disabilities who are, in most cases, speakers of Spanish only. Uh, when people with disabilities have unmet needs and never even mention or consider once, they are usually put in a list where other issues are prioritized. Having an office that focuses only on disabilities will make people with disabilities finally the priority and the focus, and that will ensure that their voices are being heard and that they are being truly seen. Also, um, because I work with uh, minorities, uh, I hope this office is able to remember that when a person has a disability, that doesn't cancel the fact that they are members of minority. Actually, numbers have proven that when a person besides having a disability is part of a minority group, the disparities are huge and the support little. Thank you. Our next speaker is Beverly Wong. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Beverly Wong and I'm speaking on behalf of Parents Helping Parents in San Jose. We are a family resource center and family empowerment center for the county and serve over 6,000 families of children with special needs each year in the county. I'm speaking in strong support of establishing an Office of Disability Affairs in the county. We have over 144,000 people with disabilities in Santa Clara. When parents first learn about their child's disability diagnosis, they often feel overwhelmed trying to navigate and find supports available. The the struggle to access services, inclusion in society, and equal opportunity continues throughout the lifespan for many people with disabilities. As a number of our community members have shared, they face poor outcomes across the board and um, are significantly underserved. Uh, the county must delegate leadership and resources to ensure that people with disabilities receive equitable access, inclusion, and opportunity to thrive. And for this reason, we support uh, creating an Office of Disability Affairs. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Robinson. Please go ahead. John, you'll have to click once to turn on your microphone. There you go. Hi, my name is John Robinson. I'm a Hope Services in, in San Jose. And, you know, I think, think Suicide and you supporting this proposal. I think it's a real, real good, good thing to have to, to have strong teeth to, to the proposal. Thank you all for, for supporting the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is L. Please go ahead. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Yasmin. Yo formo parte del grupo de padres Yo Soy Tu Voz. Gracias a la supervisora Chávez uh, por la propuesta, por iniciar esta propuesta 14. Nosotros la apoyamos. Yo tengo una niña con una deshabilidad invisible. Estoy aquí para apoyar la propuesta para que se abra una oficina donde nos sentamos, sintamos cómodos, ya que necesitamos recursos de vivienda, educación y servicios. Uh, yo sí les pido que tomen en cuenta todas nuestras opiniones porque... Es muy importante que se abra este tipo de oficinas para que nos sintamos más apoyados y nuestros niños tengan los derechos que necesitan. Gracias. Thank you, Rosario. My name is Jasmine and I'm a member of Yo Soy Tu Voz. I would like to thank Supervisor Chavez because of this proposal. And I'm having a, I'm, I'm having a girl with an invisible uh, disability. And I would like to support the opening of this office so all of us are feeling more comfortable because we need a lot of resources. We need housing, we need education, and we need services. I think uh, that this office will be very important. Um, thank you for having all of our, we need, to, we need uh, to our opinions to be heard. And also this office will be very important for our support and the support of our children because they need to be respected. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emma Tekka. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Sí. Buenas tardes. Yo voy a hablar en español. Mi nombre es Emma Tekpa. Gracias, señora Chávez, por iniciar la propuesta 14. Yo tengo un hijo con autismo. Es una discapacidad invisible. Es tiempo de que se dé a conocer las necesidades y apoyo para nuestros hijos. Es importante tener 
una oficina para educación especial donde sean transparentes y se den la información adecuada para necesidades uh, adecuadas para nuestros hijos con diferentes capacidades. Gracias. Thank you. Rosario, so my, my name, sure. My name is Eva, Emma Tecpa, and thank you very much, Supervisor, Supervisor Chavez, for this uh, for Proposal 14. I'm having a kid with autism. This is an invisible, this is an, an invisible disability, and we need um, a lot of support for our children. We need a place which is very important to have. We need a place with special education and a place that is also transparent because we need we need information. This is what we need, and we need a place for our children with different capabilities. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Denise Garcia. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Denise, you'll have to click once to turn your microphone on. We'll come back to Denise. Our next speaker is David Grady. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is David Grady. I'm with the State Council on Developmental Disabilities serving the Central Coast region, which includes Santa Clara County. I wish to thank Supervisor Chavez for proposing this uh, office and offer our support for this. <clears throat> uh, as individuals with disabilities are included more and more in everyday life and are part of our community, the county has the role of making sure services are available to them. Uh, not only education and health care, but services are needed for transportation, housing, and behavioral health. These are all complicated systems that require Require oversight from an organization such as the Disability of, uh, um, Office so that uh, individuals and families can navigate the services, uh, have their needs expressed, and have their, um, the, uh, their voices heard. Also, this, this department can be very effective in training the staff of the county to work better and better with those with disabilities. Thank you very much for this consideration. Our next speaker is Bruce. Please go ahead. Bruce, I see your microphone's on. Go ahead and begin speaking. Bruce, we're not hearing you. We'll come back. Our next speaker is Barbara Hansen. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Yes, this is Barbara Hansen. I'm with the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder um, Collaborative, and I want to thank you for once again being so progressive and inclusive in this county. I would suggest that, uh, that this uh, that this affairs office might follow the pattern that's already been established with FASD in doing a campaign and then training uh, about disability and also doing training through all systems to be able to address the needs of people with disabilities. It's a disabilities cuts across every socioeconomic barrier and also across every race barrier. Thank you so much for being so forward thinking. Thanks. Our next speaker is Laura Marquina. Marquina, excuse me, go ahead. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchan? Yes. Ok, hola, mi nombre es Laura Marquina. Soy madre de un niño de cuatro años diagnosticado con autismo. Soy parte del grupo Yo Soy Tu Voz. Y me gustaría que aprobaran la propuesta 14, ya que sí se necesita un lugar donde puedan apoyarnos y asesorarnos para que nuestros hijos tengan las ayudas que necesitan. Gracias. My name is Laura, Mar Laura Marquina, and I'm a mother of four years old autism kid, and I would like you to approve this proposal 14. I'm a member of Yo Soy Tu Voz, and this place is really needed because we need support and we need advice. So thank you very much for, for uh, approving this proposal. Our next speaker is Dinora Gonzalez. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. I can see your microphones on. Go ahead. ¿Me escuchan? Yes. ¿Me escuchan? Yes. Oh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Dinora Nieves, mamá de Génesis Payán Nieves. Ayer estuvimos también apoyando la propuesta número 14 de Cindy Chávez. Uh, les pido, por favor, uh, 
nos puedan apoyar con esta propuesta, me gustaría mucho que eh, ganara la proposición número 14, ya que en otras organizaciones uh, han puesto su mirada solamente en sus propios intereses y no en la de nuestros hijos. Me gustaría que pusieran esta oficina para apoyar a nuestros hijos, que nos puedan capacitar y nosotros poder ayudar a más padres también con estos uh, hijos que tienen necesidades es, um, especiales. Mi hija tiene una necesidad especial visible e invisible y también este me gustaría que por favor uh, nos apoyen a esta organización o más bien este grupo de padres. Thank you, Rosario. Rosario, you're on mute. I'm sorry. My name is Dinora Nieves, and I'm, mo I'm the mother of Genesis Nieves. We would like you to support this proposal 14 by P Supervisor Chavez. And please, we would like you to have the full, pro the full support for this proposal, and we would like this to be approved. There are a lot of organizations out, out there that they are just looking their own interest, not the interest of our kids. So uh, we need a place where we are able to receive training. And also we need a place where we are able to get education and also are able to help other parents with special needs. My, my kid is having a visible and invisible um, disease. So please, we need support for this group. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nikki Holman. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Nikki Holman, and um, I just want to thank everybody for the unanimous vote on um, approving the referral for Ms. Chavez. I'd also like to thank Ms. Chavez and Tiffany, Tiffany Maciel for inviting me and allowing me to come on to this. Um, I've heard a lot of people saying uh, about children, which is true, but I'm also thinking about the adults with disabilities that live in Santa Clara County that have been um, until now mostly ignored. And I do think that this will be a place where adults, because some people, you know, they become disabled through life. They're 19, 20, 30, 40, and they need help. They need somewhere to go. And I really do believe an Office of Disability of Affairs is overdue. And it is a civil rights issue. It's a human rights issue. So I just, again, want to thank Cindy Chavez and as well as Tiffany Maciel for inviting me on to help this cause. Our next speaker is Nassim Nouri. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Thank you very much for this uh, proposal and opportunity to be part of um, enthusiastically and strongly supporting it. My name is Nassim Nouri. I'm a resident of San Jose and represent the Green Party of Santa Clara County. I think um, you, you have, we have heard the amazing support behind this proposal. So I wanna first thank Supervisor Cindy Chavez <clears throat> for uh, supporting it as well as the rest of the board of supervisors. And I really hope that this office takes on the very difficult task of educating the public about how underrepresented people with disabilities, uh, visible or invisible, have been in our communities, in addition to addressing the critical needs that our community members have. Um, it is true that nobody has officially uh, represented the disabled community, and I'm very proud that this office will be formed and we put our full support behind it. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Denise Garcia. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. We can Perfect. Hear you. My name is Denise Garcia. I am an educator here in the County of Santa Clara working in San Jose. I fully support this Office of Disability Affairs. I think working in the county, um, we noticed even differences between the schools in the county. Um, and not all schools are have an inclusion model, right? So even within our own county, there's the programs are being ran differently. And I think having an office at the county level, we could really start to streamline and make our the services that we offer our families a little bit more uniform. While some schools are doing great things, other schools could be doing more. And again, I think this office could really support that work. Um, again, I support all of the comments that I'm hearing that came before me, that it's time that we kind of step up it's time that we support our families, even um, especially our families who have, you know, all, all these barriers, language barriers, um, immigration status barriers. 
So I fully support it. And I want to thank Yosef DeVos and Cindy Chavez for this initiative. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anna Naranjo. Please go ahead. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Ana. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ana Naranjo y estoy aquí porque estoy apoyando esta propuesta. Como tengo una hija con autismo y lo más difícil es como madre entender cómo ayudarla y, y no encontrar las oficinas aquí en mi ciudad de Melpitas. Y también cómo ayudarla para poder ayudarla también en la escuela, ayudar a nuestros hijos con estas disabilidades y es importante que haya un lugar para que nosotros podamos acudir y, y poder ayudar a nuestros hijos y, y a los demás niños que están en el entorno de él porque uh, con estas necesidades nosotros nos estresamos demasiado que no sabemos qué hacer y, y sin entender el sistema de cómo poder ayudar es, es muy difícil. Por eso les pido por favor ayuda a los supervisores y a todas las personas que están encargadas. Muchas gracias. My name is Ana Naranjo, and I would like you to support this proposal. I am a mother of a, a, a girl with autism, and we need help. We need help to understand everything, and um, we, need a, we need help with an office in my place, which is Malpitas. And we would like to have education for these disabilities. We need a place to go, and we need help for our children, and also the children that are surrounding our children with special needs. We need to understand the system and sometimes we don't know where to go. We don't know we don't know where to reach for help. And sometimes it's even even impossible to know where to go or how to understand it if we are not able to understand anything we need. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mercedes Carbajal. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am an educator, a parent, and advocate from District 4. I want to thank you, supervisors, for bringing this forward um, and for considering this proposal. Um, just like many of us residents here in Santa Clara County, we pay the high price to stay here and live here for this same reason, because we like the progressiveness that you guys take um, on issues like this. So I urge you to really consider this Office of Disability. It would give representation to our most, one of our most vulnerable communities. Um, having someone who represents you at the table when they're making decision matters. Just like having one Latina in this board of, um, in this board matters. We know that somebody has walked through our shoes. We know they're looking out for our needs. And so having somebody focused on these issues matters. So please, thank you. Our next speaker is Tahiti Paletti. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Tahiti Paletti. I'm calling from uh, Palo Alto in Santa Clara County. Um, I just wanted to offer my full support for the Office of Disability Affairs. Um, it's definitely a community that is hugely underrepresented, cannot advocate for themselves. Um, I have a son who's on the spectrum. Um, it makes a lot of sense to have a central office that can oversee some of the best practices, policies, programs, and services. I do support this, and it's time that the disability community receives the same level of resources and support as everybody else. Um, I highly support item number 14, which is the current agenda item. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Veronica Guzman. Please go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, my name is Veronica Guzman. I'm the founder of Yo Soy Tu Voz Parent Group, but I'm also a longtime advocate in this, um, for this community, including low income and community of colors. As I said yesterday, I'm here to um, support the uh, uh, proposal, and I truly deeply want to thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez, for making this happen, and for everybody that has uh, came in and support this proposal. It is time. It is time to step up. It is time to provide services, love, and respect to our um, community, uh, disabled, disabled community. As I said yesterday, we had a strive and pr make progress when it comes to social justice, racial equity, and equality for our communities, but we're still missing something. This community has been impacted greatly over and over, and now 
before and after COVID. So please, I'll uh, urge you to uh, pass this proposal. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angela Tirado. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Angela Tirado, the voice of San Jose, also the Bay Area I've upgraded. But as everyone knows, uh, I have a daughter with um, Down syndrome disability. She's everywhere. She's our Princess Angelita. And I can't emphasize the importance of having a contact there in the office. I've struggled and worked so many years um, to get her what she needs. And I don't mind helping myself. I'm already an advocate and I don't mind helping the County of Santa Clara getting somebody in there screening um, because I firsthand know the needs of the community, um, not only through my daughter, but through personal experience. So again, Cindy uh, Chavez, thank you very much for proposing this. This is a long time coming. We need this change and I appreciate letting me be able to talk. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Our next speaker is Sherry Burns. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, President Wasserman and supervisors. My name is Sherry Burns, the real Sherry Burns. Uh, Executive Director with Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. And thank you to Supervisor Chavez for bringing this referral forward and for the board's en encouraging and enthusiastic support of establishing an Office of Disability Affairs in Santa Clara County. Such an office would provide both visibility and opportunity. Visibility for nearly 200,000 county residents who have a disability or chronic health condition that shows we matter. Opportunity for the county to fully engage all our residents in improving our community infrastructure, access to goods and services, our economy, educational equality and equity, affordable and accessible housing, and emergency preparedness and response. An Office of Disability Affairs will demonstrate our community and government's desire to be more inclusive and equitable. It says we matter and demonstrates real and mean meaningful action towards achieving the ideal of a county that takes care of all of its residents. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karina. Please go ahead. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello. Uh, mi nombre es Karina Costa y estoy, um, soy parte del grupo Yo Soy Tu Voz y estoy a favor de la proposición uh, de Ms. Chávez, ya que tengo un hijo con autismo y es muy difícil la ayuda que nos dan a, a nosotros, ya sea uh, educación económica, uh, de salud, es muy difícil por el idioma y por todos los um, obstáculos que nos ponen. Y estoy a favor de la proposición 14. Gracias. My name is Karina Acosta, and I'm in favor of, of this proposal. I'm a member of Yo Soy Tu Voz, and uh, thank you very much to Supervisor Chavez. I'm having a boy with autism, and it's very difficult to get help. It's very difficult to get education. It's very difficult to get economic help and, and, um, and, uh, and this, all this is because of the language barrier. Um, this is a very difficult obstacle we have. So I'm in favor of this proposal 14. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bruce. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm someone who lives in um, the county. Um, Santa, I mean, um, um, well, I live in the county, Mount, um, Santa Clara. And um, I'm someone who's disabled as well. And I could benefit from some advocacy for disability affairs. I think right now, there just aren't enough resources to help someone who needs um, assistance in their daily care. I have to hire someone because in-home support services won't help me be, because my income is so high. And um, I think the threshold should be made higher. So I'm someone who could really benefit from the advocacy that um, such an office could provide. Thank you. Our next speaker is Floor Teo. Please go ahead. Hi, mi nombre es Flor Tello en español y estoy aquí para soportar la proposición 14. 
para que den más apoyo y abran esa oficina para educación especial, ya que las organizaciones este, creo que no están haciendo mucho y no están mostrando mucha transparencia para ayudar a los niños con necesidades especiales. Y, y estoy aquí, este, soy, formo parte del grupo Yo Soy Tu Voz, y, este, y me gustaría mucho que si abrieran esa oficina y pudieran ayudar a la comunidad, ya que hay muchos niños con educación especial que, que no están recibiendo todo el apoyo que deberían de, de recibir. Gracias. My name is Flor Tello, and I would like to support the proposal 14. And I would really like to this office to be open to receive special education. There are many organizations that they are not doing a lot. They are not transparent and uh, they are not helping our kids, our kids with special needs. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of Yo Soy Tu Voz, and I would really like this office to be open. Uh, we need help in the community. We need help for education with our special, uh, special kids. And I would really like you to support this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Just a fantastic job today with over 100 speakers. So we're now going to turn to Vice President Ellen Berg. She has some suggestions for the motion maker for this referral. You're muted. Thank you. There you go. Toggling back and forth here. Um, I want to thank Supervisor Chavez very much for your leadership here for this, this referral. I think that this is really critical work and it was actually a surprising gap in our county services. I also really appreciate the public engagement in the scoping of the office. Um, I really think it will be a welcome addition to the policy and coordination focused offices in the Division of Equity and Social Justice, both in how they work across county services and with external partners and in recognition of the intersectionality of serving diverse members of our community. Uh, when administration comes back with the report, if this works for the maker of the motion, I would like to have a summary of which departments or programs and external organizations would be key to engage with in the development of a work plan for this office. Some that came to my mind for me that are not directly referenced in the referral include in-home supportive services, California children's services, and parks, including in relation to the inclusive uh, playground program. And finally, in thinking about my roles at PSJC and CFSC, I'd like for this office to help us explore areas where people with disabilities are more likely to be represented in county services. It's my understanding from partners that children with disabilities are overrepresented in the child welfare system. People with disabilities are more likely to be victims of crime and those with intellectual or developmental disabilities in particular may be at risk for problematic interactions with law enforcement or security personnel. I'm really glad to support the formation of this office. I look forward to future recommendations that can improve equity, access, and inclusion for our residents. And I hope that uh, my friendly amendment is acceptable. It is, and I actually don't even think that's really uh, much of an amendment. I, I think that's a part of their work, but what I, so yes, for sure. I, I do really appreciate you bringing up um, in particular IHS that, that, that is a, that's a really smart point that I hadn't even yet uh, included, but thank you for that, Susan, no problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Vice President. We'll do Supervisor Lee, then Supervisor Smitty, and then we'll take a vote. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, I just want to give a special thank you to Supervisor Chavez for bringing forth this referral to establish the Office of Disability Affairs. As a newest member of the board, um, I am actually quite surprised that this, ha this hasn't been established yet for all these years, and it's um, almost feel like long overdue, as we could hear from the comments from the uh, public today. And I certainly will commit to work towards a more inclusive and accessible county, uh, especially given the fact that the uh, demographics of our uh, county is changing and that uh, certainly more uh, uh, aged uh, seniors will be, uh, will, be, will be around. And I think the need for, for the services is so uh, much uh, so dire. 
So I'm truly excited to bring attention to supporting the people with disabilities and generally look forward to the future work of this office. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Simeon. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, indicate my support and also ask that the report back specifically reference as Supervisor Ellenberg did the um, all-inclusive playground effort that we've already undertaken and also the funding uh, that we have committed to and spent some of uh, for uh, housing for people with uh, developmental disabilities. I, I just want to make sure that that's um, thought through and incorporated in the discussion about who will be responsible for what uh, as we go forward in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. And after the motion was made and the second was made, I expressed my um, support for this as well. And I look forward to the information coming back to us as to what we can do. No more speakers, no more Supervisor Simidian, your hand is still up. My apologies, my hand is now down. Nope, no problem <laughs> and also, at all. I'll, I'm happy Thank to you. include um, the the comments from both um, Supervisor Ellenberg and uh, Supervisor Simidian. Those are very thoughtful, both very helpful. And I thank do you. just want to say a very special um, thank you to everybody who came and spoke and everybody who spoke at the community meeting and, and our triumvirate of folks who helped craft the, uh, the referral. Thank you all very, very much. Wonderful. I have a feeling we'll send this referral forward unanimously. <laughs> Jess, a, a, a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Savidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Item 15 was done on consent. We have uh, one, two, three referrals ahead of four referrals ahead of us. We'll start with number 16. And again, for the public referrals are simply uh, asking administration to look at this and report back. There is no action. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, number 16 is yours. Thank you. I'm bringing this uh, referral forward to request that administration come back in August with the funding to support the Health Equity Agenda Project as proposed by a group of our community partners. The referral and the attached proposal describe the structure of the project that's been formulated by the Health Trust Working Partnership, the Santa Clara Family Health Plan, and our behavioral health contractors. In order to respond to COVID-19, my office and the administration have been able to work more closely with these organizations and other more and other CBOs more than ever, and our other CBOs. Um, just last night, I, I met um, as I do regularly with Dolores and the CEOs of the community health clinics to strategize about vaccination and recovery and how we can be thinking about um, just the next phase even of vaccinations with children. Uh, the proposal will apply a data-driven approach to identifying and addressing health disparities among the most impacted. Better health outcomes help all of us, not only improving the quality of life for our communities, but also financially given the structure of the whole person care and the avoidance of more expensive hospitalizations and ED visits when we deliver effective preventative care. And with that, I will make a motion. Thank you. And I'll look to Supervisor, Vice President, and Seconder de Jure. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, again, thank you, Supervisor Chavez uh, and all of the partners for this referral. I'm glad to support it with, a, a again, a brief friendly amendment, but I want to start with just a couple of observations. The first phase um, that's outlined in the, in the attached work plan really falls squarely within the core responsibilities of our public health department which include to monitor and assess population health, including health disparities. And our, our public health department has both excellent capacity and a strong history in this area with robust health assessments produced in partnership with community over many years. An important place for growth and one where our external partners, I think could play a very critical role is translating the data into these in these reports into policy change, which is ultimately exactly what I believe uh, they're trying to achieve. Health equity is clearly an area that warrants more intention, funding, and policy action. This is why Supervisor Samidi and I led, with all of your support, the creation of the Race and Health Community Disparities Board to explore and prioritize these issues for our health system. Again, public health is core to county responsibility, 
I want to see work that not only utilizes our funds, but benefits from our experience and capacity. This is an opportunity for a really strong public-private partnership, and I'm excited to see real impact, policy change that leads to improved health outcomes and greater equity. The work is important, and it's also important that it be strategic and coordinated. So with all of that, uh, what I would like to propose um, com that uh, comes back to the board as part of the report back is that partners in administration discuss roles and contributions by the county to present in the report back, including roles for county staff in public health, the Race and Health Disparities Community Board, and other key county staff from HHS or, or um, the Division of Social Justice and Equity in the development or implementation of the work plan for this initiative. And in addition to funding, I would ask that the report consider models of in-kind support from public health, particularly in data analysis on health indicators, because that department already has access to numerous countywide data sets and staff experienced in their analysis that can be leveraged for this work. And specifically, one in-kind support that might be considered is adding a dedicated full-time epidemiologist to support the work with community health partners which would still, with CHP would still remain as the convener and backbone support for the development of the agenda overall, rather than hiring new staff or consultants under CHP to conduct the data analysis. Supervisor Chavez, does that um, work for you? What's that? Well, so let me just that? say, yeah, what I what I would recommend is, I think those are, are really good ideas that should be discussed with the the primary proposers, because I think you're right that there's some, you know, we don't want to, what one, we obviously don't want to waste money. And two, we do have some incredible expertise within our own organization. I do um, want to make sure that the, um, the linkages are really well thought through by all parties and have a chance. So I, I think that would be good for discussion prior to it coming back. I wouldn't want to pre predispose how those discussion goes because of the folks who created the process um, should just engage. So I think those are great ideas that should be explored. Great, thank you. All right, super, no, no. All right, we've got a motion, we have a second. We have two members of the public that would like to speak. Jess, will you please allow them in for a minute each? Absolutely, our first speaker will be Alma. Alma, I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hello, my name is Alma Burrell and I'm here representing the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet and Roots Community Health Center. The desire by five agencies to create an equity agenda for the county is much needed and very appreciated. But my comments are related to the process the agencies have taken in the initial developmental phase. We are disappointed that the African African ancestry community is mentioned, but not included in the initial development of the agenda. In fact, we were totally unaware of its existence or development until a few days ago. I understand that the intent to include the affected co communities further is, is expected to include the affected communities further in the developmental phase, but I, I, we believe that that will be too late. The community should be at the table at the inception of the intervention plan. This is why too often our interventions do not work. This puts us on the table and not at the table. And when this happens, um, community. Our next speaker is Michelle Liu. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. This is Michelle Liu, CEO of the Health Trust. Rather than recreate any wheels, this health equity project is intended to build upon existing data already collected, as well as initiatives already underway. You and we have both seen many, many more groups are now interested in health equity, which is great. Now we wanna make sure we're coordinating efforts and collectively addressing health disparities. In partnership with the public health department and trusted partners like Roots Community Health Center, we wanna make sure we do our due diligence to ensure we're gathering the right data in ways that don't always require a PhD in data analytics. And we wanna support solutions and measure our progress. This project as proposed will incorporate social determinants of health 
and we hope to move quickly to solutions to build health equity. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Next speaker is Elisa Kofkinsborg. Please go ahead. Elisa, you'll have to click once to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I just uh, just did that. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Elisa Kof Ginsburg of the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. We've come together as organizations that all focus on different facets of health. We're all keenly aware of existing health disparities in each of these areas. In regard to behavioral health, a county indicator is does not exist. What exists is what we know about those served through the Medi-Cal program, as well as survey responses that have been done um, for very specific populations. This will explore how we can look at this more comprehensively, as well as tie it to the social determinants of health that you just heard about. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tyler Haskell. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Mr. President, members of the board. This is Tyler Haskell from Santa Clara Family Health Plan. Um, here in support of the referral, we appreciate Supervisor Chavez for, um, for proposing it. You know, our, our goal the, was to create a sort of solutions-oriented framework for building health equity. And I think we've tried to do that by incorporating some of the major elements of, of you know, what you would expect in a, in a sort of region-wide effort, um, including establishing measuring parameters and baseline data, making recommendations and identifying root causes. And of course, some of us you know, have access to the levers of change necessary to make progress on reducing those disparities. Um, so, so we're looking forward to getting to work. I'm here to, um, happy to answer any questions that come up and I think I'll give you back some of your time. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you, Jess. All right, we have a motion and a second. Supervisor Allenberg, your hand is still up. Did you wish to add on before I recognize Supervisor Smidian? Nope, your hand is gone. All right, Supervisor Smidian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't, uh, I'm supportive of the measure. I certainly don't want to delay it. I see it's got an August report back uh, in the um, recommended action. We do have a health and hospital committee meeting on the 25th. I don't know if Supervisor Chavez would like to see it come through the committee for some discussion. That might mean that if it was heard at our second meeting in August, that uh, we were a little bit better prepared to move then rather than raise questions for the first time. Uh, if on the other hand, she thinks that's a delay, I'm prepared to accommodate the proposer's uh, uh, desire. Supervisor Chavez. Um, yeah, I think that would be really, really great if you'd be willing right. to hear it, Supervisor Sumidian. And um, and one thing I do want to just, if it's okay, I'd like to respond um, to uh, Ms. Burrell, uh, Ms. Burrell's points about um, being inclusive of the entire community. And that is that I would also just ask staff to include um, the Roots Clinic. I know that the that Alma serves on the Santa Clara Family Health Plan Board, so they're, they're a partner, and that we have a lot of different organizations through the um, the uh, behavioral health um, uh, association that's also partnering on this. So I think including, I think behavioral health roots is in that, uh, but if they're not, if we could just make sure to the staff and the proposers that, that they're included would be ideal. Thank you. Thank you. And Supervisor Smidian nodded his head. So that was approval. We have no more speakers. I'm gonna to turn to Jess before that changes. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President w Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you, Jess. 17 and 18 were handled on consent. We now turn to a referral by Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Lee, you are muted. Yes, I sure was. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank both the Honorable Judge uh, Catherine Lucero and Chief of Probation Laura Garnett for working with me and my office and putting together this referral. 
regarding the options for consideration relating to providing temporary housing solutions for justice-involved girls and gender-extensive youth. I would also like to thank the Bear Institute of Justice, providing us with the research that helped inform the referral and its recommendations. As noted in this referral, housing instability in the family, concern over the youth's personal safety, or conflict within the family often serves as a barrier for justice-involved girls and gender-expensive youth in being able to return to their home after being released from the juvenile hall. So the purpose of this referral is for staff to provide the board with options for establishing temporary housing solutions for the youth who are released from the hall while longer-term residential solutions are identified. Gotcha. As part of the report back to the board, I would also like for staff to consider a conducting an inventory of existing residential solutions available to systems impacted youth along with information on the current level of funding and any proposed funding to address the infrastructure gap needs, information on one-time and ongoing costs associated with establishing a new temporary residential solution, which account for staffing and operational costs and recommendations on whether to contract with an outside provider. In particular, I would like staff to look at the Young Women's Freedom Center as a potential model to look at. And critical to the success of this initiative is ensuring that gender responsive programming is made available to youth during and after long-term housing solution has been secured. Lastly, I would like our county council to work collaboratively with the Vera Institute on accessing any legal regulations and licensing requirements that would be needed to be taken into consideration when establishing a temporary residence to house the youth. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Oh, I'm kidding. Supervisor Ellenberg, did you wish to speak? Yes, go right ahead. Yes, thank you. I'm glad to uh, second the motion. I want to thank Supervisor Lee for introducing the referral. I, I think this marks an important step the county is taking to significantly reduce the incarceration of young people in our county um, and instead create alternate pathways that empower them to pursue their, their dreams for the future. Uh, I do have a couple of questions and hope to add some, um, some additional elements to the uh, referral that will build upon the spirit of the item, if that's acceptable to the maker of the motion. Of I'm really I'm really interested in exploring best practices for supporting girls and gender expansive youth as they lead the as they leave the carceral system, which may include identifying safe supportive lodging as alternatives to spending more time in jail. Given that group homes are no longer permissible as a result of AP 403 and temporary residential treatment centers maybe the option that is most akin to a group home, it'll be really important to understand whether the girls and gender expansive youth need that level of care or if what they really need are safe community-based options with support from caring adults, including those with similar lived experiences who are able to rebuild their lives in productive ways following their experiences in a carceral system. And I hope that this report can take into account the breadth of sources that may keep a young person out of uh, out of carceral settings. This very well may include temporary housing, but we also have to hold housing with just as much weight as other factors such as uh, safe and comfortable uh, educational opportunities, mental health care, supportive interpersonal relationships with peers and adults, uh, and more. With the goal of eliminating incarceration amongst girls and gender expansive youth and preventing it from happening down the road, we can't rely, of course, on temporary housing as a as a sole solution. So I really would like us to explore all options that can be made available to ensure that young people uh, don't end up back in the system. So what I would like to ask as a, a friendly amendment is if the report back from administration could consider both best practices for alternative housing and residence models for young people leaving the, the uh, justice system and community-based solutions that don't require capital development. Supervisor Lee? Yes, definitely. Uh, very much appreciate the uh, thoughtful uh, suggestions and uh, certainly accept the uh, amendment. 
Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Uh, thank you. Um, I so thank you also, um, Supervisor Lee, for thinking about these really underserved uh, young people. So thanks so much. Um, a couple of requests that I would like to make is that, especially as it relates to housing, we have a referral that's somewhere in the process that's focused on commercially sexually exploited children um, and children who are at risk for being exploited. And as and I think it might have come in, come out of our human trafficking uh, commission recommendations that came out in early December. So what I wanted to make sure of is that the staff aligned the the CSEC work and the the referrals that came out of human trafficking, so we we can align this work better and not maybe not have the staff do multiple reports. So if there's an opportunity for the staff to merge them, I would appreciate that. Um, and then the other is that. You know, in particular, as it relates to housing, um, we had asked that they come, that the staff start coming back with quarterly reports to children's families and seniors specifically to look at the housing piece. And so, again, I just want to make sure those reports are all aligned so that staff is not, um, you know, not maybe not doing double time. And then, um, Supervisor Lee, the only other thing I'd like to request is that we also have staff work with the um, South Bay Coalition to End Human Trafficking because they have they have a working group that's been taking a look at housing and I think it speaks to the point that Supervisor Ellenberg raised about you know the interim versus longer term uh, you know options and and frankly there's not enough of anything so I think being able to better explore that you know explore it as a continuum given the changes in state laws is probably the the best way we could go but um, but anyway I'm very excited about this thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. And Jess, if you'll please allow our two speakers to speak on this item. Thank you for one minute. Yes. Our first speaker will be Sparky Harlan. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, this is Sparky Harlan, Bill Wilson Center. We have spent a lot of time focusing on the five to 10 girls that are in juvenile hall, but I want to remind us that the overwhelming number in juvenile hall locked up for long-term are young men. So I would urge you as you look at the young women, also look at options for the young men who could also be served in the community. And number one reason that a lot of these young women and men are locked up in juvenile hall and don't have options is their families need housing. So what you need to do is look at the entire family look at the housing options for their parents and realize that's often the number one option. Bill Wilson Center is really the only residential option right now besides foster care that can legally take these young people. But we think family housing is often the answer. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annalisa Ruiz. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Annalisa Ruiz. I'm the program manager at Young Women's Freedom Center. I'm calling in strong support of line, line item 19. Over the last two years, I specifically have worked one-on-one -on -one with young women and gender expansive youth who are system involved. While housing is not a new issue here in, in our county, I wanna point out that now more than ever, it is important that we create housing so solutions which allow young people to live safe and free from the trauma they experienced in these institutions. During the last year, I've met with those in custody weekly. We've seen uh, the lowest incarceration rates for girls in our county, most of the time only about one to three in custody at a time. While this is a great accomplishment and stride towards in ending incarceration of girls, trans, and gender nonconforming youth in our county, I've unfortunately seen the same pattern of girls being stuck in custody most of the time alone because of lack of housing resources. As we know, isolation is extremely detrimental to young people. They're forced to stay for weeks at a time or sent out of county placements and treatment facilities tailored to very specific needs they don't have. I'm urging you to support this referral and look forward to future collaboration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hannah Green. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Green and I'm with the Vera Institute of Justice's initiative to end girls incarceration. And I wanna speak in support of the referral. We've been providing no cost technical assistance to Santa Clara County since 2019. 
And as Supervisor Lee mentioned, our recently completed diagnostic assessment found that the overwhelming majority of girls in juvenile hall had experienced housing instability prior to their justice involvement, and that these experiences often played a direct role in decisions to confine them. So with that in mind, we've been working closely with community leaders, system leaders, directly impacted young people and the Young Women's Freedom Center to develop a set of recommendations to fill system gaps that are most directly contributing to girls' confinement. And one piece of that includes expanding community-based temporary housing options for girls so that juvenile hall is never used in that way. And we stand ready to provide support to the administration in partnership with CBOs and young people leading this work in the community to complete this report. And we hope that the county will move quickly towards implementing the recommendations and addressing the known gaps in the system. Thanks so much. Our next speaker is Viviana Morales. Please go ahead. Viviana, you'll have to click once. Sorry, I unmuted you. Try one more time. You'll have to click to unmute yourself. There we go. Okay. Hi, my name is Viviana Morales. I am a community org organizer at Yellow's Freedom Center. I'm calling in regards to line item 19. Our community, specifically justice, involved girls and gender expansive youth are in desperate need of housing solutions. I am asking the board to please approve the request for housing solutions because, you know, I don't believe women should be incarcerated a young woman especially just because they don't have a safe place to go and stuff including myself i had to go through that and um it's just it's not it's not in the best entrance i was incarcerated myself so yeah thank you thank you and that concludes our request thank you and i don't have any supervisors with their hands up Supervisor Lee, you made the motion, if I recall correctly, be Supervisor Ellenberg that likely made the second. Is that correct? Yep, thank you. Any further comment? Seeing none. Jess, a roll call vote on number 19, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. And we'll come back to Supervisor Smitty. And thank you. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. 20 is coming back in August, just like us. And uh, 21, we move on to now. This looks like a very well written referral. Um, Supervisor Smitty, do you want to open up? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, just a little bit of background on this proposal for farm worker housing. Uh, the recommended action, as you can see, is at this point simply referral to administration to come back to our Hewlett committee in September with options for building farm labor housing in the South County District 1 Supervisor Wasserman's district. So I appreciate uh, his uh, participation as a co-sponsor. I uh, couldn't help but notice when I uh, rolled out of bed this morning, grabbed the morning paper, there it was in the front page, Bay Area Lags and Housing for Workforce. And sure enough, that's what this is about. Uh, we have been implored over the years by folks uh, in the ag industry to help them survive if we want the, them to stay in ag. Uh, we have been similarly implored by folks in the environmental community to make sure that the ag industry is viable in South County as a means to protect open space and working lands. All of that, of course, requires a farm labor workforce, uh, and a farm labor workforce requires a farm labor housing supply, which we do not have in sufficient quantity. So that's the reason for the recommended action. Two quick notes, and then I'll simply make the motion and ask for a second from Supervisor Wasserman. The first is, um, Part of what prompted me to approach Supervisor Wasserman was the fact that I actually worked on a project like this during my time in the private sector many years ago in South San Mateo County. And the project that I worked on all those years ago, uh, or at least began the work on, uh, today is uh, 160 units of affordable farm labor housing with hundreds of farm workers and their families members uh, as the beneficiaries. And it has played a key role in uh, supporting the ag industry in South San Mateo County. I was recalling and recounting this recently when I was on a Zoom call with second and third graders from Barron Park Elementary School in Palo Alto. 
And as I observed to my uh, office after the session was over, it's the first time I'd ever been confronted by a spreadsheet from a third grader that detailed the income and expenditures of a farm worker and indicated rather clearly that the income and expenditures simply didn't match up, particularly in the area of housing. As I recounted what we had been doing in Santa Clara County and then recalled uh, the effort in South San Mateo County all those years ago that I was part of, it occurred to me in that moment, you know what, we ought to give it a try in Santa Clara County. I think we can do it. Uh, it will take time, it will take energy, and yes, it will take resources, but I would respectfully ask for uh, an aye vote, and I move the recommended action. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, colleagues. Thank you, and I'm happy to uh, second the referral, full disclosure. I printed that newspaper, left it on your front, front stoop. Supervisor Chavez. That's awesome, the paper boy. Um, I, so I think this is wonderful. One, one um, just uh, two, two recommendations that I would want to make. One is that we just completed the, um, the uh, Homeless Housing Task Force um, a, couple, a couple weeks ago. And one of the interesting comments, and really this came from the city of Gilroy, um, Supervisor Wasserman, was a high level of interest in looking at um, housing options relative to Measure A. And, you know, based on the, and I didn't realize the gap was 700 permanent housing uh, units that are necessary for that area. That's a lot more than I recalled. Um, but in any case, I think Gilroy would be very interested in being uh, reached out to on this particular topic, uh, particularly around, um, well, anyway, I, I'm very interested in the permanent housing, obviously. But the second issue that I would just raise, it also came up, um, was the idea that um, to, to take a look at where there was, you know, chunks of, of public property that are contiguous to the, um, the um, farmlands out there as well. So I just wanted to mention that because there seemed to be, there was an impression that there, that we had land actually, that the county had land and also that some of the cities do that isn't being utilized and in part because of where it's located. So anyway, I just say that because I think that might be another way to reach out to Gilroy in particular. Thank you. We will definitely reach out to Gilroy and any communities um, that uh, could be impacted um, that might want to speak up. We will definitely do that. Any other comments? And let me check here, Jess. My guess is we don't have any speakers. That's correct. No, we do not. Okay, we've got a motion by Simidian, a second by Wasserman for this referral for gathering information and, uh, and and bringing it back. And yes, Hewlett is where it is headed, where Supervisor Smitty and I are proud to serve. With that, a roll call vote, please, Jess. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. With that, we'll move on to item number 22. Again, a referral by Smidian and Lee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. What I'd like to do to begin is simply move the recommended action as contained in our referral and ask uh, if Supervisor Lee is amenable for a second and then explain what we're about. So I will move the recommended action. Supervisor yeah. Lee? Yes, yes happy to yes. second and agreed, yes. Thank you. And Thank Supervisor you. Smidian, before you continue, Jess, are the two speakers regarding item 21 or are they regarding this item? I believe they're for the item that we've just started. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Please continue, Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wasserman. As uh, colleagues will recall, uh, the Lehigh uh, cement plant quarry is uh, significant land use in the fifth supervisorial district, which I represent. Uh, and uh, you may not recall that the ridge line uh, there, uh, sort of at the top of the quarry lands, is protected by an easement held by our county, which has been in place since 1972. It was um, conveyed by a predecessor owner uh, back in 1972. So it's almost been 50 years. Uh, we have a reason to know by an easement held by our Apologies, that's been taken care of. Not sure what, not sure what that was, I, but I, it was. You're okay now. Thank you. I was obliged to listen to myself. There you go. Uh, <laughs> so sorry. the the uh, 
The easement has uh, protected that ridge line for almost 50 years. Uh, the easement continues to be held by our county, but uh, as I suspect all board members will recall, we currently have a proposal from the quarry owner and operator to uh, compromise the easement, uh, and that has been formalized in their application for a, an amendment to their reclamation plan. Uh, that has prompted some conversation uh, in uh, local circles about how we can ensure that that ridge line and the view shed and the both aesthetic and economic balance attached to that view, as well as the habitat is protected and that the uh, easement, which was conveyed in perpetuity, meaning forever, uh, stays uh, intact. And one of the ways that we might do that is to share our enforcement authority with uh, another party. In this case, the proposal is the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, with whom we have worked cooperatively and collaboratively in the past, uh, including in this area, at the Rancho uh, site there. Uh, and the I should be very explicit and clear about this. The proposal is for a sharing of enforcement authority. So the county would maintain uh, possession of the easement, would maintain uh, enforcement authority in its own right, obviously, uh, but uh, MidPen would also then have the right of enforcement. Uh, and in this way, provide a double measure of protection. I call it a belt and suspenders approach to make sure that if on any given day there was a push on us to uh, in some ways uh, give away the store on the easement, that we'd have MidPen there. Uh, and if MidPen ever uh, got lax in its assertion of the authority, we would be there to make sure that uh, the easement stayed intact and that the ridge line stayed intact. Uh, I have been really heartened by the level of uh, support that we have received uh, so quickly. Uh, we have letters of support, which I hope are in your packets, virtual or otherwise, from the city of Cupertino, the city of Los Altos, uh, the town of Los Altos Hills, uh, also from uh, friends in labor, including op operating engineers, Local 3 and Teamsters Local 853. Uh, in the environmental community, uh, the Green Foothills and the Sierra Club, but a half a dozen others as well, including Mothers Out Front, the Audubon Society, the Moekma Ohlone uh, Tribe, Greenbelt Alliance, the Clean Creeks Coalition, Santa Clara Valley Native Plant uh, Society, and Grassroots Ecology, as well as uh, Bay Area for Cleaner Environment. So I will stop there. If there are questions, uh, I am happy to address them. I want to thank a Supervisor uh, Lee, again, for being the seconder, but uh, this really is the way to put down a marker that says, no, the ridge line stays, and we expect the easement to be honored as it has been for 50 years and should be for uh, uh, the rest of uh, its life, which is in perpetuity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So we've got, again, this is a referral. We've got a motion and a second. Jess, we have five speakers. Will you allow them one minute each? Absolutely. Our first speaker is Brian Schmidt. I've unmuted you, you'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good afternoon, Brian Schmidt for Green Foothills. Our organization, along with a number of others, submitted a letter supporting the referral by Supervisor Simidian and Lee. Uh, the simple message that I will steal from Supervisor Simidian is this, don't chop the top. So this area needs to be protected. It is, it is very important. Uh, we've been concerned about it for many years. Green Foothills yesterday submitted a supplemental letter with an advertisement from the quarry owners that we've been saving for 48 years. And in this advertisement, they uh, announced how important it was that they were protecting that easement, keeping it above uh, the ridgeline above the level, which they now wish to go down below. It is all the more important then that uh, the easement be enforced and be shared. So we very much support, support this referral. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Del Campare. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hello, this is Karen Del Campare. Can, um, I just wanted to say that I also support the proposal. We need to do whatever we can to protect the easement. Lee's High has had multiple, multiple violations in the past and they haven't always been addressed adequately. So whatever can be done to make sure that enforcement is you know, a strong commitment for our future of the easement should be done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yokiro Kishimoto. 
I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Eureka. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President and, and Honorable Mem uh, Board of Su Supervisors. My name is uh, Yoriko Kishimoto, and I serve on the board of the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, and I chair our Lehigh Ad Hoc Committee, which was formed specifically to review this 2019 Reclamation Plan amendment, amendment. So we would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for considering this partnership to defend the Ridgeline easement, our specialized mission to preserve and manage our Greenbelt in perpetuity makes MidPan uniquely suited to partner with the county. Together, we can better protect Rancho San Antonio's critical habitats and the quality of environment in perpetuity for all as promised to county, county residents back in 1972. Thank you, Supervisor Smidian and Lee for bringing this forward and to our partners in supporting this. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Shawnee, please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. My name is Shani Kleinhaus. I'm the environmental advocate for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Our organization is based in Cupertino. And for many years, we have been watching Lehigh's activity and associated environmental impacts with great concern. We speak today to ask you to approve Supervisor Simitian and Lee's referral to County Council and start discussions with MidPen regarding a grant of enforcement rights associated with the county's 1972 Ridgeline Protection Easement. The Santa Cruz Mountains recognizes the world by your diversity hotspot and our home to some of the most threatened species in our area, including mountain lions, bobcats, California red-legged frog, and a great diversity of birds and mammals. Saving the Ridgeline will protect them as well. Please have, help ensure that the ridge line will be protected, protected for open space and conservation value and to protect the community. Thank you. Our next speaker, speaker is Linda Sell. I'm unmuting you. Please go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Linda Sell and I'm speaking on behalf of Bay Area for Clean Environment. I speak today in support of this item please take the necessary action to ensure better enforcement over our county's ridgeline easement on the Lehigh uh, cement plant quarry um, to protect the Rancho San Antonio Park and preserve um, this partnership between uh, MidPan and the county is key. Um, in January uh, 2020, Bay Area uh, for Clean Environment collected uh, group letter that was sent to the county um, with over a hundred environmental advocates um, also voicing support for protection of this uh, ridge line for the community to protect the scenic views. And um, so we hope that you take action on this swiftly to work with MidPen. Thank you so much for bringing our next speaker is Juliana Pendleton. I've unmuted you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, this is Juliana Pendleton, Environmental Advocacy Assistant for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. I would like to echo all the previous uh, public comments and voice my own support for the proposed referral. And I also support working with the MidPen uh, to help, help with the enforcement of the easement and protect our environment and Rancho San Antonio Park. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rhoda Fry. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Shared enforcement with MidPen is a safeguard for weak links. When Lehigh published its plan over two years ago, I was shocked to learn that our permanent 1972 Ridgeline easement deed could be overturned by three supervisors. In 1985, county staff was okay with Supervisory League and voting on Hill increasing hillside housing density, even though he was simultaneously employed by the quarry, which owns 3,500 acres in 1992, the quarry announced 20 years of limestone remaining and unveiled a grand plan to build an 1,100 home housing development. Between 2000 and 2003, the county failed to perform any quarry inspections. And after inadequate inspections and lack enforcement in 2005, the State Mining and Geology Board initiated terminating the county's oversight of mines. Fortunately, the leadership 
of the planning department is now in the capable hands of Jacqueline Anciano. Moving forward, sharing enforcement with your authority with mid pen to safeguard our easement is a no bringer. Many hands make light work. Vote yes. That concludes our request. I just unmuted. Thank you very much, Jess. Supervisor Simidian uh, motion, Supervisor Lee is second. We've heard from the public. I see no other hands raised except for Supervisor Simidian and Supervisor Lee's hand. Supervisor Simidian. The only thing I wanted to add to the uh, motion, Mr. Chair, is uh, um, an observation that I know we received uh, communication from Lehigh uh, raising uh, questions and concerns. Uh, they take a different view of the matter, as you might suspect. Um, I, I do think it was telling that the letter acknowledged the fact that they had a proposal pending to, quote, modify the ridge line, which is another way for saying not honor the easement, uh, however euphemistically. They did take some exception, I gather, to uh, the calculation of just how significant the proposal would be. I, I think um, I have two observations about that. Uh, the first is, uh, just so my colleagues know, the information came from our county planning department, but as part of the motion, I'll ask the county staff to come back when they do with language uh, that uh, they can present to us as a more precise calculation of the impact in the proposal. Having said that, I'm not really sure that what's in the proposal is the, the key factor, whether it's uh, 5 million cubic yards or 15 million cubic yards or some greater number, uh, the bottom line here is there's a threshold question, which is do we expect the easement to be honored? And I'm looking at the easement language itself, which says this easement is granted to the County of Santa Clara, its successors and assigns forever. This grant shall be binding upon the successors and assigns of the grantor. Uh, what that says is forever, which is a very long time and longer than 50 years. And what it also says is that the easement is granted to the county, its successors and assigns. And what we're trying to do is consistent with the acknowledgement in the easement that uh, protection might also be shared with successors and assigns. In this case, it would be signing, assigning a portion of the enforcement authority to mid pen uh, if we move forward today. So. I do think it'd be helpful and important to get uh, the most up-to-date and accurate information we can from staff, and I'm going to put that in the motion. But I also think that uh, to some extent, uh, it is um, not a determinative factor. The question is, do we or do we not want to make sure that that ridge line is protected with an extra incre increment, a second set of uh, protectors? And I hope the answer today is yes. Thank you very much. Seems to be. Supervisor Lee, you are next, and Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, uh, uh, Supervisor Sumidian, for uh, inviting me to uh, join you on this important referral. Um, the he these hillsides at Lehigh are far greater than just the 20 acres we are seeking to protect. They are certainly a regional asset, and we need to take action. The quarry currently sits less than a quarter mile away from hikers on Rancho San Antonio in the Stephen Street County Park. And protecting public lands can be a challenge for multiple agencies involved. And I want to make sure we are highlighting the collaborative effort from all across the community to move this forward. We are certainly stronger when we work together, especially when we have this opportunity to help save our environment right here locally. We already have a cl climate crisis in our hands, and we must invest in green solutions that are sustainable. Extending this project decades beyond the agreed time will only cause further damage to our environment for many years to come. And for those reasons and many uh, that's been already uh, iterated by many of our partners, I urge everyone, uh, all my colleagues to support this referral. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, this is just a very quick um, request to the maker and the seconder of the motion. Um, I, I just would want to better understand the implications of the actions, even maybe relative to the counties. Um, responsibility and whether or not the um, the oversight actions also create options for civil civil actions versus uh, you know us taking a government action 
an, another organization like a nonprofit having different rights than maybe we do under, like if you had to take action. I just don't know enough about that, but I'd really like to when it comes back. So I'm supportive of the motion, just want to better understand those areas. Thank you. Thank you. And I am uh, in favor, as it says in the referral, agreeable, let's see, last part and says, should the discussion result in a mutually agreeable grant of enforcement rights? And I am certainly there. I will be supporting the motion. With that said, I'm sorry, somebody, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you. I just wanted to incorporate Supervisor Chavez's request into the motion so that it's a matter of record. I think what uh, if I can uh, correctly rephrase or paraphrase, uh, and I'll look to Supervisor Chavez to confirm, um, uh, what we're asking County Council for is uh, a report back uh, with some clarity as to who then has what rights uh, with respect to uh, enforcement and or obligations, if any. Is that a fair summary, Supervisor Chavez? That is. Thank you for clearing that thank up. You. Yes. No, no. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it's an issue we've looked at, but I think it would be helpful and important for the entire board to hear either uh, uh, on the record at the board or if some of that needs to be in a confidential uh, attorney client document, I will certainly understand that, but either way. Perfect, thank you. And regrettable, unfortunate, and disappointing if it weren't. <laughs> All right, Jess, roll call, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Wasserman? I'm sorry, Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President She'll get Wasserman. her turn, just not her. <laughs> Wasserman, it, yes. Thank you. It's only June. Thank you. Exactly. All right. With that, we move on to item number 23. Uh, considerations, recommendations regarding sexual assault forensic exam services brought forth by Supervisor Simidian. Supervisor Simidian, please lead off. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move the recommended action as a starting point. If there is a second, I'll then speak to the recommended action. I'll second. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Supervisor. Um, colleagues, you will perhaps recall that at our last meeting in May, we had a member of the community that uh, spoke to concerns about the operation of the uh, safe uh, services, uh, the sexual assault forensic exam services. Uh, that the county was conducting uh, in uh, the Stanford Hospital facility uh, on the Stanford campus. Um, and then uh, subsequently, uh, my office, and I suspect others uh, perhaps as well, uh, received a series of written communications uh, from uh, students on the campus uh, and from uh, Professor Dauber on the campus, raising a number of questions and concerns. Uh, in the aftermath of receiving that information, um, my office and I reached out. I had a chance to talk with uh, Dr. Smith about all this on two occasions, chance to talk with um, uh, Mr. Lorenz uh, somewhat extensively, uh, chance to talk with David Entwistle, the president and CEO of Stanford, to get his initial take as well. Uh, uh, have spoken to uh, Ms. Dauber, uh, who uh, brought the initial uh, concern uh, to us as well, and um, have also spoken to um, Cheryl Soloff from uh, the Harvey Rose organization, uh, with whom we are all familiar. Uh, my uh, best assessment of how to do what I think we are all very clear we want to do, which is make sure we have the very best services available in place whenever and wherever they are needed by survivors, uh, is to take the four steps that are in the recommended action. And thank you to Supervisor Lee for the second. Um, in an effort to make sure that we did not delay taking any immediate action that might be advisable, you will see that the recommended action D uh, directs administration to take immediate steps as deemed appropriate to correct any identified deficiencies and or improve the provision of services considered with identified best practices. So that's uh, my best effort to say, hey, if there's something to do, let's do it, and let's do it now. Uh, that being said, uh, I thought we would be well served by hearing more about uh, the views of our professional staff on the situation, not just at this site, but at, at VMC as well, and with respect to plans for the South County. Uh, so uh, there is also a recommendation here, recommended action, 
that would um, refer the item to administration to report to our health and hospital committee on June the 30th uh, coming up uh, here in just eight days so that we could have a thorough and public uh, conversation about the state of affairs in all three uh, venues that I just described. Uh, longer term, uh, I do think it's important to uh, reach out to and through uh, the Harvey Rose uh, Associates organization. And I specifically thought it would be useful for them to take uh, a look because they are uh, under contract to our board of supervisors. As you all know, they do not report up to or through the uh, organizational chain of command. They are as independent as uh, can be under these circumstances. And I think they would bring a fresh set of eyes and an auditing uh, perspective to uh, considering uh, the services again at all three uh, sites, both uh, whatever is in place and or whatever is um, uh, in the planning stages. And then finally, a referral to the Commission on the Status of Women. And yes, I do know that uh, not all uh, survivors are uh, women, but I certainly think that our Commission on the Status of Women uh, would be well aware of and sensitive to the concerns that we're trying to address here. And we know that the overwhelming majority of the survivors are in fact women. Uh, I think this is the best way to uh, both make uh, immediate progress where it can and should be made and also to take a, a broader and more systemic look to see what the state of affairs is and what we should be doing. I do expect that if we uh, prove the item today that we'll uh, be formally uh, inviting the folks at Stanford Hospital to participate. My understanding is that they have a written response in the making. I have not yet seen it, but I believe it is coming. And with that, I will say thank you and ask for an aye vote, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. We've got the motion. We have the second, Supervisor Chavez, and then we'll hear we have one member from the public to speak afterwards. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to say I'm going to be supporting the motion. And um, I wanted to highlight just for my colleagues and members of the public some of the history of the work that's being done um, in this area. And my reason for that is that I wanted to um, ask when this comes back to Health and Hospital that the staff actually do a, um, a robust presentation of where we are in all of the different processes that are going forward, because I think it may help shape Supervisor Submitian and the um, uh, the work of Harvey Rose, because I, I, I do think that the questions you're asking are very expansive and there's some urgency to getting some of the questions answered deliberately and quickly, um, you know, as part of the issues that have concern that you've raised. So, um, so really, and under the leadership of the entire board, we have expanded um, our services countywide. And I, I just want to highlight Supervisor Simidian, your role in that. In February of 2018, you may recall that we we brought forward um, a referral to get rape kits tested under 30 days so we could clear the backlog. And, and as a matter of fact, our county um, is testing rape kits under 30 days. And for stranger assaults, I think that, that it's less than five days, which it had been for a while. Um, so with the support of all of you and Dr. Smith and the district attorney, we were able to move that forward. Um, since that referral and under the leadership of Supervisor Simidian through the Health and Hospital Committee, the geographic expansion of the SAFE program was dramatically um, expedited, which I think is right. And for example, that included securing the location at Stanford um, and also really expanding services in, um, in South County. In, 2019, we did a joint hearing with the city of San Jose on sexual assault. And at that hearing and at subsequent board action it enabled full funding of the county's um, second rape crisis center and the introduction of strangulation, forensic and medical exams at the safe locations. With all of that work, and you know, we have more survivors coming forward, which I actually think is very good that we're seeing people who are trusting our services um, and coming forward for intervention and prevention. And as you all rec recall last week, as part of the budget action, we finally got expanded staffing and into the leadership structure of the SAFE program, which is critical to making sure this works countywide. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that in 2019, um, Supervisor Cortezzi and I asked staff 
to develop a working uh, a process map and a time study relative to the sexual sexual assault I'm sorry countywide sexual assault response and the reason uh, supervisor submitting I was just raising that last body of work I think some of that actually overlaps with some of the requests that you're making and so I would like the staff to be able to um, at health and hospital give an update uh, to you all on where that process is it's one that um, I know has taken a little bit longer than was intended, but I think could be very informative to to you and to the to the entire board. And then, um, and also that the staff is engaging in survivor focus groups and surveys to better understand the immediate needs and the experiences that people are having. And again, I don't know how far the gender-based violence um, office is in that process, but I think that should also be presented to the board. So when that comes back, I I do want to um, ask that the the process map and time study be presented along with any updates from the focus groups that we've had to date. And if there's still more work that needs to be done on them, that's fine. But I think supervisor committee and your committee would benefit well just to know where those processes are, because again, it may help shape ultimately what you want Harvey Rose to, to dive into. Supervisor committee, are you okay with that? Yes, I mean, uh, uh, happy to incorporate the request and direction in the motion with the consent of the seconder. The only um, point I would add, and it's an and, not a but, uh, is, and I want to underscore again the fact that, uh, quite bluntly, uh, the referral is designed so we can have it both ways, both see some immediate action, given the urgency of the issue, but also uh, make sure we look at these larger systemic issues uh, over the long haul. So I, I, I feel entirely comfortable with the language that Supervisor Chavez shared. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I just, I guess I should confirm with her that she confirms what I'll call the two-track approach of, you know, let's do whatever we need to do and can do right now uh, to make things better while still uh, taking the broader and longer view as we go forward, that the two aren't mutually exclusive, that we have to do both. Yes, and I, I think that's exactly right, Supervisor Smithian. And the other thing is, is that there's some work that's in progress that may, that meets some of the needs that you're raising. And I just wanna make sure that both the, the, the whole board is abreast, you know, kept abreast of that, but also that, um, that if that helps shape future actions that we, you know, that the work that's going, that's, um, being done right now can be incorporated because some of that's actually an evaluation phase and some of it's still in the process mapping phase. So that that's all. I think you're, I, I'm totally in agreement. I just think that um, some of it may be happening already. All right, so motion and a second. Uh, Supervisor Chavez in favor. And we have, oh, we wanna have Supervisor Lee speak before and then we'll go to the public. Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you, President Wasserman. Um, my comment comes to be very brief, so I just want to say thank you to the uh, Supervisor uh, Sumidian for bringing forth this really important referral. Uh, in many ways, I think uh, it's overdue that uh, our victims of uh, uh, sexual assault uh, really should not be, be traumatized twice. Uh, I think there's this gap from the, the services is something that we really need to fix, uh, and that I just also want to make sure that when the audit comes back, they should see uh, the health and uh, hospital committee uh, to also make sure that the audit also uh, talk with folks over at the domestic violence council and other stakeholders or contract uh, service providers and that's one of the comments i have thank you thank you jess our speaker please our speaker is michelle dauber i've unmuted you you'll have one minute to speak please go ahead I agree with the referral, but I urge you to temporarily and immediately suspend rape kits at Stanford until we can resolve um, the issue. Um, this was a pilot in which Santa Clara County for the first time offered rape kits outside of VMC's highly specialized center. I believe the pilot has exposed serious problems that have led to an unacceptably low level of service for survivors in the North County and that the pilot should be halted until these issues can be resolved. These issues were caused when Stanford failed to provide a private dedicated site for exams. Victims are waiting in public areas where they're vulnerable to their attackers locating them in the ER waiting room. Victors have, victims have no private waiting room and there is no sterile dedicated exam room. Conditions are traumatizing 
and evidence may be compromised. Sometimes we have to have the humility to admit that something that we tried did not work. Um, this is such a case. Um, I uh, believe strongly that you should suspend uh, the provision of rape kits at Stanford pending the outcome of this. Thank you. And that concludes our requests. Thank you, Jess. If you'll take a roll call vote, please, of the board. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you, Jess. All right, everybody. That was item 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27 were handled under consent. We're now gonna hear a report from our County Executive, Dr. Jeff Smith, followed by a report from our County Council, James Williams. Thank you, members of the board. I'll keep it short. We really um, wanted to just tell you about what we're doing with regard to bringing back county employees to the work site. Uh, I think you've seen many of the new policies and procedures that have been implemented I won't go through all of the details, but the basics are that um, we are back to uh, <clears throat> teleworking policies and procedures that we have already adopted two years ago, uh, which give the managers, supervisors, and executives considerable discretion when an application is made by an employee to do teleworking. Um, that discretion um, we've emphasized from an administrative perspective should be focused on making sure that we can actually provide needed services to our clients. Um, also recognizing special needs that particular individual employees have and needs that they will have in order to deal with uh, the multiple competing priorities that are ongoing right now, but they should not um, consider that COVID is a reason for telecommuting anymore, nor should they consider um, that anybody has a so-called right to telecommute. It's always been um, something that has to be applied for and granted. Um, with regard to the masking um, priorities, I think you've already heard, um, but the basic theme is that <clears throat> um, California, um, Cal OSHA has um, adopted policies and procedures that will really require ascertainment in order to comply with, basically um, allow individuals who are fully vaccinated to return to work without masks and to work in their normal site without social distancing. However, individuals who are unvaccinated or declined to state are required to wear masks and um, the county is required to offer them the possibility of using an N95 if they want. I won't try to go through all of the details. Uh, there'll be multiple emails and policies and procedures, but our approach is generally in that realm, except for the special areas such as the jail, the hospital, um, shelters, uh, juvenile hall, um, and areas where there are congregate settings. Um, the um, other issue that's been a question is how are we going to treat the public? Um, there are two choices afforded by state law. One is that we could station county employees at every door and um, intercept every entering member of the public and ask them about their vaccination status. And the ones who have been fully vaccinated could enter the building without a mask. We think that's a bad idea, it puts our employees at risk. It also is problematic for uh, the public. We, we have selected the alternative option, which is to uh, require that all uh, public members entering the buildings wear a mask. We won't be um, <clears throat> 
asking our employees to be enforcers, but we will have um, individuals requesting uh, new, requesting members of the public to wear masks if they are uh, entering the building, whether or not they're vaccinated. Um, I think I will leave it at that. I'm sure there will be many questions in the future as this all rolls out because all of these rules and regulations were just finalized at the end of last week. So I'm sure there will be a bumps in the road, but hang in there with us. We'll Thank you. make it work. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, the last thing that you just said um, is, uh, is interesting to me or previous about um, about telecommuting. And that is that I, I thought that we had a, you know, we'd set a goal of a certain percentage of our workforce being able to work remotely, uh, you know, it's part of a previous board action and that we were shaping a policy to reflect that. So that, um, that it would help managers make decisions, but also with the eye toward maintaining a certain amount of um, telecommuting. Dr. Smith. remote work? No, our, our policies are written into the MOUs and into the county policy about telecommuting and it's a fairly extensive process, but so, it can't be, there's no guarantee of the ability to telecommute. Yes, I understand that. We as a board took an action to set a goal for a percentage of our workforce having the capacity to work remotely for a bunch of different reasons, but primarily being environmental. My question is, how does how are you aligning the work that's being done with our employees to these goals that we've set? I guess I'm not understanding the question. I'll have to get back to you with an off agenda. Okay. Vice, oh, sorry. Mr. Chavez, were you done? Thank you, yes. Okay, Vice President Allenberg. Thanks, uh, Dr. Smith. My question is about the um, emergency resolution that has suspended and changed some of the Brown Act laws. Um, my understanding is that it sunsets on September 30th, so I just want to confirm on the record that that means that we will go, that our board meetings and policy committee meetings will continue remotely until um, the first week in October. That's our plan from an administrative perspective. I think uh, County Council can give you more details about the actual legal actions, but um, we've been in contact with County Council and that is what we're recommending. Great, thank you. I just wanted to, to confirm that I don't have an issue with it. Thanks. Thank you, that concludes your report, Dr. Smith? Yes. Thank you, we'll move to James. Mr. Williams, do we June have- June 21, 2021 closed session by you, first president, the board authorized the county to initiate litigation in one matter. The name of the action of the defendant, as well as the substance of the litigation, shall be disclosed once litigation is formally commenced to any person upon inquiry. Also at the June 21, 2021 closed session by unanimous vote with all members present, the board authorized the county to file or join an amicus brief in support of the state of California's appeal in Miller versus Bonta and similar cases challenging the constitutionality of assault weapons bans. And finally, at the June 2021, June 21, 2021 closed session by unanimous vote with all members present, the board authorized the county to file or join an amicus brief in 74 Pinehurst LLC at all versus state of New York. U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, case number 21-467. This case challenges the constitutionality of New York City's rent control and stabilization laws, specifically relating to the takings clause and due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I just want to give everybody a heads up. Despite my wife, where is it? There it is. Despite my wife having just brought me this, 
I do not anticipate breaking for dinner. All right, so we'll keep this train rolling. Item number 30, consider recommendations related to security cameras at the Social Services Agency Center Road Campus. Supervisor Simidian, do you wish to speak? I do, uh, Mr. Chair. I move approval of the recommended actions. Thank you for that. Second. We have second. a second with Supervisor Lee. I'll be supporting as well. I don't see any speakers on this item. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Allenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much, Jess. We now move on to item number 31, which is concerning recommendations relating to the installation of security cameras at the Stroy Road and Lenzen Avenue facilities. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I am prepared to move approval of the recommended action with only one very minor amendment, uh, Mr. Chair, and that is that at packet page 317, I note that the heading 2021 anticipated impact report should read 2021 anticipated surveillance impact report. With that amendment, move approval. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by a Simidian, a second, I believe it was Chavez, if I heard correctly. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. And we don't have any speakers on this. Jess, a roll call vote for item 31, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number 32, the James Ranch Video Security System Surveillance Use Policy. Supervisor Simidian? Move approval of the recommended action. Thank you. Second. You beat me to it. Be Supervisor Lee seconded. No members of the public showing. Jess, I don't see any members of our board asking for questions. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you very much. We move on to item 33, which is a status report related to the jail inmate services program, specifically the tablet program. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Um, we have had problems with the current jail phone and tablet services for years. I, I just need to emphasize that. And we've also expressed over the years my concern with the county partnering with companies that arguably engage in predatory practices. The contract with GTL will end next year. I would like to request the staff pursue a solicitation process for the jail phone and tablet service. I've also been asking for years that the staff conduct research into the possibility of contracting with other companies or organizations for the provision of jail and tablet services other than the handful of companies, companies who have arguably engaged in predatory practices. I will request again that the staff conduct research on alternative partners and alternative ways to provide jail phone and tablet service and report to the board in September with research findings and the scope of work for the new solicitation process. And that would be a motion. Thank you for the motion. Vice President Ellenberg, your turn. I'm happy to second that motion um, <laughs> with, with all of my energy. I, I am pleased. To, to some degree, I am glad to see that we are starting to make tablets available to people in custody. Glad to see the program at least starting to roll out. Um, you're correct, Supervisor Chavez, that this has been many, many years. It predates my time on the, on the Board of Supervisors as a member of the Commission on the Status of Women. This was something we were advocating for. Um, but I, I have similar concerns about uh, GTL and the prolonged timeline of the project's deployment. When GTL was offered the contract, their work plan was slated to last 120 days set to be completed in March of 2021 with deployment beginning in April of 2021. Uh, issues arose and GTL requested an extension to begin deployment uh, by which only the pilot program started on May 28th of this year. The process has just taken far, far longer than process than promised. 
and I'm disappointed that GTL has not even begun full sale deployment even after the extensions have been provided. Now that the pilot has begun, I am looking forward to hearing how this program is implemented and whether it achieves the explicit goals of increased participation in programs and classes and communication uh, with loved ones. So therefore I'm requesting a report on the tablet deployment to come to PSJC um, every, every 90 days initially, uh, detailing the initial success rates of distribution and feedback from people in custody on the use of the tablets. Um, I also want to understand what full deployment means and how close we are to, uh, to full deployment. I'm interested to know who will be receiving the tablets, whether there are restrictions on access based on classification or, or any other, um, other, uh, other identifier. And additionally, as the distribution expands, I want to emphasize that the, that the tablets should accompany any resumption of in-person programs, visitations, and use of physical items such as books and mail and not serve as a replacement uh, to anything else. Uh, I do have just a few specific questions about the, the current distribution program. Sure. Aside from making phone calls, are there other communication capacities with these tablets such as email or texting? Gary? Gary. David? Yeah, Gary Hersick, Deputy County Executive. I believe Dan Baldry uh, can give you a brief overview of what communication is on, and he is on the line as well. Yes, Great. he is. Thank you. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can. Uh, Dan Baldry, IT Director with TSS. Um, yeah, there are multiple options available through the tablets and the contract we now hold with GTL. At present, phone calls through the tablets are the primary option enabled. Others are available, such as uh, picture messaging and video messaging, but those are not currently enabled, but they can be um, turned on at the county's request. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and as has been mentioned in previous discussions, will the tablets hold capacities such as submitting grievances, medical requests, commissary, commissary orders, and any other system internal um, functions? Yes, and I actually like to hand that to Captain Sepulveda. Okay. Captain. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, okay. Captain Sepulveda, Sheriff's Office. Um, yes, uh, we are able to, as of June 28th, we are turning on the commissary ordering application, the grievance and request form application. Uh, medical requests are not part of this project. Medical Custody Health Services has their own project with regard to uh, medical requests for, for HIPAA reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, as of as of this coming Monday, we will have the request reading and commissary um, forms activated. Thanks. And how will in custody? How will their privacy be assured when using the tablet um, for a telephone call? What so the, use that might that might uh, demand privacy. Yes. So the phone system is identical to the phone system they have already in place. Um, there is no changes with confidentiality. So uh, if somebody already has their phone number in place, like an attorney has their phone number in place and it's not recorded or any of the other uh, folks that we have, clergy, then it's not recorded. So it's exactly the same system we have today. There's no difference. The tablet is just an extension of that service. Thanks. It'll be important to communicate that to people in custody and make sure they understand um, that that it that it is subject to the same policy. Yes. So so thank you. And again, I'll just re reiterate my agreement with Supervisor Chavez. If we are looking at the the success of the deployment uh, on an every ninety day basis, we should have a sense well in advance of the expiration of the contract next May um, as to as to whether we are pleased or not, aside from all of the all of the other issues. And I would support that direction to be looking early, con considerably before the expiration of the contract uh, period into uh, creating a new RFP. Thank you. So motion by Chavez, second by Ellenberg. We turn to Supervisor Submitian for comments. Thank you. Uh, question, and I don't know if this goes to or through Dr. Smith, but um, early, early on, uh, back in 2013, we had extended conversations about 
um, the high cost of telephone calls for inmates. The issue was pretty fully addressed uh, in juvenile hall and then was addressed uh, over a period of time incrementally uh, at, the, at the jail. And uh, I am mindful of this progress because the tablets, of course, can be part of a telephone calling system. So my question for Dr. Smith or someone uh, from the jail is, so are we at the point where there is a defined, albeit limited number of calls that folks can make for free with some measure of price controls on subsequent calls? And is the plan to maintain that going forward? Uh, uh, Captain Sepulveda, would you mind answering that Please. question? Yeah, not a problem. So the, the contract that we originally set with Legacy and Dovo that GTL took over has the more recent lower rates that were approved by the board. And those are the same exact rates that this system um, has. So when GTL took over, they were required to follow the contract that was approved by the board with the lower rates. And the tablets don't have any other, other rates than what is in the contract. Um, there are, my understanding is there are seven free calls a week that inmates can make. I believe they're five minute calls that are currently in place right now that are being funded um, separately. Um, and those are still in place until that funding runs up. So Dr. Smith, I guess my question is, do we anticipate that funding is going to run out? I, I think uh, after you'd sat through this conversation a half dozen times, you finally just leaned in and said, you know what, let's just pay for some of the calls so that this is no longer a uh, an issue of debate. Um, I just want to make sure to the point that uh, uh, Captain Savalda uh, references that there is in fact funding in our budget just approved to ensure that those uh, identified calls uh, are in fact um, still free and will be free going forward. Yes, we'll uh, make sure that happens. Uh, yeah, obviously we the cost depends upon the usage, but we'll uh, come back if we need to readjust any of the cost center, but we, that's our intention. All right, well, if I could ask for an off agenda report to all board members detailing the pricing structure for telephone calls for inmates in the county jail, that would then give us clarity, I think, about how many calls are free, what the call rates are for uh, subsequent calls. Uh, Captain, I don't remember if you were on the scene, a part of the conversation all those years ago, but at the time I, I was just, I, I thought it was institutionalized price gouging and said so. Uh, and uh, I know that not every call that goes out of the jail is benign in its purpose, but I also believe that uh, if we want to have a, a more um, successful re-entry that that entails uh, maintaining community and family contacts and that requires being in touch by phone and uh, that should not be precluded by exorbitant uh, charges. So we can get that off agenda report and I appreciate the commitment from Dr. Smith to make sure that we have some uh, reasonable number of calls that uh, are uh, free as a, um, a starting point or a foundation for this that would be appreciated. So thank you for that. And then, Mr. Chair, the one other question I wanted to ask is, uh, oh, and by the way, I should have given a shout out to Supervisor Ellenberg, who showed up and was on the telephone call program with me, uh, I think, from the first moment she arrived. So thank you for that. And uh, actually, I think all of our board members have been concerned about this over the years. So uh, I just I I'm saying that so staff knows it's not just a one board member uh, item. Then, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I was very pleased to hear that folks sort of want to get a report back every 90 days. Let me just ask, I guess it's Supervisor Ellenberg, if I may, through the chair. Supervisor Ellenberg, I inferred from your question that the report back would necessarily provide information about how the tablets were being used, meaning what for, so that we know are people using them for phone calls, for uh, grievance filing, for ebooks, uh, what, whatever and also that we have data on how much use so that we can tell, all right, did, did this in fact facilitate the number of grievances that could, could be filed? Did I understand correctly? 
All of the above, yes. Then I'll say thank you again for that and look forward to voting aye in a moment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, I have a few follow-up questions regarding these tablets uh, on how, how, how well it works. So um, first question I have, I think it might have been covered, but I just want to be confirmed regarding the uh, grievances uh, submission on the tablets and, and you know, to be submitted in the future. I think it's great that it's going to be uh, uh, added. I just want to uh, maybe get some clarifications in the future of when that would uh, be uh, available. Maybe you could give it to me as an off-agenda memo on these items. Uh, so one is the uh, submission of the grievances process uh, to be implemented. Uh, and then second thing is uh, whether these tablets would include the feature to uh, allow the inmates to access the court-related documents uh, and the ability to communicate with their defense attorney uh, in writing. And then the third thing is are there any language uh, accessibility um, given available other than English on these tablets, like Spanish or Vietnamese or any other languages? Um, and then finally is uh, whether you could uh, provide us uh, some type of a, a implementation progress report uh, by September, supposedly when these uh, tablets would have been fully de deployed um, including information on when messaging will be made um, and feature, uh, as well as information on whether to uh, potentially re reissue the RFP to solicit vendors um, when the existing uh, contract ends in May 22. We can do that. Okay, all right, good. And oh, one more thing. Uh, I don't know if this is possible, but if it's possible to offer some type of demo of these tablets, because uh, many of our staff would really want to learn more about this uh, this, uh, these features. Yeah, I believe Captain Sepulveda could give you that demo, but uh, you do okay. have to come to the facility. Sure, okay, obviously, yeah. Okay, great, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, so if I submit in, your hand is raised. Your hand is down. We have no public speakers. We had a motion by Supervisor Sumidian and the second was by Ellen. Brown? No, actually, the the motion was by me. Oh, um, initially seconded by Supervisor Ellenberg with there we the go. comments of our colleagues included. Got it. So we have all of those accounted for. Su Supervisor Chavez, you're satisfied with what you've heard? Yes, thank you. Thank you, and Supervisor Ellenberg, you're fine as the seconder. All right, thank you. Um, Yeah, this has been a crazy item personally for me from from the very get go. Uh, the ship has clearly sailed, and um, I look forward to the progress report and, and hopefully having my mind changed um, about this issue in general. Jess, would you please call for the roll call vote? Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, and that took care of item 33. 33 was put, 34 was put on consent and taken off by Supervisor Lee. So I'm gonna open up with you, sir, on item 34. Yes, thank you, President Russellman, on, on this one. And uh, I just want to, to first start saying uh, thank you, Dr. Luna, for your uh, work on this item. Uh, as I mentioned back in May, many of these uh, local Asian American activists uh, aging rapidly and won't be with us for much longer. Uh, people like Norm Mineta, Mike Honda, uh, and multiple leaders. And we really need to preserve the stories for future generations to learn from. Uh, as we have all understood that hate is truly not something that's born with, hate is learned. And we need to continue learning each other's stories so that we don't make the same mistakes. Through the sharing of stories, the coalition behind the project wants to lift up the themes of identity, solidarity, activism, allyship, structural and institutional racism, microaggression, and power building, all of which are timely and relevant in this moment. So in addition to a video archives of these stories, there will be a website with resources for K-12 schools and co college university educators and community leadership programs 
And I'm also heartened that the San Jose State University will be partnering on this effort for archiving support, video production, web hosting, and maintenance. And so I move to receive the report and direct administration to come back to the board in August budget with an agreement between the county and San Jose State University for request to transfer funding for the contract from the general fund contingency reserve. Second. Thank you. Thank you. A motion by Lee, a second by Chavez. Uh, Jess, would you please uh, allow our member from the public to speak for up to two minutes? Excuse me, one minute. Thank you. Our first speaker is Michelle Liu. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. This is Michelle Liu speaking as a District 5 resident. James Baldwin wrote, not everything that is faced can be changed but nothing can be changed until it is faced. We wanna thank the Board of Supervisors for having the courage to face the issue of hatred and violence against the AAPI community. Special thanks to Dr. Rocio Luna for moving this request forward and kudos to Supervisor Otto Lee for championing this request. We thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right, that concludes our public speakers. A roll call vote, please, Jess. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Items 35, 36, 37, excuse me, 35, 36, and 38 were handled on consent. 37 was deleted. Um, that brings us to item 39. Yes, item 39 at this time. And Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to look to you for some guidance um, on how you would like to proceed with this item. Candidly, it is a bit of a hairball. It has been um, uh, two and a half years in the making, and uh, it's going to require a little untangling. Uh, I don't know if you want a staff report first, or if you'd like me to just lean in and lay it out as I see it and uh, indicate what my initial thinking is so that the public has the opportunity to know uh, the motion that I am inclined to make. Uh, if you want to hear from the public first, I just, uh, I look to you for some guidance on this, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'll take option number two out of your three. I think each of us in, in one extent or another has heard numerous things about this and uh, certainly no lack of public input. And we'll go with your idea, your concept, your motion. Uh, thank you. And I'm gonna ask my colleagues to bear with me because as I say, this has been uh, in the making for a while and it will require a little unpacking and repacking uh, before we hear from members of the public. And uh, here's what I wanna do to begin, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I wanna say that in spite of everybody's best efforts, I'm sure that this effort has not gone well. So as you can uh, conclude from uh, letters from members of the public, uh, including folks who have uh, different views or a wide range of views, uh, it has been a frustrating uh, process and after almost two and a half years now, uh, based on a referral that I made from the dais in uh, January of 2019, um, we uh, haven't really made a lot of progress in my view. So I, I just wanna say uh, that's where we find ourselves in my judgment, I regret it, but I didn't want the public to think that it was unnoticed uh, or uh, let it go uncommented upon. I also want to uh, share with colleagues a little bit about what this item is not about, uh, and also share that with uh, members of the public who may uh, either be participating or checking in later on the video. Um, one of the challenges along the way in this two and a half year exercise is that staff determined that there had been uh, inconsistent application of uh, what is known as condition of approval O from the 2000 GUP, the general use permit. And uh, I think the most uh, 
colloquial way to put it is there had been sort of an on again, off again, on again, off again approach to enforcement. And when staff uh, indicated to the community during the course of the uh, discussion that uh, they were now uh, obliged by virtue of the uh, review from County Council's office to enforce the year 2000 condition of approval O, that understandably created quite a bit of consternation in the community. And uh, again, I think that is uh, unfortunate uh, to use that word, but it is really separate and apart from the discussion that uh, we are having today. Uh, I also note that in some of the letters, there is reference to a uh, property tax issue uh, that is a source of understandable uh, concern and dismay to uh, property owners on the Stanford campus. And, and let me just uh, say the issue we're looking at today, again, is separate and apart from that one. But I also wanna clarify for those property owners uh, that uh, the assessment that uh, processes that are being conducted by County Assessor Larry Stone, an independent uh, elected official in his own right, is um, essentially required by state law and that uh, the assessor really has no choice in using the approach that he uses. And I've gone so far as to check with our county council who has confirmed that even if our board of supervisors wanted to, it could not effectuate a change by virtue of existing state law. So uh, that too is an issue separate and apart from uh, the matter before us today, although I certainly understand why it uh, causes heartburn on the campus. Uh, and then finally, there was reference to the, uh, to the GUP, which uh, uh, with some suggestion that perhaps all of this was uh, inexorably interwoven or uh, connected to the three year long effort uh, to um, uh, review and offer approval of a general use permit in response to an application for the university. Here again, I would have to say, not really. The referral, as I look at Ms. Onshano, uh, is one from January of 2019. Uh, the uh, decision by the university to um, withdraw its application for a general use permit did not come until uh, late October, early November of 2019, uh, I think something like 10 months later. So uh, I have hoped in this uh, preface, Mr. Chair, to uh, share a little bit about what it, this discussion is not about uh, so that we could now turn our attention to what it is about and how we should uh, proceed. And, um, and again, to express my regret that the process has been as vexing for folks uh, as it has been uh, without really getting us to yes on any particular path forward. The goal today, of course, is to say, all right, here's where we are two and a half years in, where should we go? So colleagues, if you look at the staff report, which uh, is for item number 39, packet page 4 415 and subsequent pages, um, here's what I would say. All of this began when there was a subdivision application from the university in a neighborhood on the campus and the uh, contingent, a contingent, I should say, of the neighbors came and said, we think this is uh, too much, too dense, and that it despoils the neighborhood. And reasonable people could disagree or agree. But uh, what I said at the time was that we were obliged to follow our own general plan and the zoning that was in place. And so while I frankly shared the concern that the neighbors brought to our board, uh, I made the motion to approve the requested land use actions from the university because I thought it was uh, required and consistent with the existing law. But I also made the observation back in January of 2019 that I thought uh, if there was a problem with the density and or the development standards, the solution was for us to consider changing the density or development standards. And that's what I had hoped would happen over these last two and a half years. The staff, uh, however, returned to our board and uh, advised us, and I'm looking at packet page 416, where it indicates staff also explained the need to conduct a survey to determine whether portions of or all of the San Juan district is historic. 
And that's where things got dicey in a hurry. Uh, that effort uh, was uh, largely responsible, I think, for the confusion and dismay uh, that uh, people expressed about what was happening and why. Uh, staff's view was that it was a necessary precondition to addressing the issues that I wanted to address and had attempted to address with the referral, which was, uh, do we have areas where density and development standards uh, need to be revised? So now here we are two and a half years later, and what we've got is a set of studies with respect to the potential for historic preservation combining districts. And um, that, I should be very clear, is different than the notion of a neighborhood um, uh, combining district. And what I want to suggest is that we direct staff to set aside option one, to set aside option two, and to move forward with, and I want to be very clear about this, what I will call a, a, an amended option three. So I want to be very clear, it is not option three that I am moving uh, as it is contained, but I do think we need to explicitly reject uh, the creation of a historic overlay district. I find it, um, the foundation for it, not, not the case not well made, and it is, as I say, uh, the source of considerable confusion and concern. So if I am explicit about nothing else, it should be let's get straight on the fact that we are directing staff to set aside and not to pursue the historic preservation combining district overlay. That being said, I do want to support the use of the Stanford Community Plan update process to apply um, some kind of mechanism which would allow for reduced density and more rigorous development standards in one or more, and I'm looking very clearly at the planning staff, one or more of the five neighborhoods that are outlined on packet page 421. They are Upper San Juan, Lower San Juan, Pine Hill 2, Pine Hill 1, and Frenchman's Hill. The staff has suggested the possibility of uh, reducing the density in Upper San Juan. Uh, I have thought for some time that that was worthy of consideration and probably an action uh, after we heard it all uh, that uh, might be uh, advisable. Uh, so I am you know, pleased to see that recommendation there, but I am not yet prepared to dismiss uh, consideration about zoning and or uh, development standard changes that would affect the other four uh, uh, neighborhoods. If you look colleagues at packet page 421, you will see that this is an area that uh, these areas, plural, are zoned with eight units to the acre, which is a perfectly good zoning in the right place. The argument we've had from some members of the community is that it is uh, not consistent with, not compatible with, undesirable for these neighborhoods, particularly in Upper San Juan, where the staff uh, talks about a potential proposed density of two units to the acre, which I think uh, is probably a sensible area for consideration. But even if you look at the other four areas, colleagues, you'll see that none of them, none of them it hits even four units to the acre, let alone eight. And you'll also note that the setbacks are a little bit greater than the 25 feet that uh, would otherwise be allowed under the existing zoning. So I'm sorry for all that background, but what I want to do is uh, say, yes, let's move forward using the Stanford Community Plan update process. Let's be open-minded about what tools we use to address development and uh, density, development standards and density. But let's be explicit about rejecting uh, the uh, historic district overlay. And the final piece of this, Mr. Chairman, would be we also need to say uh, we need to get a solution to this before the end of 2023, which is the date suggested uh, on packet page 419. And I will just point out uh, that 
Um, if that were the effective date, colleagues, and so I'm looking at each and every one of you, that means it would have taken five years mm -hmm. from January of 2019 to the end of 2023 just to rezone and provide some additional development standards for a relatively small chunk of dirt with a couple hundred homes on it. That's unacceptable. And it's not unacceptable just as an abstract matter. We can't ask members of the public to engage in the process if a simple matter such as a rezoning consideration and development standards becomes a five-year commitment of their time. We, we can't have it both ways. We can't say we really believe in engagement and participation, but we're gonna make it a five-year slog. I'll just point out our, our country fought and won a world war on two continents in three and a half years. Uh, so I think uh, we ought to be able to uh, make this happen in something less than five years. I would ask that the item be resolved no later than the end of 2022. And that is why when we had our budget discussions, colleagues, you will recall that I asked that we have uh, a set aside uh, in the August budget conversation for consideration of funds necessary to make sure that the workload of the planning department could accommodate a more timely resolution. Even at that, that would be four years. So that's a motion to reject one and two, to adopt a revised standard three, uh, and accept to say that it is uh, to use the Stanford Community Plan update process on a more expedited basis, sooner rather than later, 2022, not 2023, that it explicitly rejects the uh, use of a historic a preservation overlay district, and that it does not specifically direct staff to apply the preservation district uh, overlay in order to address density and development issues. Rather, it says, let's look at a range of tools, and it is not specifically limited to Upper San Juan. It includes consideration for the others. All of that to be done uh, by referral to and through the uh, Housing, Land Use, Environment, Transportation uh, Committee with your uh, forbearance, Mr. Chairman, who uh, is also there. Thank you. I'll stop there and see if there's a second, at least for purposes of discussion, so that the community can weigh in. Second. We have a second by Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much. Jess, if you'll please turn to our speakers and give them one minute each, and I hope they heard all of that. Our first speaker is Alan Taylor. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Supervisor Samidian for his comments and uh, has drastically changed where I thought this was heading, but nonetheless, I do have a few comments. Uh, as to the GUP, I understand that there is this notion that it's set in stone, but my understanding is that as supervisors, you could take some action to change that. We are being treated unfairly and inequitably as compared to other homeowners in unincorporated Santa Clara County, and that should be looked at. Um, I'm not sure why we need to have any rezoning. We're pretty much all built up. There's not that much space where Stanford, if that's the fear, is going to be able to do any major development. It would be all individual homeowners, very few of whom ever uh, tear their houses down. Mostly they renovate. So I'm not sure it's really worth the time and expense for the county to spend more on this area because I think it's pretty set in stone. And I think uh, the way that Stanford's working with the county now on permitting this is where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sunny. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Sunny Scott, and I've lived on campus for 30 years. And uh, I served on the SCRL board back in the 2000 GUP. Then I spent three years working on a high density, intergenerational, on campus affordable housing project. Uh, the purpose of that plan was to offer more housing options for young families who are financially strapped and downsizing options for the emeriti. Since then, I've worked on the uh, Stanford Historical Houses book series. So a lot of time devoted in different areas of housing on Stanford campus. I would love to see a little progress, just a little forward movement. So I am in favor of option number three, working within the community plan it, and seeing that is the best way to achieve some 
you know, clearly defined rules, agreed upon density, some face. Our next speaker is Christy Holloway. Please go ahead. This is Christy Holloway. I've lived on the campus for 50 years. And um, I want to thank Supervisor Siminian and really everyone who has worked so hard during these last few years on this, including the um, community stakeholders group. I do support the option three as amended. I would like to see that go forward. I think that we need to finish this journey. We started it and I think we need to continue. And I think that uh, it would be great to get the design and development standards and the consideration of less dense zoning in our area. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ron Ruth. Please go ahead. Ron, you'll have to click to un, there you go. Um, uh, hi, my name is Ronald Ruth and I've been a homeowner in the upper San Juan neighborhood at Stanford for the past 22 years. I'd like to uh, express my support for the now revised option three. Um, the San Juan neighborhood is currently subject first to Stanford University approvals in addition to subsequent Santa Clara County approval, but the current approach is inadequate to protect the neighborhood from the overdevelopment by the university, not the homeowners. Um, the suggestion of downzoning from eight to two or three and a half units, which was suggested in the, uh, by the planning department, uh, will require upzoning elsewhere to be consistent with SB 330. I'm confident Stanford has many, many adequate locations uh, to accomplish this upzoning. This would allow some increased housing in our neighborhood without fundamentally altering the character and provide additional increased housing density within the county that the university could develop. Thanks very much. And I appreciate the time to talk. Our next speaker is Whitney McNair. I've unmuted you. Please go ahead. Whitney McNair, Stanford Faculty Staff Housing. Homeowners have attempted to remain engaged despite a closed process that has sometimes been difficult to follow and understand. The questions and concerns that have been repeatedly raised by the homeowners have not adequately been summarized in the staff report. Should the county choose to shift the down zoning discussion into the community plan update effort, Stanford has real concerns that down zoning during a time in which our community is facing a regional housing crisis is detrimental. Furthermore, any new development standards proposed for individual lots was, would result in a non-trivial number of homes becoming non-conforming, therefore limiting how a homeowner can add on or remodel their home. Discussions about changing the rules that will ultimately change individual property rights should not be masked as preserving neighborhood character, but should be openly discussed with all the affected homeowners so that everyone understands the consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is Sandra Pearson. Please go ahead. Sandra, you'll have to accept the unmute to turn your microphone on. As a Stanford homeowner and a member of the CSG, I urge you to support the Stanford community plan option. It's not extreme as I see number one, maintaining the status quo or two, continuing further historic studies, which would be a waste of taxpayer time and money. Adopting option three, the Stanford community plan creates an opportunity to clarify so many of the issues which are still unresolved. We're so disappointed at the results of the San Juan District Historical Survey with countless meetings, and we still feel that there are no protections in place to preserve the character of our neighborhoods on campus. Allegedly, now that the county has decided the 2000 GUP is in place, homes 50 years or older will need to invest in an expensive historical survey assessment if the homeowners are applying to demolish or add more than 500 square feet. This preservation protection strikes me as overly onerous and unnecessary. As most, it should be applied to. Our next speaker is Jessica Von Bork. I have unmuted you, please go ahead. Good afternoon, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisors. My name is Jessica Von Bork and I'm the Director of Land Use at Stanford University. Option three disguises downzoning as neighborhood preservation. I understand that the motion made directs staff to explore a variety of options. However, based on staff's work to date and their drafted development standards, they are effectively seeking to downzone portions of the faculty subdivision from eight dwelling units per acre to two, 
which means an increase in lot size to half acres per unit. This challenges our mutual affordability and sustainability goals. What we would like to offer as a solution that addresses neighborhood preservation concerns immediately and would not need policy amendments in the community plan could be to apply GUP conditions only to Stanford projects in the subdivision and demolitions proposed by other Stanford, uh, proposed either by Stanford and or homeowners and not to individual homeowners within proposed, with proposed additions or alterations. This solution would bring this to resolution prior to the motion. Our next speaker is Grace Hinton. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Grace, you'll have to, ex there you go. Hi there, uh, my name is Grace Hinton. Uh, thank you, supervisors. Um, I'm a 25 year uh, Stanford resident, um, uh, an architect, a CSG member, and a member of the SCRL board. I've also been consulting to faculty and staff housing and uh, helping uh, homeowners who have uh, homes that they're 50 years and older, which are most part, uh, our homes on campus now. Um, I have to say the recent imposition of gut positions uh, on the residential areas has created a Byzantine permitting process that imposes different sets of rules in different neighborhoods um, and uh, imposes Stanford as a middleman. And um, I'm hoping that the uh, result of, of, uh, the, of any further meetings um, will uh, clarify uh, these processes and, and perhaps uh, revert back to using uh, our underutilized historic heritage ordinance instead. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bruce Clemens. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm a member of the CSG and a Stanford uh, faculty homeowner. Um, I uh, want to say that I think trying to preserve um, houses and lot sizes is exactly the wrong way we should be going. Our community is in a crisis. We have faculty who uh, have to leave because they can't get homes. We have a huge problem attracting faculty to Stanford. And to say that lot sizes are more important than people and families having homes, I think is the wrong way to go. Um, I suggest that we drop the GUP um, requirement because I, I believe that uh, this is an agreement between two parties, and one party does not get to decide about a conflict in the in, in something like this. And um, I I uh, think that the, the report from the consultant was so flawed it should be thrown out completely. I believe that this initiative was started by. Our next speaker is Brian Knudsen. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thanks to the board for hearing uh, our voices. Um, I'm a homeowner in the Lower San Juan District. We conducted a survey of uh, the residents of this district, and most of them opposed um, a hit preservation district. I can go through all the reasons, but uh, after speaking with Stanford and with um, other other um, uh, also the the I'm sorry the county. Uh, we uh, discovered the, a number of costs that would be borne uh, not only by us, but I think by everyone else and regulatory burden. Um, so uh, I just wanted you to hear our voices who actually live in these houses, that a majority of us, that is 63%, oppose the designation and therefore support option one. And I'll just give you the numbers, 63 opposed, 21%, we're not sure, 16% were supportive of this preservation district designation. These are of the lower San Juan homeowners, not the upper San Juans. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Farid. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. I am a Stanford physician, faculty member, as is my husband. We live in the San Juan neighborhood in a home that is over 50 years old. We are in the process of trying to get permitted for an appropriate um, addition to our home for our six family members. It's taken five months and over $3,000 to now uh, be compliant with the GUP that you have applied. As homeowners in the area, faculty members serving during a time of COVID, we are extremely opposed to the um, application of three. We do not believe any downsizing should occur for lands. We actually believe more homes should be built and it is inappropriate and unjust for people to be on lots of that size. And we do not agree with option three. Please do not support option three. Our next speaker is Justin Grimmer. Please go ahead. 
thank you. Uh, as a Stanford homeowner and a member of the CSG, I'm opposed to the amended option three. I think the position that the board is in is very clear. It can make a decision that it can incentivize Stanford to make modest amounts of infill on campus to help address the housing crisis. We should be clear that there is no real threat from Stanford to drastically change the character of any neighborhood. This whole process began because Stanford had what might some say the audacity to suggest to build eight homes in a neighborhood where there's ample space. Homes that, to my eye, fit well within the neighborhood. Families like mine face a crisis. In fact, we had to leave Stanford for a while because we couldn't afford a home. And so the board can take clear action to help families like mine increase infill and to make a small step to address this regional housing crisis. Thank you. That concludes our requests. Thank you, Jess. I appreciate that. We had a um, motion by Supervisor Smidian. Uh, your hand is raised, sir. Thank you. I just want to confirm, excuse me. Well, I, I just want to correct what I think were two misperceptions or, um, and they are, they are as follows, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think some folks have presented this as a binary choice between more housing and neighborhood preservation, as if it were an either or. And the fact of the matter is, that's just not the case. It's, it's not the case as a matter of fact, and it's not the case as a matter of law. Because I'm going to look at uh, Jack and Brat, and I'm going to say, anything we do to diminish the number of units that could be built on these sites will require us, pursuant to SB 330, to identify some other location where a similar number of units could be built so that there's no net new loss. Do I have that right as a matter of law? Yes. Thank okay. You. And colleagues, the argument is somehow being made that the only way the university can address its housing needs is by dramatically altering the character of a particular neighborhood. Now, smart people, people of goodwill can have different points of view about what should or shouldn't be preserved and protected, uh, what should or shouldn't be changed. But um, the simple fact of the matter is, uh, when you're talking about um, an 8,000 acre university property holding, 4,000 acres of which are in our count unincorporated county, um, there are other locations, as one of the speaker mentioned, where housing can go. So the question isn't one or the other, the question is where's the right place and what's the right way to do this? Just within the last year, the university very proudly announced the new graduate student housing it had created, which was 2,400 beds, colleagues, 2,400 beds. So clearly the university not only felt but was able that they had a, a location, they identified a location and with approval from the county, built 2,400 student beds. Mm -hmm. uh, so the notion that somehow we can't find uh, another space, which some would argue is a better space and some would argue is not, um, I think is just wrong on the facts and it's absolutely wrong on the law as Ms. Anshano and Mr. Singh have just confirmed for us. I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. We've got a motion. Supervisor Lee, I believe you were the second on this. Uh, no, it was, no, it was, right. it was Cindy. Supervisor Chavez, thank you very much. So we have a motion. We have a second. We've heard from the public. I don't see any other hands raised. Jess, a roll call vote, please, on uh, this item number 39. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Ellenberg? President Wasserman? Yes. We'll go back to Vice President Ellenberg. And we'll mark her absent. Oh, there she is. Oh, hold on. So sorry. Yes. That was a yes. Thank you. Unanimous vote.
Thank you. 40 was held, board members. We're now down to the items removed by Supervisor Lee, and uh, we're down to 68, 88, and 100. Let's start with 68. Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Give me one second to uh, get my electronics working. Thank you. Um, number 60 is relating to um, the increasing of the funding, uh, $450,000 uh, and the expenditure in the Behavior Health Services Department budget um, and increasing the transfer out of the criminal justice system wide cost budget relating to one time AB 109 funds to support faith based resource center services. Um, my understanding is that even with this augmentation, the faith-based resource center contractors would still not be made whole from the original um, allocation. Uh, we heard last week from Dr. Smith that the providers were, were actually made whole. So I just want to confirm, will this increase of the $450,000 um, make the providers whole? And if they are not being made whole with augmentation, um, where would we be able to pull the supplemental fund to cover the differences? From staff, please. Um, Mr. Smith. From my understanding, talking with the uh, staff from behavioral health and looking at the finances, this is the correct uh, calculation, 450,000 to make them whole. Um, I think uh, Sherry Tarrao is on the phone. She can give you more details, Sherry. Uh, sure. Good afternoon, um, sure. President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg, and Board of Supervisors. Um, Supervisor Lee, to your question, um, the fiscal year 21 agreements for the four faith-based providers um, in total for each of the agreements is uh, $400,000, and the $450,000 one-time AB 109 augmentation would bring the fiscal year 22 agreements for all four providers to the $400,000 um, amount per agreement. Supervisor Lee? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, basically, we are, we are in touch with uh, uh, um, a group of uh, contract providers, uh, specifically over Catholic charities. And the numbers didn't seem to to jive. Well, I'm 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 actually, to be honest, very confused of the numbers right now. Uh, so my my point is, I wonder if this is something we should try to uh, resolve in terms of these numbers. Uh, maybe at a different meeting, uh, since I think there's the, some difference of numbers. Maybe we could send over the number that's been, that I've been provided for your review, and then maybe we'll push this one down. Uh, to be to be worked on in the next meeting. Would that work? Yeah, I, I would suggest that the board go ahead and approve the current um, mm -hmm. action. Okay. And um, that certainly is not going to change cash flow in a negative way. And that'll give a month for Sherry and the team to work with the uh, Catholic charities to go over the numbers in detail. Great. And, um, it's should be per fairly simple math, so I'm not sure why there's confusion, but we'll go over it in detail. If it turns out that there needs to be some augmentation, we'll come back with a recommendation for augmentation. Well, right, yeah, if we can come back in August, that, that would be great. Okay, yeah, so in that case, I'll go ahead and move for approval of 68, thank you. Super, we have a motion for approval. I'll be happy to second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Also, there's no members of the public. Uh, just a roll call vote on 80 on 68, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you, Jess. Supervisor Lee, we move on to number 88, sticking with our eights. Thank you again. Uh, number 88 is regarding the uh, uh, request approval of modification number uh, 180 for about $100 million. 
transferring funds from the special programs and reserves uh, uh, on the uh, controller treasurer department budgets to the COVID-19 fund relating to COVID-19 expenses. Um, what I'm, the reason I'm pulling this is because I would like to make sure that we are maximizing the opportunities for any type of federal reimbursements as there are so many uh, buckets of federal funding available for the COVID related expenses. At the, <clears throat> at the previous special FGOC meeting on June 9th and then last week's budget hearings, I have asked the administration to develop a dashboard to look at COVID-19 recovery expenditures charged against various federal funding sources, such as the CARES Act, FEMA, and the American Rescue Plan, et cetera. So I think the board has been very clear in articulating the need to better understand all the federal buckets of funding available for COVID-related expenses. As the board has directed, it is important for us to receive an overview of the process of the federal reimbursement from our federal reimbursement consultant. I hope that briefing will be scheduled sooner rather than later on this specific uh, point. So specifically, I'm interested to learn more about what expenses are being charged to which bucket of funding and why, and what expenses can be reimbursed by multiple buckets versus just one. I would like to request the administration provide a periodic updates to FGLC about our COVID-related expenses and federal reimbursement submissions. All right. Thank you. That's your motion? Yes, that's my motion. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Uh, do we have a second? I, I'm not, I, I will second it for discussion, but I'm not sure I entirely, un, oh, but I, I'm not sure I entirely understand what's, what you're asking for that, that is different than what we've already asked staff for. Agreed. Supervisor Lee, you want to rephrase? Yes. Um, so we are talking about the uh, periodic updates to FGOC about the COVID relay expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, what we also talk about more specific in this case I'm looking at is the exact reimbursement uh, uh, from the federal uh, uh, government that we could potentially get for the different buckets because of the fact that uh, whether we talk about CARES Act or FEMA or ARP, um, the rules are pretty uh, daunting to be honest. So for example, there are fundings where I give an example like uh, FEMA, you could uh, apply 75% of that uh, and if the other 25%, somehow FEMA won't reimburse, you could request that from ARP. So there's a lot of um, very complicated rules uh, on this. What I'm trying to basically find out is through the, the our, uh, I guess you could say review, uh, I, I, all I'm trying to do is try and find more ways to make sure that we leave no uh, reimbursement stones unturned, shall we say, to make sure that we are going to to try as hard as we can to get the the, the recovery expenditures to recover as much revenue as we can. So, Supervisor Lee, I think that um, we are having a workshop on this this very subject, and um, so I I think if the if the motion is to include the the specific examples and approach that you want to take and have that included in the workshop, that that makes sense. Um, but I, but I, because I think we're going in that direction. It, is that uh, is that what you're saying essentially? You just want to make sure this information is included. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. De definitely. Yeah. Um, just right. want to make sure it's very clear that uh, we're not missing some of these potential uh, um, sources of revenues. Mm -hmm. Great. So, board, do you want a motion on that, or Supervisor Chavez? Well, no. I think if he will include that. Yeah, he clarified his motion, so we'll move the staff report plus the it's coming back, but but with this specific, more refined ideas from Supervisor Lee. That makes sense. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, is that fine? Yes, with absolutely. You? Correct. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, I don't know if we need a motion or not on that. It's direction. Let's just do a motion. Well, we have the done. transfer funds. We have item 88 we have to move yes. anyway. Right. So right. we're going to move 88 with that further direction. Right. With it that looks like direction. Dr. Smith may have a comment oh, as well. Sorry. Yes, Dr. Smith. I think the board is going in a direction that I understand, so I probably should keep my mouth shut. There you go. All right. So we've got a motion. We have a second. Dr. Smith's hand is down. 
Jess, a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. And Jess, that was uh, motions by Lee and then Chavez. Thank you. You betcha. Okay, on to item number 100. Great, thank you. Now we're the three digit item, uh, considering the recommendation relating to a safe parking program for unhoused vehicle dwellers. Um, so um, before I start, I would like to provide a little context and would like to make a, a motion to staff. Through the chair, I would like to request that the administration conducts research and strike up an initial conversation with the property owners of 1077 East Arcas Avenue in Sunnyvale for its potential acquisition so that the county can utilize the space as an additional potential site for the county's safe parking program. And I would like to ask staff to provide a report back to the FGOC meeting in September with updates relating to this ongoing effort. We have certainly seen how successful our county safe parking lot program has been in places like Mountain View, Palo Alto, and San Jose. And it's my desire to see that might extend to Sunnyvale, along with other parts of Supervisor District 3 as well. In speaking with some of our community members here and housing advocates, I was introduced to this idea of potentially turning the available space on the old uh, Fry's Electronics parking lot into a safe parking area. So taking that into consideration, I thought it made sense to at least explore this possibility. Um, and I want to be clear to um, our OSH, uh, Office of Board of Housing staff and to administration that the ask really is just boils down to doing some research and striking up an initial con conversation with the property owners to understand what it will take to require the property and look at the potential for a safe parking lot. As you conduct this work, my only ask is that you make sure to engage with City Sunnyvale and community members and advocates to get their perspective to help guide your decisions. Ms. Weddle. Thank you, President Wasserman and Supervisor Lee. No, no questions at this time. Thank you. Already. So Supervisor Lee, you're moving the item? Yes, I'm moving forward for this item with the additional Thank you. Uh, directions. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Smith. Um, I'm a little unclear, um, in terms of whether this fits in the agenda as an appropriate action under this particular item. Um, maybe we can ask Our county council, council but, um, the two are not really related. And so, um, I wonder if it's better to be done as a referral separately. Separately. Thank you, James, any opinion? Just give me a quick moment. Sure. Could you restate it, Supervisor Lee? Sure. So uh, in addition to approving, uh, moving forward to the two uh, existing safe parking program as stated in this uh, uh, original item number 100, I'm just asking staff to look into a potential site in Sunnyvale for that very same purpose, but it's just to start an initial um, uh, uh, research on, on the feasibility uh, of such a proposal. And, oh. and that the locations over 1077 East Orcas Avenue in Sunnyvale. Oh, got it. Right. I couldn't, when you said that, I didn't, I didn't hear the name properly. I, yeah. I'll second that for purposes of discussion, but James, is that, can we do that? James is coming back. Yes, I was I was just trying to look more closely at the at the item. So this this item specifically is approving agreements uh, related to uh, specific mm -hmm. programs at specific sites. Um, I think if I understand what the county executive's point was that it's a specific proposal for a different uh, site or acquisition would be more appropriately brought forward as a referral, which I think is is correct. Um, I think that the you know, if the request is for uh, staff to bring back some, you know, to report, for example, off agenda with some information, mm -hmm. um, I think that th that would be fine. But proceeding with an with a um, negotiation or proceeding with a specific 
uh, project for a specific other site wouldn't really fit under item 100 as I look at it. Okay, so if that's the case, why don't we ask the staff to just come back off agenda item as a initial uh, uh, look on this issue and uh, just come back to us maybe in um, August. In the meantime, um, we'll go ahead and approve the other two. Great, great, great. Okay, thank you. Is that Dr. Smith that said great? Yeah, he sounded like he was at a truck show, but yes. <laughs> at a truck show? <laughs> well, that's another conversation. All right, so we have a motion, Supervisor Chavez, you seconded it. We have no members of the public wishing to speak on item 100. So I will turn to Jess for our final vote of the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. President Wasserman says yes as well. And Jess, if I'm correct, our next board meeting is August 17th. I don't have that in front of me, but I, I didn't see it in the agenda, but that's what my calendar says. That is we, correct, Supervisor Wasserman. There's Rhonda. I All right, ladies and gentlemen, in. we have concluded six months of a recovery year, return to normalcy year. We got our, our rookie supervisor in who's done a fantastic job. And I wish you and your loved ones good health over the next uh, five to six weeks till I see you again. My best wishes to all of you. Safe move. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Enjoy the wedding and the move. <laughs> Recording stopped. And with that, this meeting room is being closed.